You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of uh, the complete text, uh, Collected Works, Volume 175 by Rudolf Steiner, of the Building Stones for an Understanding of the Mystery of Golgotha, Human Life in a Cosmic Context, 17 Lectures, translated by Simon Blacksland DeLang. And uh, these were given between the 6th of February and the 8th of May, 1917. This is Lecture 1 given in Berlin on the 6th of February, 1917. Let me first express my deep satisfaction that I can be with you once again. This would have happened before had there not been an urgent need to bring the work on the group that has often been referred to here, which is to stand in the east of the building in Dornach and portrays the representative of humanity in relation, respectively, to the Aramonic and Luciferic powers, to the point where it can be worked on further without me. In our present time, it is necessary to have forethought for the future, and in view of such events as may be impending, it seemed to me absolutely necessary to take the work on this group to where it is now. Moreover, times such as these must necessarily bring home to us in a quite particular way that being together in a spatial sense on the physical plane is not the only means of maintaining the strength and integrity of our relationship to spiritual science. For sharing in the thoughts and convictions of our spiritual scientific endeavors, even if only in the realm of thoughts, has the potential to bring us through this difficult time of tribulations and sorrow, and hence be a test for the strength of our spiritual scientific aspirations. Since the last time that we were together here, we have had to lament the loss from the physical plane of our dear Fräulein Motzkus and other dear friends who have left the physical plane because of the events overshadowing our times. It is particularly painful no longer to see Fräulein Motzkus amongst those dear friends who have for so many years participated in our spiritual scientific endeavors. She has belonged to our movement since its beginnings, from the first day, from the first gathering, in the smallest circle. She has, throughout, been in our midst as a member devoted in a very heartfelt way to our movement, participating in a most intimate way in all its phases, all its developmental trials. And above all, she has maintained, through all the events that have come our way, an invincible loyalty in the deepest sense of the word, to what we have set out to do, a loyalty which sets an example to those who really want to be devoted members of the anthroposophical movement. And so we look upon this great and beloved soul in the worlds of spiritual existence to which she has ascended, maintaining that bond of loyalty with her that has grown and strengthened over many years in the knowledge that we are united with her soul forever. It was not long ago that Fräulein Motzkus herself suffered the loss of a dear friend whom she will now so soon have found again in the spiritual world. And the manner in which she accepted this loss was characteristic of the way that a person bears such a blow out of a true conception of the spiritual world. The active interest with which Fräulein Motzkus participated until her last days in the most important events of our time was indeed something to admire. She would often tell me that she would like to continue living on the physical plane until the momentous events in the midst of which we are now living have been resolved. So she will now, in her present state, be able to follow these events to which she was so intimately and avidly attached with a freer vision, with a firmer sense for the evolution of mankind. And so may our hearts be entrusted with the commitment that to the extent that we are able, we will unite our thoughts and the active forces of our soul 
with this faithful spirit, with this faithful and much-loved member of our movement, so that we may know that because of the very particular connection with us on the physical plane, we are one with her also in times to come, when she will dwell among us in another form. The times in which we are living are such that we are given ever greater and greater incentive to ask ourselves what significance the aspiration toward higher knowledge necessarily has for the human race, both in the present and in the near future. The events going on around us call forth a condition of stupefaction in many people today. Even though there is little awareness of this, while what is actually going on and how deeply influential what is happening is on human evolution are things that those who survive such a catastrophe on the physical plane come to be fully aware of only after a certain time. So much the more must we endeavor to call to mind thoughts which are able to shed light on the tasks and goals of this spiritual scientific movement which is so necessary for mankind. And since we are now again together after quite some time, it will perhaps be especially fruitful to express some specific aspects of our view of this spiritual science in a few brief thoughts, or, to put it somewhat more clearly, the kind of view that can emerge quite naturally from this spiritual science, which we have now been cultivating for many years. It is noticeable that there are individuals scattered everywhere today who are developing the longing to draw near to the spiritual world, even though, unfortunately, materialism is not diminishing in its intensity. Precisely because of the various forms in which the longing for the spirit manifests itself, there is a need for us to call to mind the specific nature of our quest for spiritual life and activity. In England, at present, the search of a prominent scholar for the spiritual world is making a considerable impression upon a large number of people there. It is indeed an extraordinary phenomenon that a man who is reckoned to be a scientist of the highest order should have written a comprehensive book with a quite distinctive form about the relationship of humanity on earth with the spiritual world. Sir Oliver Lodge, who has been working for years in a variety of ways to extend the scientific knowledge that he has acquired in such a way that it can give him information about the spiritual world, has written a thick book about a particular instance of a relationship that he is wanting to cultivate with the spiritual world. This particular instance can be described as follows. Sir Oliver Lodge had a son, Raymond Lodge, who in 1915 was fighting on the English side in the war in Flanders. Although his parents knew that their son was still at the front, they received some strange news from America, news which spiritualists, with a materialistic attitude, must without doubt have found most striking. The news was presented in such a way that one was led to understand that the English psychologist Myers who many years ago had studied the relationship of the physical world to the spiritual world, and had by this time been in the spiritual world for several years, would shortly be looking after young Raymond Lodge. At first it was not clear to what this might meet, relate. There was some delay in the news reaching Sir Oliver Lodge. It arrived when Raymond Lodge, his son, had already fallen. I think it was a fortnight later, but I cannot be exactly sure. So the news of his death was received, and in addition there was this information from America, imparted by mediums, advising his parents to go to English mediums. And so they did so, approaching mediums toward whom Sir Oliver Lodge had a critical attitude. I shall have more to say presently about the significance of this. Sir Oliver Lodge is a scientist and is trained to examine such things in a scientific way. He went to work in the way that he approached his work in his laboratory. What emerged from this was an indication given not by one but by several mediums. 
Raymond's soul wanted to communicate with Sir Oliver and his family. All sorts of communications followed, including automatic writing and knocking, which not only Sir Oliver Lodge himself but other members of his family, who had hitherto had a thoroughly skeptical view of such matters, found wholly convincing. Raymond Lodge's soul indicated, among other things, that Myers, who had long predeceased him, was acting as his guardian, and he told his family many other things about his last days before he died, together with much else which was of significance to his parents and his family, and made a great impression, especially because the various things that Raymond Lodge imparted through the mediums were directly addressed to the family, and particularly to Sir Oliver. I should add that not only his family, but also Sir Oliver, found that the way that the seances were conducted was most strange, and the wider public, insofar as they were able to follow them, found them most extraordinary. They would not have surprised someone who has experience of such things, for in actual fact anyone with any sort of familiarity with the technique and process of such seances would know about the way that communication with the dead was conducted by mediums. One factor in particular, however, made an especially deep impression in England, and it was doubtless calculated to evoke conviction among large numbers of educated Englishmen and also Americans, the sort of conviction that in our skeptical age had previously been largely absent, but was ignited among these people by this affair and will continue being ignited. The factor that made so strong an impression on the Lodge family and on Sir Oliver Lodge in particular, as well as on the wider public, can be characterized as follows. Photographs taken while Raymond Lodge was still alive were described by one of the mediums. The way that they were described was that Raymond Lodge himself was expressing to the medium through rapping sounds what the photographs were about. By this means a group photograph was described that is to say, it emerged through the medium that the soul of Raymond Lodge wanted to describe a photograph that had been taken of him in a group shortly before he passed through the portal of death. From beyond the threshold he was saying that he had had himself photographed with some of his comrades, who had been photographed in two groups, one behind the other. This was how they were arranged, and this was his position. He then went on to indicate that several photographs were taken, one after another, as photographers tend to do. He described exactly how these photographs, taken in rapid succession, differed from one another. He was, he said, always sitting on the same chair, also with the same approximate gesture, though the position of his arm and other similar details were slightly different. This was related with great precision. Now, the Lodge family knew nothing of these photographs. They had no idea that photographs had been taken. So there was this situation that through the agency of the medium a series of group photographs had been described which portray Raymond Lodge with several of his comrades. After some time, approximately a fortnight, these photographs were sent to Sir Oliver Lodge from France, and they corresponded exactly to the way they had been described through the medium in accordance with the indications given by the soul of Raymond Lodge. This made a particularly strong impression. And indeed, anyone who is something of a dilettante in such matters, and it is clear that all those concerned fell into that category, would inevitably have such a strong impression. It was a foolproof test. A soul describes from beyond the threshold a series of photographs in a number of different poses which reached the family only a fortnight later and correspond precisely with the information that had been given. Thus one can say that there was not the slightest possibility that the medium or someone involved in the seance, and these were all members of the Lodge family, could have seen any of these photographs. So you see that we have a case here which really bears thinking about, both from the scientific standpoint and also as a phenomenon of cultural history. For it is not merely possible 
to anticipate that something of this nature might make a considerable impression, this is what indeed occurred, it did make a considerable impression. In so far as one could see, it was this description of the photographs which could not depend on thought transference that was so deeply convincing. We really need to give consideration to the whole of this case, for we must be quite clear that when a person passes through the portal of death, the situation is such that the human individuality is at first briefly enshrouded by the astral body and ether body, and that after a period of varying length, but always measured in terms of a few days, the ether body is given over to the etheric world, where it pursues its further destiny, so that the individuality sets out on its further journey in the spiritual world together with the astral body. Just as the physical body here on the earth is separated from the individuality, so too is the human ether body. Now, we must be clear about the fact that in spiritualistic seances, and the whole of Sir Oliver Lodge's work is pervaded with his interest in them, only someone with a requisite knowledge is able to distinguish whether the communication is being conducted with the actual individuality or merely with the discarded etheric corpse which has been left behind. This etheric corpse is, nonetheless, in constant communication with the individuality. Now, if a connection is established with the spiritual world through the agency of a medium, this is formed initially with the ether body and one can never be sure whether one is really in contact with the individuality. There is, to be sure, the aspiration in our time to explore spiritual existence rather as one would engage in an experiment in the laboratory, to find something that one can really take hold of and see before one in the material world. Our materialistic age has little inclination to embark upon the inner path, the purely spiritual path, which the soul will follow into the spirit land. It wants the spirit to manifest itself materially, to descend into the material world. We are experiencing all kinds of materialistic spiritualism, a materialistic way of relating to the spiritual world. Now, it is perfectly possible for the etheric body which has been separated from the human individuality as such, to manifest a certain life of its own, which to the uninitiated can easily be confused with the life of the individuality. One should not think that once this ether body has been given over to the etheric world, it would exhibit only reminiscences, recollections, echoes of what the individual concerned experienced here on earth. Rather, does it manifest an ongoing individuality of its own. It can communicate and give rise to altogether new things. Nevertheless, anyone who thinks that this connection with the ether body also entails being in touch with the individuality is on the wrong track. This would be especially possible if the people sitting in a circle, and in this circle of the Lodge family, they were all members of the family, were directing their thoughts, which are formed to varying degrees, to the dead person, as was naturally the case with each of these members of the Lodge family. Thoughts of the dead person and memories of various kinds were being shared through the agency of the mediating power of the medium, and the ether body from time to time responds with wholly astonishing answers, which really give the impression that the dead man's individuality were giving them. Nevertheless, it may be that they derive merely from his discarded etheric corpse. Those who are familiar with such things find it to be the case that whenever the medium is describing a communication of some nature from Raymond Lodge to the members of his family, it will actually only be coming from the etheric corpse and so no communication will have been taking place between the individuality of Raymond Lodge and his family circle. 
Similarly, anyone who is accustomed to the way that such seances proceed would not find anything particularly remarkable about all these communications. This story would probably not have made so much impression on a wide circle of people or continue to reverberate further were it not for the photographs. For the issue of the photographs is indeed a quite remarkable phenomenon. After all, it is impossible that any transference of thoughts would have taken place from people in the circle to the etheric body through the medium as would have been possible with everything else that took place at the seances. No one in England could have known anything about the photographs. They had not reached England when the communications were made through the medium. Nevertheless, it is very strange that someone who has been interested in these matters and is, moreover, such a learned scientist as Sir Oliver Lodge, does not know how such a circumstance is to be regarded. I have gone to quite some trouble to look at this case more closely, and that is very possible, because Sir Oliver Lodge is a learned man, and a scientist and his descriptions are therefore reliable. So what we have here is not the record of an ordinary spiritualistic seance but the account of a man who writes with the certainty of a scientist, who is accustomed to the conscientiousness with which a chemist works in his laboratory. From the highly conscientious nature of the description, it is possible to form a complete picture of what it is all about. And that is what it is necessary to know. It is strange that a learned man like Sir Oliver Lodge who has been interested in these things for many years and has a very particular interest through the circumstances concerning his own son, knows nothing of the descriptions that have often been given through our spiritual science where the atavistic forms of clairvoyance are referred to as a form of premonition, as deuteroscopy. For in this case we are clearly dealing with a quite particular instance of deuteroscopy. Readers aside, Uh, Deuteroscopy is spelled D-E-U-T-E-R-O-S-C-O-P-Y. Deuteroscopy. End of readers aside. The fact of the matter is that a medium is involved here. To such a medium, the spiritual world is in a certain sense accessible, albeit through atavistic forces. Such mediums can reach beyond space in their visionary perception. Not only do they reach beyond space with their so-called second sight, but also transcend time. Let us take a very simple case, a case which has been described hundreds and hundreds of times. You can read descriptions of such cases if you have not yourself experienced something of this kind yourself or through someone you know. Whereby, someone who has a particular disposition for this sees his own coffin or funeral procession as a future event, as though in a dream or a dim visionary perception. He dies a fortnight later. He has seen something which was to occur only in fourteen days' time. It is possible for one to see not only one's own coffin or funeral procession, but, for example, the funeral of a complete stranger, an event with which one has no personal connection. Or, to relate a particular instance, one may see oneself called out in two or three weeks' time into the country and falling from a horse. This did actually happen. Someone saw this very thing and was very careful to take every precaution. But despite every precaution, this event still came about. Here we are concerned with transcending time. What Sir Oliver Lodge describes is none other than the bridging of two phases of time, a temporal second sight. This is quite simply what it is. His description is so precise that a thorough investigation is possible. Through her mediumistic power, the medium saw the future event. When the medium spoke, the photographs did not exist, but they did in a fortnight, or approximately so. They were then shown round. This happened only after a certain time, but the medium saw this in advance. It was a prophetic vision, a case of deuteroscopy. It was a premonition. That is the explanation. 
Hence it has nothing to do with a communication between those on the physical plane and the one who is in the spiritual world. You see how thoroughly confused one can be by endeavoring to give materialistic explanations of spiritual circumstances in the world. How very blind one can be toward what is actually going on. In truth, it is nevertheless a proof for the reality of a world lying behind the ordinary sense-perceptible world that such a premonition is possible. The case is interesting, even if one cannot use it in order to establish connections between the living and the dead. The dead must be sought, if we are to, and may be enabled to seek them at all on a truly spiritual path. In the near future we shall have much to say about these matters, for I intend to say quite a lot about the question of the relation of the living to the dead. I spoke about this book by Oliver Lodge regarding his son Raymond in order to show you that although there is indeed a longing for the spiritual world, the form in which it manifests itself is one that one can call materialistic. Oliver Lodge is a materialistic scholar. Even though he longs for the spiritual world, he wants to gain knowledge of it as one would the physical or chemical world. Just as he investigates chemical laws in the laboratory, he also wants to have visible proof of what relates to the spiritual world. Similarly, the path that we must necessarily recognize as the right one, the inner path of the soul to the spiritual world, which we have so often described, is far removed from his, although we have devoted no less time to describing what we recognize as of the most immediate concern to us today and underlies the world of the physical senses in which we live. The efforts made to reach the spiritual world in the materialistic way are a particularly clear sign of the whole materialistic character of our age. If our movement is to have any significance, that is the significance that must accrue to it from the laws governing human evolution, it must sharply emphasize the inner spiritual nature of reality as opposed to these materialistic, that is to say absurd, aspirations toward the spiritual world. Why is it necessary that in our present time an attitude that is completely different from a materialistic one, that is a purely spiritual attitude, should prevail in human hearts? We need to consider this question in relation to a fact to which we have frequently referred over the years, one that must closely concern us, especially in these times of suffering and tribulation. I have indicated that this twentieth century must bring to humanity a perception of the etheric Christ. As I have often said, just as at the time of the mystery of Golgotha the Christ was physically present amongst human beings in a particular place on the earth, it is equally true that in the twentieth century the etheric Christ will live and move amongst human beings over the entire earth. It is essential for the sake of the earth's evolution that mankind should not let this event pass by unobserved. It must have the attentiveness necessary that a sufficient number of people will be prepared truly to behold the Christ who will come and must be beheld. Just as the event of Golgotha did not come all of a sudden but was prepared over the course of thirty-three years, such an event will not come suddenly. The time when something will happen, albeit now of a spiritual nature, that will have a similar significance for mankind to the event of Golgotha on the physical plane is now very near. Hence, if you acknowledge in general terms the fact referred to above, you will not find it incredible if I say that he is already present in the form in which he will be beheld in the great moment of evolution in the twentieth century, that this great moment of evolution is being prepared. You will not find it difficult to believe if, in view of the great moment that is impending, it is already being anticipated. 
Indeed, one can say that the extent to which humanity would appear to be far from being imbued in its present deeds by the Spirit of Christ on the physical plane is matched by the closeness of Christ. He who is now approaching to human souls, if they would but open themselves to him. The occultist is able to point out that since the year 1909, or thereabouts, what is to come is being prepared in a clearly discernible way, and that since 1909 we have been living in a very special time. If we do but try to approach Christ to the extent that we are able, it is possible to find him in an altogether different way than was possible in earlier times. However simple it may seem, there is one thought that occurs to me which I must pass on to you out of a deep feeling for the times. It is unfortunate that people do not usually have sufficiently clear ideas about the past, specifically about what took place in human souls in previous centuries. They do not any longer have any real conception of the strength of the impression made by what lives in the Gospels that we are familiar with today, irrespective of what has actually been handed down to us. In the early Christian centuries, albeit on a limited circle of people, they have no idea of the infinite power that took hold of people's souls in this way. In the ensuing centuries, the impression made by the inner content of the Gospels grew weaker and weaker, and today one can honestly say that although individuals with certain intuitional powers can, through the words of the Gospels, gain an insight into what happened at the time of the mystery of Golgotha, the immense power that the words of the Gospels once possessed is diminishing to an ever greater extent and one has to accept that the influence of these words on the majority of people is now very weak. There is a resistance to acknowledging this, but it would be as well to do so, since this is the truth. How did this come to be the case? The fact of the matter is that what pervades the Gospels are not mere earthly words, but cosmic words, heavenly words which have an incomparably greater inner force than anything else on the earth. But it is nevertheless no less true that people have in our present time become estranged from the form in which these words have been set forth in the Gospels from the time of the mystery of Golgotha. Just consider how very difficult it is for you to understand the language of four or five centuries ago if you happen to chance upon it. It is very difficult to draw out from the words what they actually mean. The Gospels, in the form in which they are available to anyone today, are not the original Gospels. They do not have the original power. One can enter into them through a certain intuition, as I have often said, but they do not have the same force. But the words that Christ spoke, which should be deeply engraved in human souls, quote, I am with you always to the end of the earthly age, close quote, represent a truth, a reality, and he will be in close proximity to us in various forms in the twentieth century at the time that has been indicated. From what I have said, you may suppose that someone who, as an occultist, feels inwardly involved in these things may say, he is here, and he makes his presence felt so that we clearly know from him that he wants more from his human children than he did in the previous centuries. The Gospels have, hitherto, addressed human beings in an inward way. Their task was to take hold of people's souls. It was therefore possible to rest content with faith and not venture toward knowledge. This time is now over. It lies behind us. The Christ now has quite different plans for his human children. His intention is that the kingdom that he refers to as being, quote, not of this world, close quote, should become wedded to those aspects of man's being which are themselves not of this world, but are of another world. 
for that part of man's being which is not of this world lies within each one of us. And this aspect of our being must undertake an intensive quest for the kingdom of which Christ has said that it is not of this world. We are living at the time when this needs to be understood. Many such things in human evolution are proclaimed through profound contrasts. And likewise in our time, something of grandeur and deep significance is being proclaimed through contrast. For as Christ approaches in his etheric reality, the time will come when people will learn to consult Christ, not only on behalf of their own inner being, but in connection with what they want to undertake here on earth through that part of them which is immortal. The Christ is not only a ruler of human beings, he is their brother, who wants to be asked with respect to life's every detail. When people want to undertake anything today, they act in a totally contrasting way. Deeds seem to be accomplished today where people are as far removed as possible from appealing to Christ. We may well ask whether anyone poses the question, what would Christ Jesus say about what is taking place today? Who asks such a question? Many say that they do, but it would be sacrilegious to believe that they ask in such a way that their questions are really addressed to Christ himself. Nevertheless, the time must come and cannot be far away when people will, out of the immortal aspect of their being, ask Christ with respect to whatever they want to undertake, should we do this or should we not? Human souls will then see Christ accompanying them as a loving companion in life's every detail, not only receiving strength and consolation from the Christ being, but also information guiding them as to what needs to happen. The kingdom of Christ Jesus is not of this world, but it must exert an influence upon it. And human souls must be the instruments of the kingdom that is not of this world. From this point of view, we must be mindful of how little today people raise the question that must be posed to Christ with regard to individual deeds and events. However, mankind must learn to consult Christ. How is this to come about? This can happen only if we learn His language. Anyone who has an insight into the deeper significance of our spiritual science sees in it not merely a theoretical knowledge of all manner of problems that humanity encounters, of the various members of man's being, of reincarnation and karma, but views it as having a quite particular language, a particular way of speaking about spiritual things. It is far more important that we learn through spiritual science to have an inner discourse in our thoughts with the spiritual world than to acquire theoretical thoughts. For Christ is with us always, until the end of the epochs of earthly time. We need to learn his language. And through the language, however removed from everyday experience it may seem, that enables us to hear of Saturn, Sun, Moon, and Earth, and of the different periods and ages of the Earth, and of many other mysteries of evolution, we are teaching ourselves a language in which we can frame the questions that we pose to the spiritual world. If we learn inwardly to speak in the language of this spiritual life, what will then arise, my dear friends, is that Christ will stand beside us and give us answers. This is the basic attitude, the underlying feeling that we should receive from our spiritual scientific endeavors. Why do we concern ourselves with spiritual science? It is as though we were learning the vocabulary of that language through which we approach Christ. If we really try to learn to think about the world as spiritual science has sought to do, if we make the kind of mental effort that is asked of us by spiritual science to gain insight into the mysteries of the world, the figure of Christ Jesus will emerge from the dim, dark foundations of these mysteries 
and give us the strength and power that will imbue our lives. He will stand at our side in a brotherly way in order that we may be able in our hearts and souls to have the strength to gain the necessary maturity for the tasks of the future evolution of mankind. So, let us endeavor to make spiritual science our own, not merely as a teaching, but as a language, and then wait until we find the an- the questions in this language that we may address to Christ. He will answer. Yes, he will answer. And anyone who, amidst the spiritual depths through which mankind is currently passing in its evolutionary journey, receives guidance from Christ, which he will give in the near future to all who seek it, will be richly endowed with inner forces, inner strength, and renewed impulses of soul. The end of Lecture 1 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English, and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of the Complete Collected Works, Volume 175, by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Building Stones for an Understanding of the Mystery of Golgotha, Human Life in a Cosmic Context, 17 Lectures, given in Berlin, uh, translated by Simon Blacksland de Lange. This is Lecture 2, given in Berlin on the 13th of February, 1917. The thoughts that we formulated a week ago were focused on the insight that anyone with a knowledge of spiritual realities is well aware that, even though outwardly a materialistic view, a materialistic outlook on the world, has reached its culminating point, we are nevertheless inwardly at present in the initial phase of a dematerializing of thoughts and of the world of ideas and that in the course of time this will lead to a spiritualizing of earthly life, an imbuing of earth existence with the spirit. This renewing impulse, which is to take hold of outward life on the physical plane, must first be understood and formulated by some, and then by increasing numbers of people in a spiritual way. And spiritual science needs in this respect to begin the process whereby human beings are inwardly uplifted to what can become accessible to human souls today if they do but will it, to that of which outward physical life is not as yet a reflection, though it must become so, if the earth is not, in a certain sense, to be engulfed in the decline of materialistic evolution. One could describe man's present situation by saying that his soul is in general terms actually very close to the spiritual world. But the ideas, and especially the feelings, deriving from a materialistic conception of the world and a materialistic attitude toward it, have cast a veil over what is in actual fact closely affiliated to the human soul. The connection between physical earth existence where people today, in spite of many assertions to the contrary, are firmly rooted with their whole being, and the spiritual world, can be found by human beings if they try to develop the inner forces of courage to understand not only what nature displays before their outer senses, but also what remains invisible to sensory perception. For it is possible to unite with and experience this supersensible domain if one intensifies the inner forces of one's soul to the point where one becomes aware that something of a superhuman and spiritual nature lives in these inner forces of the soul. This connection should not be sought in the way that human connections are sought and pursued in the coarse world of outward sensory existence. For the connection between the human soul and the spiritual world will be found in the intimate forces which the human soul develops when it acquires the inner quality of quiet 
calm, attentiveness, a quality that cannot be achieved without training. For in this materialistic age, people have grown accustomed to paying attention only to what is thrust at them forcefully from without, and what, in a certain sense, cries out to their faculties of perception. The spirit that now needs to be experienced inwardly does not cry out, but rather has to be awaited. And it can be approached only by preparing oneself for it as it draws near. Whereas one can say that the phenomena of the outer world, which appear before our senses, and demand the attention of our faculties of perception, come toward us and address us directly, one cannot refer in a similar way to the manner in which the spirit, the spiritual world, approaches us. As the language of modern times is, as I have often said, more or less molded for the outer physical world, it is difficult to find words that are an exact reflection of whatever aspect of the spiritual world appears before our soul. But one can, nevertheless, try to show approximately how differently the spiritual and physical worlds approach man. One could say that the spiritual world is experienced through the feeling of gratitude that one has when experiencing it. Take special note of these words. We owe a debt of gratitude to the spiritual world. Our relationship to the physical world is such that we say that the mineral kingdom is spread out before our senses, and from it proceed the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, and then our own human kingdom. Within this human world we feel ourselves in a certain sense as being in a superior position in the sequence of these kingdoms of the outer world. With respect to the spiritual realms, we are aware of our inferior position and of the other realms, those of the Angeloi, Archangeloi, Archai, and so on, as being far above us. We feel that at every moment we are supported by these beings and continually summoned into life by them. We are grateful to them. We look up to them and say, our own life, all that lives in our soul, flows down to us from the will impregnated thoughts of the beings dwelling in these realms and constantly forms us. This feeling of personal gratitude to the higher realms should be just as alive in us as the feelings that outer impressions arouse within us as we perceive them physically. If both these feelings those that outer sensory phenomena exert upon us, and our awareness that what lives in the very center of our being is owed to the higher hierarchies, are equally alive in our soul, we are then in that state of balance whereby we can continue rightly to perceive the interplay between the spiritual and physical domains, a collaborative process which is taking place continually but which cannot be perceived without the feelings that have been characterized being in a state of balance. An evolution that leads into the future must proceed in such a way that through the presence of these two feelings in the human soul, additional forces enter into earthly evolution which are not able to prosper there in the present materialistic age. Such a statement clearly implies that there have been considerable changes in the course of human evolution. Only in the earliest period of human evolution was there a connection with the spiritual world, albeit in a dimly conscious form. In the early stage of their evolution, human beings did not only have the two states of consciousness that they have now, namely waking and sleeping, together with a chaotic dream life, but they had a third state of consciousness which did not merely consist of dreams, but was a capacity to perceive the world in pictures out of a dulled condition of consciousness, in pictures that corresponded to a spiritual reality. As we know, it was necessary for this way of perceiving the world 
to give way to the development of a fully earthbound consciousness. Man would not have become free if he had not been exposed to all the dangers, challenges and temptations of materialism. However, he must also find his way back to the spiritual world, whose mysteries he must fathom in full earthly consciousness. This is connected with far-reaching changes in the way that people here perceive the world in the course of human evolution, on the lines that we have just indicated. Living in constant communion with souls that had departed from physical existence was a purely natural state of affairs for people in ancient times, which did not require any proof. For in that state of consciousness, where they perceived the spiritual world in pictures, they lived together with those who through their karma were connected in some way with them in life and had passed into the spiritual world through the portal of death. They knew quite simply that the dead are there. They are not dead, they are alive, albeit in a different form of existence. Something that one perceives does not need to be proved. There was no need to ponder about immortality in former ages of human evolution for people experienced the so-called dead for themselves. However, this communion with the dead had other consequences of a far-reaching nature. It was at that time easier for the dead than it is now. I am not saying that it is impossible at present, but that it was easier then than now to collaborate with people here on the earth with what is going on and thus enable things to proceed as they should. Thus, in these early times of human evolution, what took place on the earth happened in such a way that the dead were active in people's will impulses, in everything that they did and sought to accomplish. Materialism has not only brought forth materialistic ideas, this would be the least harmful of its legacies, for materialistic ideas as such represent its least harmful aspect, it has given rise to a completely different form of coexistence with the spiritual world. It has become far less possible for the so-called dead to take an active part here in the evolution of the earth through the so-called living. And a connection with the dead of this nature is a relationship that mankind needs to re-establish. However, this will only be possible if people learn to understand the language of the dead, and the language through which one can communicate with the dead is none other than that of spiritual science. It may certainly seem, initially, that what spiritual science imparts to us is for the most part concerned with matters pertaining to spiritual erudition, such as world evolution, human evolution, and the various members of man's being and many people may well say that such things are of little interest to them. They want something that kindles their enthusiasm and warms their hearts. This is a very laudable demand. But the question is how far satisfying such a demand, to a certain extent, can take us. It seems that we are only learning how the earth has evolved on Saturn, Sun and Moon, how the various cultural epochs on the earth have run their course and how the members of man's being can be distinguished. But by focusing our thoughts on these seemingly abstract but actually very real matters, by endeavoring to think in such a way that these things can really be beheld in pictures, we are learning to preoccupy ourselves in a particular way with thoughts and ideas which we could not bring before our souls in any other way. If we come truly to feel how our ideas are transformed when we study these spiritual scientific insights, a time will come when we will find it just as absurd to say that we are not interested in concerning ourselves with these things as it would be for a child to say that it had no interest in learning about the trivialities of the ABC, but wants to be able to speak. When compared with what a living language can impart to us, 
the process that the child has to undergo in its bodily existence when learning to speak is no less abstract than are the ideas of spiritual science when contrasted with the thoughts, ideas, and feelings aroused in the soul under the influence of these spiritual scientific concepts. This does, of course, require patience, for it is necessary to assimilate spiritual science not as an abstract body of ideas, but as a living substance. With regard to what we now have in view, this is quite a remote possibility for people today. In a somewhat different way, however, they also have a certain affinity for it, for they are accustomed to being more or less content when they have focused their attention on a particular object or theme, such as a work of art of some sort or a scientific study. But if they see something for a second time, the tendency today is to say, I know this already, I have already dealt with it. This is life lived in the abstract. But in other domains, where life is evaluated in accordance with its actual realities, its essential substance, one does not proceed in such a way. Thus one is not likely to meet someone to whom one offers lunch and who then excuses himself for not wanting to eat on the grounds that he has already eaten yesterday or the day before yesterday. Where such things are concerned, one keeps on repeating the same action. Life is a constant repetition. If the spiritual realm is to become truly alive, and unless it does so, it is unable to bring us in touch with the universality of the world of spirit, we must imitate in our souls what the laws of life have formed in the physical world, which for all its ossified nature has a spiritual origin. In particular, we shall become aware that if with a certain rhythmic regularity we allow such impressions to affect us as presuppose a certain freedom of thought and emancipation of thinking from the physical world, much is going on within our inner being. The saving grace, if I may use these emotive words, of man's spiritual development will be that people do not settle into relating to spiritual ideas in the way that this tends to happen today, an attitude that can be characterized by statements such as, quote, Oh, I know that already. I have heard all, it all before. Close quote. But instead regard these ideas as being like life itself, which is always associated with repetition, with what I might call a recurrence of the same phenomenon at the same place. Thus, if we work toward imbuing our soul with spiritual life, our inner attentiveness also increases. It becomes so intimate that we are able inwardly to call to mind those important moments in which the connections with the spiritual world that speak most directly to our heart can be nurtured. Significant moments for engaging with the spiritual world are, for example, those of falling asleep and waking. The moment of falling asleep will be less fruitful for most people at the beginning of their spiritual development because immediately after going to sleep their consciousness will be so dulled that they will not perceive the world of spirit. But the moment of passing from sleep into a waking state, if we do become accustomed not simply to let it pass by unobserved, but try to pay attention to it by endeavoring to wake up in such a way that although consciousness has dawned, the world around us does not immediately approach us with its raw brutality. It can be highly productive. In this respect, there is much of value in the folk customs of olden times that is little understood today. Simple people who have little acquaintance with intellectual culture will say that when you wake up you should not look immediately at the light. Thus, instead of having an immediate raw impression of the outside world, one should remain in a state of wakefulness without receiving impressions of one's surroundings. If this can be achieved, it is at this moment of waking possible to see those dead people with whom we have a karmic connection approaching us. 
They do not only approach us at such times, but this is the best opportunity to perceive them. At such a time, we do not only have perceptions of this nature, but we also see what is taking place between us and the dead people concerned in the time outside these moments. For one's perception of the spiritual world is not bound up with time in the same way as one's perception of the physical world. Herein lies a difficulty with respect to comprehending the essential nature of the spiritual world. One moment of perception can momentarily and fleetingly reveal to us something from the spiritual world that extends over a wide expanse of time. The difficulty lies in having sufficient presence of mind to grasp in the moment what is spread out over greater periods of time. For, as is indeed generally the case, the moment may pass by in status nascendi. It is forgotten as soon as it arises. This is an inherent difficulty in comprehending the spiritual world. Were it not for this, a large number of people would, especially in our present time, already be receiving impressions of the spiritual world. There are also other moments in life when it is possible for the spiritual world to reach through to us. One example is when we form a thought in such a way that it springs forth from us. If we simply abandon ourselves to life and flow with the stream, there is little likelihood that the real, true and inwardly vibrant spiritual world will be active within us. Whereas in the moment when we inwardly take an initiative, When we are confronted with the decision that we have to make ourselves, even if only about something very trivial, this again is a particularly favorable moment for the dead people who are karmically connected with us to enter our sphere of consciousness. Such moments do not need to be important in the sense of what one terms important in outward material life. Indeed, what is important as a spiritual experience may sometimes not appear to have any great significance in one's outer life. But to someone who has insight into such matters, it is absolutely clear that these experiences, which, while perhaps having little outward significance, are inwardly of such great importance, have deep karmic associations. Thus it is necessary to observe soul processes of a more intimate nature if one wishes to arrive at an understanding of the spiritual world. It may, for example, occur that someone is walking along the street or sitting in his room and is startled by an unexpected bang or a sound that he had not anticipated. After his shock, he may have a moment of quiet reflection, which makes him aware that something important was revealed to him from the spiritual world during this shock. One needs to pay attention to these things. Generally speaking, people do not have any awareness of this aspect, since they are preoccupied with the shock that they received and are only able to dwell on this. This is why it is so important to acquire an inner sense of balance, as indicated at the end of my book Theosophy or entitled Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, for if this can be acquired one will not be so perplexed after such a shock that one dwells merely on one's sense of alarm and the nature of what one has experienced in such an apparently insignificant but nevertheless in an inward sense highly important moment will become clearly apparent, albeit in an intimate way. These are of course only initial steps which must be developed further. For by developing these capacities of being attentive to the moment of waking and being attentive to the moment when we are disturbed by an outward event of one kind or another, we learn to discover our connection with the wider cosmos, comprising, as it does, both material and spiritual aspects, to which we belong and from which we have become separated, with the object, to be sure, of becoming free human beings, but which is indeed the source whence we originated. The truth is that, as was an accepted fact in ancient times, man is not a sort of cosmic hermit who wanders about the earth like a lost soul 
as people believe now. On the contrary, he is, as was acknowledged in ancient times, part of the great cosmic whole, just as a finger is a member of our bodily organism. People today, or at any rate the majority of people, no longer feel themselves to be members of the great organism of the cosmos, in so far as it comes visibly to expression as a spiritual reality. Nevertheless, a reflection on ordinary scientific insights could teach us today that we and our lives are members of the whole cosmic order of which our own organism is a part. Let us take a very simple example which anyone can confirm for himself through a simple calculation. We all know that in spring on 21 March the sun rises at a definite point in the heavens. We call this the vernal point. However, we also know that this vernal point is not the same every year, but that it moves forward. We know that the sun now rises in the constellation of the fishes. Before the 15th century it rose in the ram. Parenthesis, astronomy continues to say in the ram or in Aries, which is not correct. However, this incidental remark can be disregarded for now. Close parentheses. So the vernal point progresses. The sun rises a little further on in the zodiac every spring. It is easy to see from this that over a certain period it will have moved through the whole zodiac, that the position of the dawn will have traveled through the entire zodiacal circle. Now the time that is necessary for the sun to move through the whole zodiac is approximately 25,920 years. So if you calculate the vernal point for any particular year, it will have moved forward in the following year, when 25,920 years have elapsed, the vernal point returns to the same point. Here, 25,920 is a highly significant period for our solar system. The sun takes what I might describe as a cosmic step, when the position of the dawn returns to the same point. Plato, the great Greek philosopher, referred to these 25,920 years as a cosmic year, the great Platonic year. All this is already very remarkable. But if we consider the following, we can see the infinite depth and significance of the whole remarkable picture. A human being normally takes 18 breaths in a minute. This varies in that, in childhood, they are somewhat more frequent and in old age less so, but on average it would be correct to say that a normal person takes 18 breaths. If on this basis we work out how many breaths are taken in a day, it is a simple calculation. 18 times 60, which makes 1080 in an hour, multiply that by 24, and we arrive at 25,920 breaths in a day. You see from this, that the same number governs, governs the human day with respect to our breaths as the great cosmic year is governed by this number in the passage of the vernal point through the zodiac. This is one of the signs which shows us that we are not just talking in a general vague and dimly mystical way when we say that the microcosm is an image of the macrocosm but that as regards an important function on which his life depends at every moment, man is governed by the same number and measure as the course of the sun within which his own life has also lived. Now let us consider another aspect of this. The patriarchal age, as it is generally called, is 70 human years. Of course, this does not mean that every person has to live for 70 years. Some people may live much longer, for man is a free being, and such thresholds may well be exceeded. Nevertheless, let us keep to this patriarchal age and say that a human being lives on average for 70 or 71 years. Let us work out how many days that is on the basis that there are 365 and a quarter days in a year. If we multiply this by 70, we get 25,567.5. If we multiply it by 71, we arrive at 25,932.75. From this, you can see that the point of time when human life encompasses exactly 
25,920 days, lies between the ages of 70 and 71. So the patriarchal age lasts for 25,920 days. So a human day is defined as having 25,920 breaths and a human life as having 25,920 days. Let us now investigate something else, which can now be done quite simply. You will see quite easily that if I divide the 25,920 years that the vernal point of the sun needs to pass through the zodiac by 365.25, I shall arrive at approximately 70 or 71, in that I arrived at the same figures through multiplication. That is to say, if I regard the Platonic year as one great year and divide it in such a way that I define the length of a day, I discover what a day is in terms of a Platonic year. What is it? It is the course of a human life. The course of a human life is related to the Platonic year as a day in a person's life is related to a year. The air is all around us. We breathe it in and breathe it out. The numerical rhythm of this process is such that 25,920 breaths are equivalent to one day in our life. What then is a day in our life? It has a rhythm whereby our ego and astral body leave our physical and ether bodies and return to them again. Thus day after day the ego and astral body leave and return, leave and return just as our breath is exhaled and inhaled. Many of our friends will recall that, in order to make this clear, I have in public lectures compared this alternation of waking and sleeping to a deep breath. So just as we exhale and inhale air when we breathe, our astral body and ego leave and return to our ether and physical bodies when we go to sleep and wake up again. This amounts to saying, that a being exists, or can be presumed to exist, that breathes in and out, just as we fulfill this function in an eighteenth of a minute. And the breathing of this being is directly related to the leaving and returning of our astral body and ego. This being is none other than the living being of the earth, in that the earth experiences day and night, it is breathing and its breathing process bears our sleeping and waking on its wings. This is the breathing process of a greater being. And now let us consider the breathing process of the greater being of the sun, encircling the heavens. Just as for the earth a day elapses as the ego and astral body depart from and re-engage with man's physical and etheric bodies, the great being corresponding spiritually to the sun, brings us human beings into existence. For our 70 to 71 years are, as we have demonstrated, a day in the sun year of the great platonic year. Our entire human life is an out-breathing and in-breathing of this great being to whom the platonic year is assigned. Thus, you see, we draw one small breath in an eighteenth of a minute with regu which regulates our life. If we, excuse me, we are involved in the life of the earth, whose breathing rhythm encompasses day and night, and this corresponds to the rhythm whereby our ego and astral body leave and return to our physical and ether bodies, and we are ourselves breathed out by the great being, whose life corresponds to the course of the sun. Our life is a breath of this great being. You see then that as microcosms we are fully part of the macrocosm and are subject to the same laws as regards the beings of the universe as our breathing is subject with respect to our own human nature. Everything is governed by number and measure. But what is so amazing, deeply meaningful and profoundly moving for our hearts is that number and measure govern the wider cosmos, the macrocosm, and the microcosm in a similar way. 
This is not merely a figure of speech, not merely something that is mystically felt, but something that a wisdom-filled contemplation of the world teaches us, namely that we stand as microcosms within the macrocosm. If, if one makes these very simple calculations, for they can, of course, be arrived at by means of the most ordinary methods of arithmetic, and if one does not have a heart like a block of wood, but one is sensitive to the mysteries of cosmic existence, a statement such as, quote, we are part of the cosmic whole, close quote, ceases to be purely abstract and becomes deeply alive. A knowledge and a feeling will blossom and flourish and bear fruit in impulses of the will. And the whole of humanity will live the all-encompassing life of divine cosmic existence. This is the path on which we may find to some extent a means of forming a link to the spiritual world and at most, and it must be found, as already indicated in the previous lecture, during the time when Christ will dwell etherically on the earth. I have even referred to the year when he began to move about etherically on our earth. He must be found. But people must become accustomed to perceiving the connection, the very intimate connection, that is already established with cosmic existence, a connection which, when it is perceived, will ensure that the need, the intense longing, arises to seek this union with the spiritual world. For it will not be long before people will be compelled to realize one thing, which is the following. If one is dulled by materialism, it is indeed possible to deny the spiritual world. But one cannot kill the inner forces which have the capacity to seek a connection with it. One can delude oneself as to the existence of a spiritual world, but one cannot kill the soul forces which have the potential to bring man into communion with the spiritual world. This has a very significant consequence of which one needs to be aware, especially in our time. Namely that where forces exist that have an effect, even if one denies them, the materialist does not forbid the forces of his soul that incline toward the spiritual world from having an effect. He cannot do so, for they have an effect anyway. You may ask whether someone who has these spiritually inclined forces within him can be a materialist. Yes, he can. They are active within him. Whatever he may think about it, they are at work within him. But what effect do they have in such a case? Forces that are present in any situation can indeed be suppressed as regards their own original influence, but they are then transformed into other forces. And if one does not use the forces that would reach toward the spiritual realm in order to seek an understanding of this domain, I speak now only of understanding since that is all that is necessary to begin with, they are transformed into forces of illusion in human life. Their effect is then such that people in ordinary life abandon themselves to all manner of illusions with respect to the world around them. That this should be so is not without significance in our time, for at no time have people indulged their imagination as they do today, even though they have no love for imagination. Imagination is not restricted to particular areas. If one were to begin to give examples of what people who want to be mere realists and materialists imagine, one could shed light on all sorts of things, and there would be no end of it. Although I do not want to engage in heresies, one might, by way of an example, begin to take a look at what certain people, statesmen, for instance, have prophesied no more than a few weeks ago about the probable course of events in the world, and then cast one's eye, E-Y-E, over what has actually happened. If one compares these things, one will find that the capacity for illusion has, for quite some years, been far from small. If one investigates all areas of life in this way, 
it is quite remarkable to note the extent to which this capacity for illusion exists everywhere today. This capacity for illusion at times endows the attitudes and opinions of materialistically inclined people with a childlike, even perhaps a childish quality. When one sees what is needed for people to understand one another or to try to spell something out to them, one will get some idea of what I mean when I say childlike or even childish. Well, this is how things are. If people turn away from the spiritual world, They must pay for it by becoming prone to illusions, by losing the capacity to have appropriate concepts about outward physical reality and the course of outward events. Their imagination is then directed toward another realm because they have a disregard for truth, irrespective of whether it relates to spiritual or physical reality. I once gave you an obvious example which, even though it relates to matters within our own circles, is nevertheless quite typical. One frequently experiences discussions where the spiritual science advocated by me is the subject of negative judgments. These judgments are based on the assertion that everything I have said is pure fantasy and such flights of fancy are not permitted. So these people do not want to accompany us into the true spiritual world because they consider it to be purely fanciful, and they despise such fanciful imaginations. And then they formulate all sorts of arguments, whose relationship to the reality in question is no greater than that of white to black, for example, about my own antecedents, about the way that I did this or that in my life. In this way they develop the boldest fantasies, Here you see the coexistence of a repudiation of the spiritual world and a capacity for illusion. The people concerned do not notice this, but it accords with an absolute law. A certain amount of energy is directed toward the spiritual world and a certain amount toward the physical world. If the quantum of energy available for the spiritual world is not used for this purpose, it is directed toward the physical world, not in order to grasp the truth of earthly reality, but to plunge people into illusions concerning their lives today. This cannot be similarly observed in each individual case, so that one can necessarily say in every instance that this person has fallen prey to illusion through his rejection of the spiritual world. Such examples can indeed be found, but they have to be searched for. And the reason that they cannot so easily be detected is that life is complicated and one person influences the other. It is always the case that a stronger soul influences weaker souls, so that if one finds a certain capacity to cherish illusions in one person, the reason for this tendency lies in a hatred for or a rejection of the spiritual world. But this does not necessarily reside in the soul of the person who is swayed by illusions and may have been suggested to him. In spiritual domains, the danger of infection is far greater than in any physical domain. In the next lecture, when we shall take what we have been considering today further and connect it with the Christ mystery and the mystery of our present time, so as to gain some insight into the significance of the spiritual outlook as a whole, we shall endeavor to discover how what has been under discussion here is connected with the general karma of humanity and how these matters, when considered in the light of the important law of the metamorphosis of soul forces, oriented toward the spiritual world into forces of illusion, exert an influence in the whole context of life and are associated with the developmental circumstances of our present age and of the immediate future. The end of Lecture 2. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of the uh, complete edition 
uh, Collected Works, Volume 175, of Building Stones for an Understanding of the Mystery of Golgotha, Human Life in a Cosmic Context, translated by Simon Blaxland de Lang. This is Lecture 3, given in Berlin on the 20th of February, 1917. The fruits of spiritual science can, through their essentially practical orientation, in the highest sense of the word, enable us to feel that the ordinary outer aspect of man's being has within it an inner aspect, which to all intents and purposes is completely distinct from the former outward aspect. In this respect, we as human beings consist of two beings, one of which is composed of our physical and etheric bodies, and belongs more to the outer world, outer in the sense that this physical body, and to a certain degree also the etheric body, are forms and images, that is to say manifestations, of the divine spiritual beings, by whom we are constantly surrounded. Our physical and etheric bodies, in their true essence, as opposed to how we, as human beings, know them initially, are images, not of us, of our real being but are images, shall we say, of the gods, who find fulfillment in giving rise to and developing our physical and etheric bodies, just as we, as human beings, bring about our own actions. The inner aspect of man's being is more closely related to the astral body and ego. In the context of the universe, The astral body and ego are younger than the physical and etheric bodies. We know this from the information that has been recorded in the book titled Occult Science, also known as Esoteric Science. Our ego and astral body, as it were, reside within the protective sheath that is prepared for us by the divine spiritual beings who pervade the outer universe and make it manifest. And through the experiences, trials, and fluctuations of destiny that they, uh, readers aside, I believe that is the ego and astral body, the end of readers aside, they undergo as a result of their association with the physical and etheric bodies, they are intended gradually to ascend to the stages of development with which we have already become familiar. As I indicated to you in the previous lecture, we have a very intimate connection with the entire universe, with the whole cosmos. And this connection is such that, as we saw from a brief exploration of numerical relationships, it can even be calculated and expressed in numbers. Although there are many, many ways in which this becomes apparent, it is to our great astonishment expressed by the fact that the number of breaths that a person takes in a day equals the number of years that the vernal point of the sun needs to return to the point where it began. If we ponder these numerical discoveries with our feelings, they can fill us with awe, with a holy awe, of the way that we belong to the divine spiritual universe as it is manifested in all outward phenomena. This fact of our being the microcosm, the little world fashioned and manifested, out of the macrocosm, out of the big world, is shown at a far deeper level if we consider the realities that I want to put before you today, which I might refer to as the three encounters of the human soul with the essential nature of the universe. That is, therefore, what I should like to speak about now. We all know that as earthly human beings, We bear within us the physical body, the ether body, the astral body, and the ego. Each of the two aspects of man's being to which I have referred has within it two subordinate elements. The more outward aspect has the physical and etheric bodies. The more inward aspect has the ego and astral body. We also know that man will develop further through a Jupiter, a Venus, and a Vulcan planetary evolution. During this time, man will rise from one stage to another. We know, additionally, that a higher being will manifest within him that will develop beyond his ego. This will be the spirit self, 
which will come to full manifestation during the Jupiter evolution, which will follow Earth evolution. The life spirit will fully manifest itself within man during the Venus state age, and the actual spirit man during the age of Vulcan. Thus, as we anticipate the great cosmic future of mankind, we see before us this threefold evolution of the spirit self, life spirit, and spirit man. But these three further stages, which in a certain sense await us in our future evolution, already have a relationship to us today, even if they are not the least bit developed, for they are encompassed within the bosom of the divine spiritual beings whom we have learned to know as the higher hierarchies. We will be endowed with them from out of these higher hierarchies. Today we already have a relationship to these higher hierarchies, who will, in the future, bestow upon us the spirit self, the life spirit, and the spirit man. Thus, instead of saying in a somewhat complicated way, quote, we are related to the hierarchy of the angels, close quote, we can simply say, quote, we are related to what is to come in the future, to our spirit self, close quote. And, Instead of saying, quote, we are related to the archangels, close quote, we say, quote, we are related to the life spirit, which will come in the future, close quote, and so on. Indeed, we human beings already have a predisposition, and in the spiritual world, predispositions have a far greater significance than in the physical world. To be more than merely a fourfold being with a physical body, ether body, astral body, and ego. We already bear the germinal essence of the spirit self within us, also that of the life spirit and spirit man. They will evolve from us in the future, but we already possess them in their rudimentary form. Moreover, the manner in which they are present within us has nothing abstract about it. And when I say that we bear them within us, I mean this in a very real way for we have actual encounters with these higher beings of our excuse me with these higher members of our being these meetings take place in the following way we would as human beings increasingly come to feel estranged from the spiritual world something that people find difficult to endure in our present age if we were not able to encounter our spirit self from time to time our ego must meet with that higher member of our spirit self, which we have yet to develop, and which in a certain sense is of a similar nature to beings from the hierarchy of the angels. So as one says when speaking in a Christian context, we must from time to time meet a being from the hierarchy of the angels who is particularly close to us, because when this being meets us, it brings about a spiritual change in us, which enables us at, for, at some future time to receive a spirit self. Similarly, we also need to have an encounter with a being from the hierarchy of the archangels, because this being brings about something within us which leads to the development of the life spirit, and so on. Whether in a Christian sense we assign this being to the hierarchy of the angels or whether we speak more as the ancients did when they spoke of the daimon, of a person's guiding genius, makes no difference. We know that we are living at a time when only a few people, though this will soon change, who are able to behold the spiritual world and perceive its beings and other phenomena. The time has now passed when people beheld the beings of the spiritual world together with its various developmental processes, to a far more extensive degree. And at the time when people spoke of the genius of an individual person, they were also able to have a direct perception of this genius. It was not so very long ago that this clarity of perception was so strong that it was possible to describe it quite concretely and objectively, and in terms that people today would regard as poetic although nothing fanciful was intended. Thus Plutarch 
describes man's relationship to his genius in the following way, and I should like to quote the actual passage. Plutarch, the Greek writer, says that says that aside from the part of the soul that is immersed in the earthly body, another pure part of it remains hovering above a person's head and is like a star in appearance. And this part is rightly called his daimon, his genius, who guides him and whom the wise man willingly follows. Thus Plutarch describes in this distinct way what he so much wants to be taken not as a poetic fancy, but as a clearly perceptible outward reality that he states explicitly, quote, The rest of the spiritual part of man's being can in a certain sense be perceived simultaneously with the physical body, so that the spiritual part normally occupies the physical space, excuse me, the physical body in the same space. But as for the genius, man's guiding and ruling spirit, it can be beheld as something special outside the head of every human being. Close quote. In Paracelsus, one of the last who, without any special training or talents, had powerful insights into these things, said on his own account roughly the same about this phenomenon. Many others gave a similar picture. This genius is none other than the budding spirit self though born by a being from the hierarchy of the angels. It is deeply meaningful to immerse oneself in these things, for the particular nature of this genius can be discerned when it becomes perceptible, as one will come to understand if, for example, for this subject could be considered from a completely different point of view, but we will adopt this particular viewpoint, we arrive at a conception of the mutual relations of human beings. This theme has something to teach us, something that is by no means without significance with respect to the spiritual members of man's being. When two people encounter one another, and one is able to observe this encounter with one's physical vision, one notices that they come together and perhaps greet one another and so forth. But if one has the ability to observe such an event spiritually, one finds that with every human encounter a spiritual process is associated, which comes to expression in that for as long as two people are standing next to one another, the part of the ether body, which forms the head, becomes an expression of the most refined sympathy and antipathy that these two people who have come together feel for one another. Let us suppose that two people meet who cannot bear one another. We are taking an extreme case, but this undoubtedly happens. Suppose two people meet who cannot stand one another, and that this feeling of extreme antipathy is mutual. What then happens is that the part of the ether body that forms the head projects beyond the head of both individuals, and the etheric sheaths of the heads incline toward each other. When two people meet who cannot endure one another's company, their antipathy is expressed etherically as a continual inclining of the head. Whereas, when two, two people come together who love one another, a similar process can be observed. However, the etheric head in this case withdraws. It inclines backward. And so what arises in both these cases whether the ether body inclines forward as if in greeting where antipathy is felt, or whether it inclines backward where there is a bond of love, is that the physical head becomes freer than it would otherwise be as a result of the balancing gestures of the etheric head. These movements are always only relative. The ether body does not reach out completely, but it shifts to some extent and then returns so that some continuity can be observed. But in this way a more rarefied ether body now fills the head than if one were on one's own. The consequence of this is that by virtue of the fact that this ether body that fills the head has become more rarefied, the astral body remaining within the head becomes more clearly visible to clairvoyant perception. 
So not only is there this movement of the ether body, but a change takes place in the astral light of the head. Hence the reason why, in circles where such things are understood, people who are capable of selfless love are portrayed with a, an aura around their heads known as a halo. Read that again. Hence the reason why in circles where such things are understood, people who are capable of selfless love are portrayed with an aura around their heads known as a halo is not that artists are indulging in creative license, but that an actual truth is involved. When two people meet one another in the ordinary way, so that in their love there is always a strong element of egotism, this phenomenon is not so apparent. But when a person comes in contact with others at moments where he is not concerned with himself and his own personal relationship to another individual, but with humanity in general, with an all-pervading love for mankind, such phenomena do indeed become visible. At such times the astral body in the region of the head becomes clearly discernible. If people are present who are capable of clairvoyantly perceiving selfless love in another person, they will see the halo and are obliged to paint the halo as a reality or in whatever way may be appropriate. These things are associated with objective facts of the spiritual world. But the objective elements of this situation, insofar as they are part of the ongoing reality of human evolution, are connected with something else. A human individual must from time to time enter into an inner communion with his spirit self, with the spirit self which is brought into being in an undeveloped form in the astral aura that becomes so visible in what I have indicated to you, raining down from out of the future. He must from time to time be brought in touch with his spirit self. When does this occur? We now come to the first meeting of which we have to speak. When does this happen? It takes place during normal sleep, roughly in the middle of the period between the time of going to sleep and waking up. With people who are close to nature, the simple country people who go to sleep when the sun sets and rise with the dawning light, this midpoint more or less coincides with the middle of the night. With someone who is more detached from natural rhythms, this is less the case. However, human freedom requires that this should be possible. In present-day culture, people can organize their lives how they want, even though it is bound to have a certain influence on their lives that within certain limits they can do so. Nevertheless, they can in the middle of a long sleep experience this intimate communion with the spirit self, with the spiritual qualities from which the spirit self will be derived, a meeting with their genius. So this meeting with one's genius takes place more or less every night, every time one goes to sleep. It is important that this happens, for the sense of contentment that one feels regarding one's connection with the spiritual world is dependent on the after-effect of this meeting with one's genius during sleep. The feeling that we are able to have in our waking state of our connection with the spiritual world is an after-effect of this meeting with our genius. This is the first encounter with the higher world, and it takes place initially unconsciously for most people. Although they become increasingly conscious of it, the more they become aware of its influence through refining the waking consciousness in their feelings by absorbing the ideas and concepts of spiritual science to the point where their souls are sufficiently sensitive to be able to observe these after-effects. This meeting with the genius comes frequently to consciousness in some form or other, but the present materialistic environment which is full of concepts deriving from a materialistic view of the world and quite particularly the life of today, pervaded as it is with a materialistic attitude, 
do not enable the soul to be attentive to what is brought about as a result of this meeting with the genius. As people fill their minds with concepts that are more spiritual than any that materialism can offer, the perception of these nightly meetings with the genius will become more and more self-evident to them. The second meeting of which we must now speak is of a higher nature. You will be aware, from what I have already said, that this first meeting with the genius is associated with the course of the day. If we were to adapt our outward lives completely as people who do not have the freedom that we possess in our modern culture, this meeting would coincide with midnight. At the hour of midnight, every person would have this encounter with the genius. But it is in the nature of freedom that this meeting with the ego, excuse me, that this meeting when the ego encounters the genius is no longer fixed. The second meeting, however, is not so movable. For what is connected more with the astral body and ether body is less movable with respect to the macrocosmic order. What is connected with the ego and physical body has a strong degree of mobility for people today. Thus the second meeting is connected more with the great macrocosmic order. Just as the first meeting is connected with the daily rhythm, this second meeting is associated with the course of the year. At this point I need to draw your attention to various things that I have already indicated in this connection from different points of view. Man's life in its entirety does not run its course in a similar way throughout the year, and there are certain distinct changes. In the summer, when the sun is at its hottest, man is far more strongly engaged with his physical life, and hence also with the physical life of his surroundings, than during the winter, when he has to battle against the outer elements of nature and is thrown back on his own resources. The spiritual part of his nature is also freer, both in itself and from the earth, and he is connected strongly with the spiritual world, with his whole spiritual environment. Hence the particular feeling that we associate with the Christmas mystery and the Christmas festival is by no means arbitrary, but it forms part of the timing of the Christmas festival. During those winter days appointed for the festival, both man and the entire earth give themselves up to the spirit. Man is therefore inhabiting a realm where the spirit is very close to him. The consequence of this is that around Christmas time, thus until our modern new year, man experiences a meeting of his astral body with the life spirit, just as the first meeting entails an encounter of his ego with the spirit self. The possibility for Christ Jesus to draw near depends on this meeting with the life spirit, for Christ Jesus reveals himself through the life spirit. He reveals himself through a being from the realm of the archangels. He is, of course, an infinitely higher being, but this is not what we are concerned with at present. What we have to consider is that he manifests himself through a being from the realm of the archangels. Thus, with respect to modern evolution, evolution since the mystery of Golgotha, we draw particularly close to Christ Jesus through this meeting, and we can in a certain sense also call the meeting with the life spirit the encounter with Christ Jesus, which takes place in the very depths of our soul. Now when a person, whether by developing spiritual consciousness in the realm of religious study and practice, or as a supplement to the religious feelings nurtured in this way, by absorbing the concepts and ideas of spiritual science, has intensified and spiritualized his feelings in the manner described, he will in the same way that in waking life he is able to experience the after-effects of the meeting with his spirit self, experience the after-effects of the meeting with the life spirit, that is, with the Christ. And it is indeed the case that in the time following the period of Christmas 
until Easter, the conditions are particularly favorable for bringing clearly to consciousness the encounter that a person has with Christ Jesus. The period of Christmas is connected with earthly processes at a profound level, and this should not become blurred today through a materialistic way of looking at things. For man accompanies the changes taking place in the earth at Christmas. The time of Easter is determined by processes in the heavens. Easter Sunday falls on the first Sunday, following the first full moon after the vernal equinox. So whereas Christmas is governed by earthly circumstances, Easter is determined from above. Just as we are, through all that has been described, connected with earthly circumstances, so are we connected, through what I shall now relate, with heavenly circumstances, with what is going on in the wider expanses of the spiritual cosmos. For Easter is that time in the yearly cycle when everything that has been brought about in us through the meeting with Christ at Christmas time is fully united with our physical earthly humanity. And the great mystery of Good Friday, which brings the mystery of Golgotha to a focus for us as human beings at Easter time, has, in addition to much else, the significance that Christ who has, as it were, been walking beside us at the time that I have been describing, now approaches us most strongly in that, to put it in a vivid picture, he disappears into us during the ensuing period of summer, when in the ancient mysteries human beings sought to unite themselves at St. John's Tide with the macrocosm in a way that was not possible after the mystery of Golgotha. From this you can see that we are a microcosm and that we are incorporated in the macrocosm in a deeply meaningful way. And in the cycle of the year there is a continual union with the macrocosm which is brought about through man's inner relationship to the year's course. In this way Spiritual science seeks gradually to reveal the insights that can be acquired through spiritual scientific research regarding the pervading and permeating of our earthly lives by Christ since the mystery of Golgotha. At this point I need to make an interpolation which is important and needs to be thoroughly understood by those sympathetic to spiritual science. It should not be thought that our spiritual scientific endeavors should be a substitute for religious life and practice. Spiritual science can to the highest degree, and especially with respect to the Christ mystery, be a support for and a foundation of religious life and practice. But one should not turn spiritual science into a religion. And one needs to be quite clear in one's mind that religion in its living form and when practiced in a living way kindles a spiritual consciousness of the soul within the human community. If this spiritual consciousness is to become a vital presence within man, he cannot continue to have abstract conceptions of God or Christ, but he must be constantly renewed through involvement in religious practice and activity which can take the most divergent forms for different people, in something that surrounds him as a religious environment and speaks to him out of this background. And if this religious milieu is of sufficient depth and has the means of stimulating the soul, such a soul will also come to feel a longing for those ideas that are developed in spiritual science. Moreover, If spiritual science is, as it surely is, in an objective sense a support for religious edification, the time has now come when, from a subjective point of view, a person with true religious feelings is driven by these very feelings also to seek knowledge. For spiritual consciousness is acquired through religious feeling and spiritual knowledge through spiritual science just as knowledge of the natural world is acquired through natural science. 
and spiritual consciousness leads to the impulse to gain spiritual knowledge. From a subjective point of view, one can say that an inner religious life can spur a person on today to spiritual science. A third meeting is when a person approaches the spirit man, which will be fully developed only in the far future. This meeting is mediated by a being belonging to the hierarchy of the archai. We may say that people in ancient times, as people also do in our present time, although when they speak of these things, they no longer have an awareness of the deeper truths involved, experienced this meeting as an encounter with that which pervades the world, a presence which we are barely able to distinguish any longer in ourselves or in the world, but where our selfhood is absorbed in the world as in a unity. And just as in the case of the second meeting one can speak of an encounter with Christ Jesus, so with the third meeting one can speak of an encounter with the Father Principle, with the, in quotes, Father, who represents the very ground of the world, with that being whom one experiences when one has a true feeling for what the various religions mean by the Father. This meeting is of such a nature that it reveals our intimate relationship to the macrocosm, to the divine spiritual universe. The daily course of universal processes, of world processes, includes our meeting with our genius. The yearly course includes our meeting with Christ Jesus. And the course of the whole of a human life, this human life of ours, which can generally be designated as the patriarchal life of 70 years, coincides with the meeting with the Father Principle. For a certain period of our physical earthly life, by rights through education, although at at present largely unconsciously, we are prepared for and then experience, in the case of most people unconsciously between the ages of 28 and 42, though in a very real way in the intimate depths of the soul, this meeting with the Father Principle. The after effects of this may extend into later life if we develop a sufficient degree of sensitivity in our feelings to be aware of what emerges from within ourselves as an influence in our lives deriving from this meeting with the Father Principle. During the period of our lives when we are being prepared, our education should, and this can happen in a variety of ways, be making this meeting with the Father Principle as profound an experience as possible. This can happen if during the period of his education A person is urged to develop strong feelings about the splendor and magnificence of the world and the sublime nature of its processes. We considerably deprive children and adolescents if we fail to draw their attention to the beauty and grandeur of the world for which we feel the greatest reverence and devotion so that this passes them by. If we enable young people to feel a real connection in their hearts with beauty and with the greatness of the world, we are preparing them for a real meeting with the Father Principle. For this meeting has a considerable significance for the life between death and a new birth. This meeting with the Father Principle, which generally occurs in the years indicated above, signifies that a person has a considerable degree of strength and support when after he has passed through the gate of death he has, as we are aware, to retrace his life's path, his earthly journey, retrospectively as he passes through the soul world. This retrospective journey, which as we know lasts for one-third of the time spent between birth and death, can and should be a powerful experience if the person concerned is able to see. Here at this point I met with that being whose existence comes to expression in dimly intuitive, stammering words when people speak of the Father of the Cosmic Order. This is an important picture. 
which together with the picture of death itself, a person needs to have once he has passed through the portal of death. There is, of course, an important question that arises in connection with this. Some people die before they have reached the middle of their life, which is when the meeting with the Father Principal normally takes place. We need to consider the situation where someone dies because of some outward cause, through illness, which is indeed such an outward cause, or weakness of some kind. If because of this early death the meeting with the Father Principal in the subconscious depths of the soul has not yet become possible, it happens in the hour of death. This meeting is experienced when death occurs. At this point it is of relevance to speak in a somewhat different way of what I have already brought to expression in, for example, my book Theosophy, where there is a reference to the invariably tragic phenomenon of people bringing their lives to an end through their own will. No one would do this who was aware of the significance of such a deed. And once spiritual science has really fully entered into people's feelings, there would no longer be any suicide. For in order that a person may perceive the Father Principle directly after death occurs, in a case where death takes place before the middle of life, it is necessary that death approaches him from without rather than through being self-inflicted. The difficulty that befalls the human soul, and which is described from another viewpoint in my theosophy, might be described from the standpoint from which I am speaking today, if I were to say that through a death that is self-inflicted, the individual concerned deprives himself of the meeting with the Father Principle in this incarnation. Because they are so intimately involved with our lives, the truths that spiritual science is able to impart to us about human life have such infinitely serious implications in instances of particular importance. They bring us clarity about our lives in a serious way. And this serious illumination regarding their lives is needed by people at a time when they need to extricate themselves from materialism, which governs the present world order and the prevailing world conception insofar as these depend on human beings. More powerful forces will be needed to overcome the strong connection with the purely material powers that have taken hold of people today in order once more to give them the possibility of recognizing their connection with the spiritual world from their immediate experience of life. Whereas one speaks in a more abstract way of the beings of the higher hierarchies, one can speak in a more concrete way of how the human individual himself can ascend in three stages through experiences, which, while being initially unconscious, may be brought to consciousness during his life between birth and death. Through the meeting and the genius, through the meeting with Christ Jesus, and through the meeting with the Father. Of course, a great deal depends on our acquiring as many ideas as possible that call forth feelings, ideas which refine our inner soul life in such a way that we do not heedlessly and inattentively fail to notice these things, which are simply part of the reality of our lives, if we did but know it. Education will have a very considerable part to play in this respect in the near future. There is something else that I still need to mention. Just think how infinitely life would be deepened if to the overall knowledge of karma one could add such details as the meeting with the Father Principle that a person whose life ends relatively early has when he dies. For it then becomes clear that it was a karmic necessity for this person to experience an early death in order that a meeting of abnormal intensity with the Father Principle might take place. For what actually occurs when a meeting of such a kind with the Father Principle takes place. The person concerned is destroyed from without. His physical being is undermined by outward forces. Indeed, this is also the case with an illness. 
The scene where the encounter with the Father Principle is being enacted is then still here in the physical world. Through the destruction that this external, physical, earthly world has wrought upon a person, the meeting with the Father Principle is manifested at that very place. And when viewed in retrospect, it does of course continue to be visible. The individual concerned is thereby also enabled throughout the entire life that he leads after he has passed through the portal of death to keep firm hold of the thought of the place where, descending from heavenly heights to this earthly location, the Father Principle met with him. This does, however, lead him to want to bring a strong influence from the spiritual world into the physical earthly world. If we consider our present time from this viewpoint and try to experience the weighty feelings that have been aroused within us now at the very mentioning of the meeting with the Father Principle as feelings and not as a mere abstract idea, and if we endeavor to contemplate the numerous premature deaths now occurring with feelings of this nature, we have to say that these were predestined as a preparation for the considerable influence that can stream down from the spiritual world to the physical earthly world in the near future. This is another aspect of what I have been saying for some years when confronted by these tragic events that these people who are passing prematurely through the portal of death will become helpers in a quite particular way for the future evolution of mankind, which needs powerful forces to extricate itself from materialism. However, all this needs to be brought to consciousness. It must not take place unconsciously or in a subconscious state of mind. It is therefore necessary that there are human souls on earth who can make themselves receptive for this, as I have already indicated, since otherwise the forces emanating from the spiritual world will go in other directions. In order that these forces, which are predestined to be available, can become fruitful for the earth, it is necessary for there to be souls on the earth who imbue themselves with knowledge of the spiritual world. And there must be more and more souls imbued with such a knowledge. So let us try to enable what has to be expressed initially in words, namely the content of spiritual science, to bear fruit. And let us try, with the help of the language that we learn through spiritual science, I mentioned this here in the last lecture, but one, to re-enliven the old insights and ideas that are not for nothing embedded in our modern life. Thus, for example, let us breathe new life into Plutarch's idea that as human beings we are as physical beings also imbued with the spiritual aspect, but that in particular a person has a higher member which belongs to him spiritually outside his head and which, if he is wise, he follows. Let us try to allow the feelings to which I have referred help us not to pass these phenomena of life by unnoticed. In conclusion, I shall leave you today with a thought which is particularly suited to awaken the necessary feelings in our souls. It is unfortunately difficult for many people today in our modern materialistic life to have a feeling for something it mitigates the sorrows of this period of trial, although what is needed is something that goes beyond mitigation, which might be a forlorn hope if materialism continues to prevail at its present level, and its strength is already considerable, and it is likely to become more and more so. It is very, very difficult for many people in our materialistic age to have a feeling for what, for what I might describe as the holiness of sleep. It is a cultural phenomenon of far-reaching significance when one can experience that among those who are regarded as intelligent there is an absence of any respect for the holiness of sleep. Such things are not said here by way of blame and they are also not intended to drive people toward some unattainable ascetic goal. 
We must live with the world, but we must do so with our eyes open. For only in this way can we wrench our bodily nature. Uh, And there's text missing. Readers aside, end of readers aside. One needs only to consider how many people who spend their evening hours preoccupied with purely material things go to sleep without developing any awareness. And there would be no more than a very dim awareness of this in a materialistic mind. That sleep unites us with the spiritual world. Sleep sends us over into the spiritual world. People should at least gradually become able to develop an awareness of what they can express in words such as these, quote, I am going to sleep. Until I wake, my soul will be in the spiritual world. There it will meet the guiding power of my earthly life who hovers around my head. There it will meet the genius. And when I awake, I shall have had the meeting with my genius. The wings of my genius will have come in contact with my soul. Close quote. As regards the overcoming of the domination that materialism has over life, a great deal depends on whether or not one makes such a feeling alive within one. The overcoming of this domination can happen only through the awakening of intimate feelings which are also in accordance with the spiritual world. Only if we make such feelings alive within us will our lives in sleep become so intense and the contact with the spiritual world so strong that our waking life will also gradually be strengthened and we shall then have around us not merely the world of the senses but also the spiritual world which is the true, real world. For the world that we generally call the real one is, as I have indicated in the last public lecture, only a reflection of the real world. The real world is the world of the spirit. The little community that is currently devoted to anthroposophically oriented spiritual science will gain the fullest impression of the serious symptoms, the harsh suffering of our time, if in addition to all the other trials to which man is subject today, it learns to feel this time as a test as to whether there are sufficient resources of inner strength and true courage to unite what we need to absorb through our reasoning and intellectual powers in the form of spiritual science with our whole being. With these words, I wanted once more to emphasize what I have often said here, that spiritual science will find its right place in human hearts only when it is not mere theory and knowledge, but when, symbolically speaking, it pervades and enlivens our whole being as the heart's blood of the soul, as intimately as our physical blood pervades and gives life to our bodily organism. The end of Lecture 3 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole translators of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of the Complete Collected Works, Volume 175, by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Building Stones for an Understanding of the Mystery of Golgotha, Human Life in a Cosmic Context, translated by Simon Blacksland DeLang. This is Lecture 4, given in Berlin on the 27th of February, 1917. I spoke to you last time about the three meetings which the human soul has with the regions of the spiritual world. I shall have a few more things to say on this subject, and this will give me the opportunity to answer a question asked by our friends at the end of the last public lecture in the architectural hall regarding the forces which lead to the fulfillment of karma and outward destiny from a previous incarnation. I have been told that this is very difficult to understand. I shall, therefore, return to this theme in the course of these lectures, but it will be better to do so after 
only after we have spoken about something which will perhaps bring about a fuller understanding of this question. In order, however, that what was said about the three meetings in the spiritual world may be further clarified, I shall today insert, by way of an episode, something that seems to me to be particularly important to discuss with you just at this very time. When we consider the ideas that have been embraced by the souls of all people, people of all educational levels, as a result of the intellectual developments of recent centuries, we become clearly aware that these developments have given a powerful impetus toward shaping world evolution and man's place within it, solely in accordance with the ideas of natural science. To be sure, there are many people today who are of the opinion that their mental constitution and inner attitudes have not been formed by scientific ideas. Nevertheless, these people do not observe the deeper foundations of their mental attitudes. They do not know the extent to which scientific ideas have crept in a one-sided way into their minds, not only governing the way they think, but quite especially also their feelings. Anyone who reflects along the lines of the concepts generally available in ordinary educational centers, and whose mind is formed in accordance with these concepts, cannot possibly feel the right and true relationship between the moral world, the world of moral feelings, and the world of outward facts. When, in accordance with modern thinking, we reflect upon how the earth and indeed the whole firmament of heaven is supposed to have developed, and how it might come to an end, we are thinking along the lines of purely outward, sense-perceptible facts. Just think how deeply significant it is for people's souls that there is the so-called Kant-Laplace theory of the origin of the universe, even if they do not always form a clear picture of it, which states that the earth and the whole fabric of the heavens was formed in accordance with purely physical and also chemical earthly laws from a purely material cosmic mist, for it is envisaged in a purely material way, that it has been developing in accordance with these laws and will, so it is thought, come to an end which will be determined by these same laws. A state of being will eventually come about whereby this whole cosmic structure will mechanistically come to an end, in the same mechanistic way that it arose. It is true, as I have said before, there are many people who resist this modern tendency to think in this way, but this is not the point. For what really matters are not the ideas that we formulate, but the attitude of mind out of which they come. The notion to which I have just alluded is a purely materialistic one. It is the sort of idea regarding which Hermann Grimm says that a piece of carrion encircled by a hungry dog is a more appetizing sight than this picture of the world arising from the Kant Laplace theory. Nevertheless, it arose and could become established. Indeed, it not only became established, but the great majority of people who come across it find it illuminating. There are only a few people who, like Hermann Grimm, ask how future generations of scholars will account for the emergence of this crazy idea in our time, how it was possible that such a barmy notion of the origin of the world could ever have seemed illuminating to so many. There are indeed few individuals who, out of a healthy soundness of mind, ask such a question and those who do so are, at any rate in these circles, simply regarded as weird. But as I say, what really counts are not the ideas that are formulated, but the mental attitudes out of which they come. This is what really matters. These ideas derived from certain intellectual tendencies, and although they were promulgated by learned people and have been disseminated more widely, in such a way today that most people still believe that the world did not originate solely through such mechanistic impulses, but that divine impulses must also have played a part. The fact 
is that it was possible for such ideas to be formulated. That is to say, there is a fundamental tendency in people's souls to formulate ideas of a materialistic nature. And this tendency exists not only in the few scholars and other individuals who believe in such ideas, but it exists on a wide scale in all manner of people. Nevertheless, most people today are still wary of plunging courageously into becoming followers of Hackle and of conceiving of all spiritual realities purely in a material form. People do not have the courage. They think of spiritual matters as having a certain significance, but they do not think about them. If the idea that has been characterized is generally accepted, there is room for a more spiritual dimension, and especially for the moral element, only in a certain way. For just consider, if the world really did arise in the way envisaged by the Kant-Laplace theory, and if it were to come to an end through physical forces alone, and all human beings with their ideas, feelings, and will impulses were to perish with it, what, for example, would become of the whole moral dimension of the world if everything else is disregarded? Of what significance would it be that on the basis that the world as we know it had perished, we had once said that this is good, this is evil, this is right, and this is wrong? These would be nothing but ideas from a forgotten era, swept away as something which, if this theory were correct, could not live on, even as a dim memory. Then the situation would be that the world would perish through the same mechanistic causes, the same physical and possibly chemical causes, whence it arose. From these same forces, phenomena swell up like bubbles, which represent human beings. Within these human beings, moral concepts of right and wrong, good and evil, arise. Nevertheless, the whole world returns to the silence of the grave. The whole edifice of right and wrong, of good and evil, has been an illusion of human beings, and it is forgotten and vanishes without trace when the world has become a grave. End quotes. The only thing that then remains as regards the moral order is that people feel that for as long as the whole episode lasts from its initial state to its end, they need such concepts in order to live together. They have to develop moral concepts of this nature. But these moral concepts can never be rooted in a purely mechanistic world order. The forces of nature, such as heat and electricity, have their place in the context of the natural world where they also make their presence felt. Whereas moral forces, which, if the mechanistic view were true, would exist only in people's minds, would have no involvement there. They would not be like heat, which expands bodies, or light, which illuminates them and makes them visible by permeating the world of space. Indeed, these moral forces hover as a great illusion over the mechanistic world order and will vanish into oblivion when the world is transformed into a grave. People do not think these thoughts through sufficiently. Because of this, they do not resist the encroachment of a mechanistic view of the world, but instead they allow it to continue in existence, not so much out of benevolence, but out of indolence. And if they feel the need for a certain intellectual stimulation, they may say, quote, yes, our scientific knowledge does not demand that we think through the implications of such a mechanistic conception of the world, but our wish to believe demands something else from us. So we put our faith alongside our knowledge and believe in something other than a mechanistic natural world. In that, we have a certain inner soul need to believe in something. Close quote. That is a convenient way of dealing with the problem. There is no need to rebel against what Hermann Grimm, for example, feels to be a crazy idea of modern science. There is no need to stage a rebellion. But this attitude cannot be justified by someone who wants to think his thoughts through to their logical conclusion. 
If one were to ask why people live so blindly in this impossible intellectual position, and moreover put up with it, the answer is, however strange it may sound if one hears such a thought for the first time, that they have in the course of recent centuries more or less forgotten to conceive of the Christ mystery, which should be at the focal point of modern life in its true sense. For the way that people should think about the Christ mystery in modern times is that it irradiates the whole of their thinking and feeling. It really is the case, and I shall have more to say about this in the near future, that the position that man has adopted toward the Christ mystery since the mystery of Golgotha represents a standard according to which his whole world of concepts and feelings can be measured. If he is unable to conceive of the Christ mystery as a true reality, he also cannot develop any ideas and concepts relating to the rest of world existence, which are imbued with reality, which really penetrate to the truth. This is what we need to be particularly clear about. If people really do think in the way that I have described, and this is how most people today think, more or less unconsciously, the world splits into a mechanistic, natural order on the one hand, and on the other, a moral world order. Now, timid souls, who nonetheless often think themselves to be very courageous, make the Christ mystery into something that is only part of the moral world order. These are people who see nothing in the Christ mystery other than that, at a certain time, a great, perhaps even the greatest teacher of the earthly world appeared, and that it is his teaching which is of the greatest importance. However, if one regards Christ merely as even the greatest teacher of mankind, this view is in a certain sense wholly compatible with this division of the world into a natural order and a moral order. For, of course, even if the earth has been, had been formed in the way envisaged by the mechanistic world conception and were to be destroyed such that there would be nothing left of it, it would nevertheless be possible for a great teacher to appear who could indeed do much to make people more moral and to teach them. His teaching might be of a sublime nature, but this would not alter the fact that at the end of the day everything would perish and that similarly the teachings of Christ would have faded into oblivion with not even a trace in anyone's memory. The fact that one does not like to think this through does not affect the issue. If one declares one's absolute belief in a purely mechanistic world order, one really has to deal with thoughts such as these. Now everything depends on the realization that in the mystery of Golgotha something was accomplished which has to do not with the moral order alone, but with the whole world order in its entirety something that belongs not solely to moral reality, which, according to the mechanistic world conception, cannot really exist, but to the full intensity of reality as a whole. We shall arrive at the clearest possible perception of what is involved here if we turn our thoughts once more to the three meetings that I mentioned last time, though in a different sense from the way that I explained them on that occasion. I told you that whenever a person sleeps, he encounters, in the state between going to sleep and waking up, beings of the spiritual world who are of a like nature to his spirit self, as we have grown accustomed to calling it. This means that when he wakes up, he emerges from sleep in such a way that he has encountered a spiritual being, and he carries the after-effects of this meeting even though the experience remains on an unconscious level, with him into outward physical life. Now what takes place within us while we have this daily meeting also has a definite effect on our future. Someone who does not concern himself with spiritual science has little knowledge of what actually goes on in the depths of the soul when one is asleep. Dreams which, to the ordinary way of thinking, could betray certain aspects of sleep processes, 
gives some kind of an inkling of this, but in such a way that the truth cannot so easily become visible. When someone wakes up during a dream or out of one or else recalls his dreams, these dreams are mostly connected with ideas that he had already acquired in his life, with reminiscences. However, this is only the outer garment of what lives in dreams or in one's sleep life. When your dreams are clothed with ideas deriving from your life, these ideas are merely the outer garment. For in a dream, what is actually taking place in the soul during sleep is manifested in a veiled form. And what is actually going on in the soul during sleep is related neither to the past nor even to the present, but it has a relationship to the future. In sleep, the forces are formed which in a human being can be compared with the germinal forces developing in the plant for a new plant. As the plant grows, the germinal forces for the coming year are already developing in the plant for the future offspring. These germinal forces culminate in the seed formation process. This is where they become visible. But as the plant burgeons forth in this way, the germinal forces for the next plant are already there. The germinal forces within man, whether they be for the next incarnation or even for the Jupiter period, are present in this same way, and they are primarily formed during sleep. The forces that are thereby developed are not directly associated with specific events, but are related more to the basic forces of the next incarnation, among other things, but quite especially to these forces of the forthcoming incarnation. Thus in sleep a person is working on the seeds of his next incarnation in a future-oriented way. Hence, when he is asleep, he is already in the future. As I do not want to leave a vague impression in your minds about this, I should say that for the next state of sleep, the next, excuse me, I should say that for the state of sleep, the next incarnation is like our knowledge of the next day. We know simply from experiences that when tomorrow comes, the sun will rise again, and also roughly what its course will be, although we do not know what the weather will be like or what particular events will happen in our lives. So the soul is like a prophet in sleep, but a prophet who only looks upon things on a broad cosmic scale and not upon the weather. Hence anyone who were to have the idea that the soul would be able to visualize the details of the forthcoming incarnation in sleep would be making the same mistake as someone who thinks that because he knows for certain that the sun will rise and set on the following Sunday, and because he knows certain other things, he would also be able to know what the weather will be like. However, this does not alter the fact that while we are asleep, we are concerned with our future. So, the forces that we encounter during our sleep, which are essentially of a similar nature to our spirit self, work on the forming of our future. Another further meeting, if I omit the second encounter, is the third meeting, which, as I indicated in the previous lecture, occurs once in the whole course of human life and around its midpoint. When a person is in his thirties, he meets with what can, as I have called, as I have said, be called the Father Principle whereas every night he encounters the spirit principle. This meeting with the father principle, which as you know from what I have already said, also has to occur for those who die before the age of thirty. If they live through their thirties, they encounter it in the course of life, whereas in the case of a premature death, it occurs sooner, has a very great significance, because as a result of this meeting, the person concerned is enabled to have so deep an impression of the experiences of his present life 
that they are able to exert an influence upon his next incarnation. So, the meeting with the Father Principle has to do with the earthly life of the next incarnation, whereas our encounter with the Spirit Principle radiates into our entire future life and also into our life between death and a new birth. The fact is that the laws within which this meeting that we have once in our lives is interwoven are not earthly laws, but laws which within earth evolution have remained as they were during the moon evolution. These laws are on the physical side associated with our physical descent, essentially with everything signified by physical heredity. This physical heredity is only one side of the matter. As I have already amply indicated, it is underpinned by spiritual laws. Hence everything that renders the meeting with the Father Principle a necessity points back to the past. It is the legacy of the past. It points back to the moon evolution, to previous incarnations. Just as what takes place every time one goes to sleep points toward the future. Just as what takes place during sleep forms the seed for the future, the process that is enacted whereby human beings are born as the descendants of their ancestors and also carry from previous incarnations what has to be transmitted from these earlier lives is a remnant from the past. Both of these aspects, that which relates to the future and that which relates to the past, are, as it were, resting themselves free from the natural order. The farmer still goes to sleep at sunset and rises at dawn, but with the progressive advances in our so-called culture, the connection with the natural order is loosened. In cities one even meets people, perhaps not so very often, who go to sleep in the morning and get up in the evening. Man is freeing himself from the limits of the natural order. This is an inherent part of his development of freedom. Thus, because he is preparing for a future which has not yet come, he has in a certain sense separated himself from nature. Similarly, by bringing the past, and in particular the lunar past, into the present, he is breaking his connection with the natural order. No one, for example, can point to any need arising from natural laws for John Smith to be born in, say, 1914. Such an event is not governed by necessity, as is the rising of the sun or other natural events. During the moon period, everything was ordered in a similar way to our birth on earth. Nevertheless, with respect to anything that has a direct significance for the present and is directly related to his earthly existence, man is fully part of the natural order. Whereas, with respect to the Father Principle and the Spirit Principle, he bears past and future within him, with regard to that meeting of which I said that it occurs in the course of the year and is, moreover, associated with an encounter with the Christ, he is firmly linked to the natural order. If he were not connected to the natural order in this way, the consequence would be that one person would celebrate Christmas in December and another in March and so on. And yet, in spite of the fact that the various nations differ in many respects, as to how they celebrate the Christmas festival, an integral part of the festivities, which always have some bearing on the meeting to which I have been referring, falls during the last days of December. With respect to this meeting, which is fully part of the yearly cycle, man is wholly present and therefore directly associated with the order of nature. Whereas, with regard to both past and future, he has separated himself from it, as has been the case for thousands of years. In ancient times, man was fully linked to the natural order, also as regards past and future. Thus in the Germanic countries, for example, birth was in such times governed in accordance with the natural order, for birth, which was regulated by the mysteries, 
was only allowed to take place at a quite specific time of the year and belonged to a particular season. In these ancient times, long predating the Christian era, conception and birth were regulated in Germanic lands by that of which only as faint echo has been preserved in mythical form through the worship of Herta. The worship of Herta in those days consisted in that when Herta approached human beings in her chariot, this was the time for conception, and when she had withdrawn it was no longer allowed. The result of this was that anyone who was not born within a particular season was considered to be dishonorable, because as regards his human existence he was not in harmony with the natural order. This was in olden times just as much a part of the order of nature as going to sleep and waking up. People went to sleep when the sun set and woke at dawn. These things have shifted in their rhythms. But what cannot be shifted is the central question of adapting to the course of the year. Through this deed of adapting to the course of the year, something is preserved and needs to be preserved in the human soul. What then is the whole significance of man's earthly evolution? Its significance lies in that man adapts himself to the earth, that he embraces the conditions of earth evolution, and that he brings to the future of his evolution what the earth can give him. I do not mean merely in one incarnation, but throughout all his incarnations. This is the significance of earthly evolution, and it can be made a reality only if man has, in a certain sense, gradually learned on the earth to forget his connection with the cosmic and heavenly powers. This he has learned to do. We know that in olden times human beings possessed an atavistic clairvoyance through which the heavenly powers exerted an influence upon them. Man still retained his connection with the heavenly powers, and the heavenly world was able, as it were, to reach down to his inner being. This had to change in order that he might develop his freedom. In order that he might become related to the earth, there was no longer to be any trace of the kingdom of heaven in what he beheld in his direct visionary perception. It was for this reason that at the time of his closest relationship to the earth, in the fifth epoch in which we are now living, the possibility arose whereby man became materialistic. Materialism is merely the most radical, most extreme expression of man's relationship to the earth. This would, however, mean that he would be completely subjected to the earth if nothing else were to have happened. He would have had to become related to the earth and gradually share in its destiny. He would have had to follow the same path as the earth itself and become completely wedded to earthly evolution if nothing else were to have intervened. He would have to have become segregated together with the earth from the entire cosmos and unite his destiny wholly with that of the earth. However, this was not what was intended for mankind. Something other than this was planned. He was, on the one hand, to be fully united with the earth. But a message was to be imparted to him from the heavenly world of spirit, which would, in spite of the earthly affinity of his nature, raise him up above this relationship to the earth. The bringing down of this heavenly message came about through the mystery of Golgotha. Hence, on the one hand, the being who passed through the mystery of Golgotha had to take on a human nature, while on the other hand, bearing within himself the nature of a heavenly being. This means that we should not merely conceive of Christ Jesus in such a way that he develops within human evolution like anyone else, albeit on a higher level but that he develops as one who possesses a heavenly nature, someone who does not merely propagate a teaching, but who brings to the earth that which comes from heaven. 
That is why it is so important to understand what the baptism by John in the Jordan actually represents, and that it is not a moral act. I am not saying that it is not a moral act, but that is not merely one, but a real deed. And that something took place then, which is as real as events in the natural world, as real as if I warm something through some source of heat, and this heat is transferred to what is being warmed. It was in this same way that the Christ being entered into the human being, Jesus of Nazareth, at the baptism enacted by John. This is, to be sure, a highly moral act, but also a real event in the natural world, just as natural phenomena are real. The important thing is that it is understood that one is dealing not only with something deriving from rationalistic human concepts, which always merely accord with mechanistic, physical, or chemical laws, but that it is an idea which is at the same time just as much an actual reality as are the laws of nature, or indeed the forces of nature themselves. Once this has been understood, other ideas will also become much more real than they are at present. Although we are not now going to enter into a discussion about alchemy, we want to observe what the old alchemists had in mind. Whether they were justified or not, we will leave aside for now, and it could perhaps be the subject for another discussion. Which was that their ideas should not be mere abstract notions, but that something should actually result from them. Thus, when an alchemist burnt incense and had an idea or experienced it out loud, he was trying to imbue this idea with such a power that the smoke of the incense took on a certain form. He sought such ideas as have the power to take hold of the outward reality of nature not merely to remain within the egotistic aspect of man's being, but to intervene in the natural world. Why? Because he still had the idea that something occurred at the mystery of Golgotha, which intervened in the course of natural events, and which is just as much a fact as a natural process is a fact of nature. In this respect there is a significant difference which entered in during the second half of the Middle Ages and toward modern times, toward our fifth epoch, which followed the Greco-Roman age. During the time of the Crusades, in the 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries, and even in the 16th century, there were some people, especially women, whose minds had such a mystical quality that the inner experience which their mysticism brought them was for them like a spiritual marriage, whether with Christ or with another being. Being ascetic nuns celebrated mystical marriages, excuse me, many ascetic nuns celebrated mystical marriages, for example. I shall not enter today into the nature of these intimate mystic unions, but something took place within their inner being which could only be expressed in words, which lived within the ideas, feelings, and also the words in which the feelings were clothed. Valentin Andrea wrote his chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, which was derived from certain specific ideas and spiritual scientific associations, as a contrast to this. The chemical wedding, as or, as we would say today, chemical wedding, is also a human experience. However, when you read this chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, you will see that it is not only about an inner soul experience, but has to do with something that encompasses the whole of man's being, and is not really expressed in words. Something that does not simply live in the world as an inner soul experience, but rather as a real occurrence, a natural event where a person accomplishes something that is like an event in the natural world. Thus Valentine Andrea's intention in his chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz is to present something that is more permeated with reality 
than the purely mystical marriage of, for example, Mechthild von Magdeburg, who was a mystic. Through the mystical marriage of the nuns, something was done merely for a person's subjective nature. Whereas, through the chemical wedding, the human individual gave himself to the world. Something was being accomplished through him for the whole world, through processes in nature. This is, moreover, to be thought of in a truly Christian sense. People who thought in a more real way, even if only in the one-sided sense of the old alchemists, wanted ideas through which they would be able to deal with reality in the right way and really take hold of it. Ideas that actually have something to do with reality. The age of materialism has initially cast a veil over ideas of this nature. And whereas people today believe that they think with absolute precision about reality, they live far more in illusions than, for example, the old alchemists whom they so much despise and who sought ideas through which reality can be mastered. What, after all, can people do with the ideas they formulate today? We are experiencing, especially in our time, that these ideas lead them to illusions, to the empty husks of ideas, to the idols that they chase after today and which have nothing to do with reality. For reality is reached only by plunging down into it and not by forming all manner of ideas about it. It is, after all, possible to distinguish between ideas that are imbued with reality and those that are unreal in the most ordinary everyday occurrences. Most people, however, cannot manage this. They are so completely satisfied with the mere shadows of ideas which are altogether lacking in reality. Imagine, for instance, that someone today gets up and makes a speech in which he says, A new age must come and is already approaching when a person will be measured only according to his own worth when everyone will be valued for what he can do. Close quote. Anyone would say that that is something arising from the deepest understanding of our time. But for as long as the ideas remain mere husks, however fine the sentiments may be, they do not live in the real world. For it is of little significance that someone should advocate the principle that people should be given the jobs appropriate to their capacities if he is convinced, in hindsight, that his own nephew is the person best fitted for the task. What really matters is not the ideas and conceptions that one cherishes, but that one is able to participate with one's ideas in reality and get to know it. It is all very well and also a great delight to have principles and ideas and it is often an even greater delight to express them. But what is needed is that we really enter into reality, understand it, and penetrate it. We are plunging ever more deeply into what has brought about the infinite sorrow of the time in which we are living, if we continue to worship the idols of the husks and shadows of ideas. If we do not learn to see that it is not of the slightest value to have and express beautiful ideas and fine concepts if this is not connected with the will to plunge down into reality and get to know it. If we indeed immerse ourselves in reality, we find there there not only material substance, but we also find the spirit. It is the worshipping of the idols of mere shadows and husks of ideas that leads us away from the spirit. Moreover, it is the great misfortune of our time that people are intoxicated with fine words. This is at the same time also unchristian, for the fundamental principle of Christianity is that Christ did not only impart teachings to Jesus of Nazareth, but entered fully into him. That is to say, he united himself with earthly reality in such a way that he entered fully into this earthly reality and thereby became the living message from the cosmos. 
the book which, if it is read properly, is the best possible educational tool for reality is the New Testament. However, it needs to be put little by little into our own language. The existing translations do not fully convey the original meaning. But if the real meaning is expressed in everyday language, the Gospels will then be the best means of evoking a thinking that is imbued with reality, since in their every line they lack the kind of thought forms that lead to shadowy ideas that are devoid of any real content. What is necessary today is to grasp things in their deeper reality. It might sound almost trivial to speak of being intoxicated with ideas, but this state is so widely prevalent today that it is not so much concepts and ideas, however fine they may sound, that are important, but that the person who utters them should be grounded in reality. People find this infinitely difficult to understand today. Virtually everything that appears in the public arena is judged purely on its content, on its conceptual content. If this were not so, one would never have considered documents which are totally devoid of ideas, such as, for example, the peace program of Professor, or should I say, President Wilson, which is a vacuous conglomeration of conceptual shadows as having any bearing on reality. Anyone who has any sense of discernment for murky ideas could well know from this assembly of mere conceptual shadows that it could function at best as an absurdity, which might then represent a certain kind of reality. What is really needed today is to search for ideas and concepts that are imbued with reality. This presupposes, however, that people can be deeply related to reality, that they are sufficiently selfless to unite themselves with what lives and weaves in reality. And there is much to be observed in our present age that leads people completely away from this quest for reality, although these things are not noticed. Many lamentable things are going on now, as anyone with any awareness can see. For example, it is possible at present for people to be impressed simply through the way that words are put together by a number of speeches, which have even been printed, which for someone who goes not by words but by realities are absolutely appalling. Speeches are being given by a highly respected person of our time, who in one of his first speeches proposes the view that with respect to the one side of his nature, man belongs absolutely to the natural order, and theologians are not behaving as they should if they do not leave the natural order to the scientists. Then the speaker goes on to say that with respect to the natural order, man is purely a mechanism. But the functions of the soul also depend on this mechanism and what he specif- specifies these fu- and what he specifies these functions to be are essentially all the functions that the soul possesses theology is then left with the consolation that although everything has been ceded to science we can nevertheless still give talks but these talks are littered with empty phrases and they are full of discontinuities I shall return to this aspect in the coming lectures and look at it in greater detail. Such that if one studies a thought in conjunction with the previous thought with which it is supposed to be associated, there is no real connection between them. Nevertheless, the whole talk sounds absolutely fine. In the preface to these lectures about, quote, the molding of life, close quote, it is stated that these lectures were given recently before thousands of people and that many more thousands will, without doubt, feel the need to find comfort in these lectures at this serious time. These lectures were given by the famous theologian Hunzinger and appeared in the Quelle and Meyer series on titled Science and Culture and are highly dangerous material because although they read well and have something quite enchanting about them, one's thoughts become utterly confused. The ideas have, 
no connection with one another. And once one has probed what lies beneath the fascinating words, the whole thing is revealed as being absolute nonsense. In a future lecture I shall say more in detail about the confused nature of these thoughts. Nevertheless, these lectures have been praised very widely, and no one paused to examine the thought forms, but instead everyone dwelt only on the word shadows. It is indeed the case that what manifests itself outwardly is wholly a reflection of what man develops inwardly. If he develops concepts that are alien to reality, reality itself becomes confused, and then conditions arise such as we have now. It is no longer possible to judge things by what one encounters by way of outward conditions. Rather, must one form one's judgments by studying what has often been developing in human minds, not merely for years but decades and perhaps for considerably longer. It is there that the cause lies, and it is there that one needs to look. Everything depends on Christ being accepted not merely for his teachings, for it is essential that the mystery of Golgotha is perceived in its true reality, and that there is the clear awareness that something of a super-earthly nature was united with the earthly realm through the person of Jesus of Nazareth. For the awareness will then dawn that morality itself will not fade into oblivion when the earth and even the fabric of the heavens perish, just as a plant becomes dust, and that, just as in a plant there lies hidden the seed for a future plant, so in the present world does the seed for the next world lie concealed, and human beings are connected with this seed. However, this seed needs the connection with Christ, so that it does not, in the same way that the seed of a plant that has not been fertilized, dies together with the plant, perish with the earth. That the moral world order in the present is the germinal force of a future order of nature is the most real idea that there can possibly be. Morality is not merely something that has been thought out, And if it is imbued with reality, it lives now as a seed for later outward realities. A world conception, such as that of the Kant-Laplace theory, of which Hermann Grimm said that the spectacle of a hungry dog prowling around a piece of carrion would be a more appetizing sight, is not an idea of this kind. The mechanistic view of the world can never arrive at this thought that morality in its essence has the power to become a phenomenon of nature, that it is the seed of a future natural order. And why not? Because it is essentially an illusion. For if you were to imagine that the mystery of Golgotha had not taken place, the situation would be as the Kant-Laplace theory describes. You simply need to think away the mystery of Golgotha from the earth and this theory would be correct. The earth had to reach a condition which would, if left to itself, inevitably lead to human existence ending in the desolation of the grave. Because at the critical moment the earth was fructified by Christ, because Christ, who represents the opposite power to that which leads to the grave, a power that is of a germinal quality, descended to bear man up into the spiritual world. This means that when the earth becomes a grave, when it fulfills its destiny in accordance with the Kant-Laplace theory, the seed that resides within it is not subject to destruction, but is carried over into the future. Thus the Christ-inspired moral world order presupposes what Goethe calls the quote, higher nature in nature. And one can say that anyone who can conceive of the mystery of Golgotha as a reality in the right way is also able to think in a real way and form concepts and ideas that are imbued with reality. This, however, is necessary. And it is also what human beings must learn before all else. 
For people have wanted to incorporate into this fifth post-Atlantean age either ideas which intoxicate them or ideas which make them blind. Ideas of the intoxicating kind mostly derive from religious spheres. Those which cause blindness largely arise in the scientific domain. A conception which, while acknowledging the validity of the purely natural order, has only the moral element in view, such as that of Kant, who places these two worlds of knowledge and faith alongside one another, must result in intoxication. Ideas of this nature, which are developed on a moral foundation, are able to intoxicate. And because of the intoxication, one does not see that one has actually involuntarily succumbed to the stillness of the grave, where all trace of a moral order fades and vanishes away. Alternatively, ideas can make people blind, as do those of modern science and economics, and something that it is especially hard to come to terms with, the political ideas of our present age. These ideas make people blind if they are not formulated in connection with a world that is understood from a spiritual standpoint, but only from the shreds of the so-called real, that is the outwardly sense-perceptible world. The result is that everyone only sees as far as the end of his nose and blindly forms opinions about what he can see with his eyes and grasp with the concepts that he has acquired without the benefit of having formed ideas, which through being permeated by the spiritual dimension, by an understanding of spiritual realities, are indeed imbued with reality. It is important to re-emphasize what is so absolutely necessary for our time. For an historical perspective is often limited now to mere conceptual shadows. A great deal is proclaimed today about what Fichte has said to the German people. However, one only understands what Fichte said if one surveys Fichte's entire life, a life that is so deeply rooted in reality. In my book titled The Riddle of Man, I have tried to portray Fichte's life in its entire development, showing how closely linked he was with reality from his childhood onward. It would be really good if statements such as these about ideas being imbued with realities were not only heard in a superficial way, but were received on a deeply intimate level, and I really mean deeply intimate. Only in this way will one acquire a free and open perception, an inner soul perception of what our age so urgently needs. Everyone needs such a free, open, inner perception of this. Anyone who has not made a particular point of pondering the facts that have been touched upon here is far too little aware that in our time the ideas and words that we exchange are but shadows and empty husks and that everything has a tendency to lead people in the direction of ideas and concepts that either intoxicate them or make them blind. Do not take anything that I have been saying today as the words of some sort of fanatic, but rather as express, expressing an actual reality. We all have to live with our times, at any rate we should. And when something is being spoken about, one ought not to regard it as implying that absolutely everything should be done away with. Nevertheless, some sort of balance needs to be established. It is quite natural that everyone is being confronted with impulses leading entirely toward materialism. There is nothing that we can do about this, for the drive toward materialism is connected with the deep needs of our time. All the same, a balance must be created. I have to say that everything is geared toward leading man firmly in the direction of materialism. This cannot be prevented. It is part of the nature of the fifth post-Atlantean epoch. But there needs to be some kind of balance, a particularly powerful means of driving people toward materialism is something that has hardly been viewed from this angle at all, the cinematograph. For what one perceives in films is not reality as it, actu as it is actually seen. 
only an age that has so little idea of reality as ours, which worships reality as an idol in the materialistic sense, could believe that the cinematograph represents reality. A different age would consider whether people walk along the street as they do in films, whether, if one were to ask oneself what one has seen, the images that one sees really correspond to reality. Ask yourselves, very honestly, is what you have seen on the street closer to a picture painted by an artist which does not move, or to the ghastly, flickering images of the cinematograph? If you are really honest, you will say to yourself, what the painter portrays in a state of rest has a much stronger resemblance to what you yourself see on the street. So when people are sitting in the cinema, what they see there comes to reside within them, not through their ordinary faculties of perception, but at a deeper material level than is normal for the process of perception. A person becomes etherically goggle-eyed, His eyes begin to look like those of a seal, only much bigger, when he watches lots of films. I mean etherically bigger. This has an effect not only on what lives in his conscious mind, but it has a materializing influence on his subconsciousness. Do not interpret this as a denunciation of the cinematograph. I should like to make it quite clear that it is perfectly natural that there should be cinematographs, and the art of cinematography or filmmaking will be developed to an ever-increasing degree. This will be the road leading to materialism. But a counterbalance needs to be sought. This can happen only if the addiction for the kind of reality that is being developed through films is connected with something else. Just as with this addiction, there develops a tendency to descend below perception by way of the senses. So must there develop an ascent above sensory perception, that is, into spiritual reality. Then it will do no harm to go to the cinema, and one can see such images as often as one wishes. But if no counterbalance is created, people will be led through such things to relate to the earth not in the way that is necessary, but to become more and more closely related to it, to the point where they are completely cut off from the spiritual world. The end of Lecture 4 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, steinerbooks.org in America and rudolfsteinerpress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of uh, Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of the Collected Works, Volume 17 Lectures, number 175, by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Building Stones for an Understanding of the Mystery of Golgotha, Human Life in a Cosmic Context. This is uh, translated by Simon Blacksland DeLang, and this is Lecture 5, given in Berlin on the 6th of March, 1917. I have spoken to you about the three meetings that feature in the human soul's biography in the course of its life between birth and death, and which bring it in the course of this life into connection with the spiritual worlds. We shall, today, return to this subject, which on the previous occasion we touched upon in a preparatory way in the form of an interpolation in somewhat greater detail. I pointed out that during the time between going to sleep and waking up, we experience a meeting, which usually takes place in the middle of the period of sleep. I say usually because the state of sleep is normally equivalent to the night. Thus, Between going to sleep and waking up, we generally have an encounter with that world to which our spirit self is related, the world in which we place the beings from that hierarchy whom we refer to as the angels. So every time we pass through a period of sleep, we traverse that world where these beings dwell, a world 
which lies immediately above our physical world, and we refresh and strengthen our whole spiritual being through this meeting. Because this is so, because during sleep man is related to the spiritual world, a purely materialistic explanation, such as is attempted by ordinary science, can never provide a satisfactory interpretation. Much of what goes on within man can be explained from the changes that the body undergoes from waking up until going to sleep. And the attempt may be made to explain sleep from these changes. And yet there will always be something unsatisfactory about this, because sleep has to do with the meeting referred to, and hence with a person's relationship to the spiritual world. Thus it is precisely when we consider the state of sleep that we can see that where a person does not consciously seek a relationship to the spiritual world, he arrives at half-truths, which some ideas, excuse me, which since ideas become deeds, bring a disturbing element to life, and also eventually, in a very real way, bring about great catastrophes in life. Half-truths. These are in some respects even worse than ideas that are completely erroneous because people who formulate half-truths are very insistent about them, for they are able to prove them on the grounds that if they are even half-true, they can be proved. Moreover, they cannot be refuted, since the ideas are, after all, partly true. Such ideas distort life even more than completely erroneous ones, for their falsehood can be immediately discerned and recognized. One such half-truth, which has to some extent been abandoned by science today but continues to have a considerable degree of support, is an idea that I have often alluded to before, that we sleep because we are tired. It is, we may indeed say, a half-truth. And it is supported by a half-true observation to which people appeal, namely, that the life of the day tires the body and so one needs to sleep because one is tired. I have often drawn your attention in previous lectures to the fact that this interpretation of sleep can never explain why people with a private income, who have never done a stroke of work, often fall asleep at once when they hear stimulating discussions about events in the world around them. There is certainly no way of proving that they are tired, and that they have had to go to sleep because they have been slaving away is quite simply an, an, er, an erroneous or half-true observation. If we believe that we are compelled to go to sleep because we are tired, we are only half observing. We only see the limitations of our observation when we compare what we are observing from the one side with what can be observed from the other side thus coming in contact with the other side of the truth. You will see presently what I mean. Going to sleep and waking up is a process of constant rhythmic alternation in an individual human life. However, man is a being who possesses freedom and who can therefore interfere with this rhythm more through circumstances than through anything that could be construed as free will but such circumstances are the foundation of freedom. He can intervene in the course of events and is sometimes only all too glad to do so in the context of the rhythm of going to sleep and waking up. Another rhythm, which we have often combined with that of sleeping and waking, even though in ordinary consciousness they are not linked together in the right way, is the one that manifests itself in the course of the year, the alternation of summer and winter, if we leave the intermediate seasons out of account. It will not occur to anyone to say that during the summer the earth is making great efforts and is developing those forces which lead to the growth of plants and to much else besides, and that it then becomes tired and needs to have a rest in winter. 
every one would find such an idea to be absurd and will say that the coming of winter has absolutely nothing to do with the efforts of the earth in summer but is caused by the sun being in a different spatial relationship to the region of the earth where winter makes its appearance. In the latter case, everything is being derived from outside, while with sleeping and waking it is all a question of tiredness, which derives from within. Now the one is just as incorrect as the other. Or one could also say it is just as half true as the other. The rhythm of sleeping and waking is the same kind of rhythm as that between winter and summer. It is no more true to say that we go to sleep only because we are tired than it is true that winter arrives because the earth has worn itself out during the summer. For both these events arise through the independent influence of a rhythm which is brought about by certain circumstances. The rhythm of sleeping and waking is governed by the need of the human soul to bring about the meeting with the spiritual world. If we were to say that we want to go to sleep and therefore feel tired, or if we were to say that we are entering a stage when we are in need of one part of the rhythm, the state of sleep, and therefore feel tired, we would be saying something more correct than to say that we must go to sleep because we are tired. Things become even clearer if we simply ask what the soul actually does when it is asleep. The unspiritual science of the present day does not have the right understanding or even any real possibility to answer such a question. When we are awake, we enjoy the outer world for enjoyment accompanies us throughout our life. We do not merely enjoy the outer world when we experience a good meal by way of our palate, in which case the word enjoy has a quite particular connotation, but we enjoy the outer world throughout the time that we are awake, and the whole of life is at the same time enjoyment. Although there is much in the world that is unpleasant, and which is apparently not enjoyment at all, this is only an illusion. And we shall speak of this in a different context in the forthcoming lectures. When we are awake, we enjoy the outer world. When we are asleep, we, quite literally, enjoy our own selves. Just as we enjoy the outer world through our body, when our soul is dwelling in our body, so do we enjoy our own body when our soul is outside the body. For during the life between birth and death, we are connected with the body, even when, as souls, we are outside it. The essential point about the state of sleep, of ordinary, normal sleep, is that we are deeply immersed in our body, that we enjoy our body. We enjoy our body from outside. And dreams, ordinary chaotic dreams, are rightly interpreted if one says that they are the reflection of that bodily enjoyment which a person has in dreamless sleep. This explanation of sleep comes closer to the need for sleep that I spoke about in the case of the person with private means. For whereas it is not easy to believe that he is tired, we will have no difficulty in believing that he is so fond of his body that he would rather enjoy that than what often comes toward him from the outside world. He takes such endless pleasure in it and enjoys himself so much that he greatly prefers this than, say, a lecture that he listens to, perhaps out of a certain sense of shame or a difficult piece of serious music where he goes to sleep immediately if he has to listen to it. Sleep is self-enjoyment. However, as in sleep, in normal sleep, we have the encounter with the spiritual world. Sleep ceases to be mere self-enjoyment and becomes also a means of acquiring understanding of oneself to a certain degree, a process of self-discovery. In this respect, our spiritual training is really needed in order that people may come to understand that in normal sleep, they do indeed become immersed in the spiritual domain and re-emerge from it when they wake up again 
and that they learn to approach this meeting with the Spirit with reverence. Now, in order that we are fully presented with the facts, I should like to return once more to the so-called enigma of fatigue. For anyone looking from a superficial standpoint might very well pick up on this point. Such a person may say that we really do experience feeling tired and the need for sleep arises from this sense of tiredness. This is a point where a really clear distinction needs to be made. We do indeed become tired as a result of the day's work and while we sleep we are able to get over our fatigue. So this aspect of the matter is true. We are able to get rid of our tiredness through sleep. But sleep is not in any sense the result of tiredness, but consists in a person's enjoyment of himself. And through this self-enjoyment, he acquires the forces through which he drives away the tiredness that has arisen. Thus, to this extent, it is true to say that sleep can enable us to get over our fatigue. However, it does not follow that all sleep can do so. For whereas it is true that all sleep is self-enjoyment, it is not the case that all sleep drives away tiredness. For a person who sleeps unnecessarily, who goes to sleep at every opportunity, is really able to manage to go to sleep when there is no tiredness to be driven away, when nothing but self-enjoyment is involved. It is, of course, true that because one is accustomed through one's normal life to get over tiredness through sleep, one will, through a sleep of this nature, also constantly be making efforts to drive away one's sense of fatigue. But if there is no actual tiredness, as is the case with a person with a private income who goes to sleep in the concert, one will simply be busying oneself with one's body in the way that one would do if one were actually tired. As, however, there is no tiredness involved in this case, the person concerned will be busying himself unnecessarily, with the consequence that he incubates all sorts of ancillary conditions in the body. That is why these well-to-do people who sleep so much are tormented to such an extreme degree by all manner of conditions known collectively as neurasthenia. Through one's connection with spiritual knowledge, it is possible to imagine a situation where one is conscious of living in a rhythm, where one is alternately in the physical world and in the spiritual world. In the physical world, one has encounters with outer physical nature. In the spiritual world, one meets with the beings who live in that world. We shall be able to understand this more fully if we study the entirety of man's being from a certain point of view. As you know, the science of biology normally views man as a unity, roughly dividing him into the head, chest region, and lower abdomen, with the various limb appendages. In those ancient times, when there was still an atavistic knowledge, people associated such idea, associated other ideas with this division of man's being. The great Plato, the Greek philosopher, attributes wisdom to the head, courage, to the chest region, and the lower impulses of human nature to the lower abdomen. Moreover, what belongs to the chest region can be ennobled if wisdom is united with the courage that is linked to the chest region, thus becoming wisdom-filled courage, wisdom-filled activity. And if what may be regarded as man's lower part and is associated with the lower abdomen is irradiated with wisdom, Plato calls this prudence or circumspection or quite literally a state of being clothed with the sun, S-U-N. Thus we see how the soul is divided and related to the various parts of the body. With the benefit of spiritual science, which was not yet, which was not as yet, accessible to Plato in the same way, we can speak about these things in much fuller detail. As we are speaking about the whole of man's being, we will now, starting from the highest of his four members, speak about his ego. Everything that man calls his own in a soul-spiritual sense works in his physical life 
between birth and death through the instrument of his physical body. With respect to each member of man's being, we can ask through which parts of the physical organism does the member in question work. What manifests itself to us through really thorough spiritual observation is that what we call the human ego is between birth and death, however strange it may seem, but the truth is usually very different from the way that a superficial awareness might imagine it to be, connected physically with what we call the lower abdomen. For the ego is, as I have often said, the baby of human nature. The physical body had its origins in the era of old Saturn, the ether body, and that of old Sun, the astral body, during the old moon period, and the ego during that of the earth. It is the youngest of the members of man's being. Only in the future period of Vulcan will it be at the stage where the physical body is now, during the earthly era. The ego is linked to the lowest part of man's physicality, and this lowest aspect is actually in a state of constant sleep. It is not organized in such a way that what takes place within it can be brought to consciousness. What is enacted in this lower region is in ordinary waking consciousness governed by sleep. We are just as little conscious of our ego as such in its true nature, its real essence, as we are of the processes of our digestion. The ego of which we are conscious is the image of what is reflected by way of our head. We do not ever really perceive our ego, neither in sleep, where we are normally completely unconscious, nor when we are awake, for the ego is then also asleep. The true ego does not come to consciousness. All that does so is the idea, the concept of the ego, which is reflected there. On the other hand, during the time between going to sleep and waking up, the ego really comes into its own, though someone who is in a normal state of deep sleep knows nothing of this, because he is still unconscious in this deep sleep during the earth era. So, the ego is, to all intents and purposes, connected with the lowest part of man's bodily organism. During the day, and for the duration of waking consciousness from within and during sleep from without. If we now move on to the second member of human nature, to what we call the astral body, we find that as regards the instrument through which it works, the astral body is, from a certain point of view, connected with the chest region of man's being. In actual fact, we can really only dream about what goes on in the astral body and comes to expression through the region of the chest. Insofar as we are earthly human beings, we can perceive something of the ego only when we are asleep. That is to say, we cannot perceive anything consciously, whereas we can dream of what the astral body brings about within us. That is why we continually dream about our feelings, about the sentiments that dwell within us. Indeed, they lead a sort of dream life within us. Thus the ego is outside the region that we human beings encompass with our ordinary sensory consciousness, for it is continuously asleep. The astral body is also still, in a certain respect, outside what we encompass with our sensory consciousness, for it can only dream. With respect to both of these, we are in reality in the spiritual world, irrespective of whether we are awake or asleep. What we call the ether body is, however, with regard to its physical aspect, connected with the head. Through the particular organization of the head, the ether body is able to remain constantly awake when it is within the human body, when it is connected with the physical aspect of the head. Thus we can say, the ego is connected with the lowest parts of our body and the astral body with our chest region, the heart, the functioning of which lies outside our full consciousness, we have only a dream consciousness of it, beats and pulsates under the influence of the astral body. When the head thinks, 
it does so under the influence of the ether body. We can then, in addition, differentiate the physical body as a whole, where everything comes together, for its connection is with the entirety of the outside world. You can now see a remarkable set of relationships. The ego is connected with the lower parts of the body, the astral body with the heart region, the ether body with the head, and the physical body with the whole of the outside world, with the world around us. The physical body as a whole also has a relationship in waking consciousness with the surrounding outer world. In the same way that with our whole body we have a relationship with the external environment, so does our ether body have a connection with our head, our astral body with the heart, and so on. From this you can see how truly mysterious are the connections linking man with the world. These relationships are indeed virtually the opposite of what a superficial understanding of these matters might suppose. The lowest parts of human nature are at present the aspects of man's being which are as yet imperfect, and this is why they correspond, as parts of the body, to what we have referred to as the baby of our being, the ego. Infinite mysteries of human life lie hidden in what I have been saying to you. If you enter fully into all of this, you will, above all else, understand how the whole of man's being has been formed from the spirit, though at different stages. The human head is formed from the spirit, but its formation has been taken further. It belongs to a later stage of formation than does the chest, of which we might say that it is just as much a metamorphosis of the head as, in the sense of Goethe's theory of metamorphosis, the leaf is a metamorphosis of the flower. If we consider the rhythm between sleeping and waking, from this point of view, we may say that during our waking life, the ego actually dwells in all the lowest activities in the human body, which finally culminate in the formation of blood. The ego is present in these activities during the waking state. These are those activities of the body which are in a certain sense at the lowest level of spirituality. For everything to do with the body is also spiritual, even though what we are speaking about now is at the lowest spiritual level. However, through the fact that during waking consciousness the ego is at the lowest level of spirituality, during sleep, and it is important to note this, it is with respect to man's being at the highest level of spirituality. 4. Consider the following. When we observe the head, and the way that we as human beings bear it on our shoulders, it is, as regards its outer form, the most fully a manifestation of the spirit. It is to the fullest degree a reflection, a revelation of the spirit. The spirit has, in the head, entered most deeply into matter. For that very reason it has left the least behind in the spirit world itself. Man has expended so much effort on making the outer form of the head a revelation of the spirit that little has been left behind in the spiritual domain. Whereas, because what is outwardly manifested in the lower parts of man's physical organism is the least spiritualized, far more of what is related to these lower parts has been left behind in the world of spirit. The head as head, has to the smallest degree a spiritual counterpart, because it has the most spirit within it. The lower abdomen has the greatest spiritual counterpart, because it has the least spirit within it. And in this greater abundance of spirit, which does not reside in the bodily organism, there dwells the ego during the hours of sleep. Just consider this wonderful balancing process. Whereas man has a lower nature with respect to his physicality and the ego immerses itself in this lower nature at the moment of waking, 
This lower nature is only a lower nature because the spirit has worked least upon it, because the spirit has kept so much behind in the spiritual domain. And yet, during sleep, the ego is present in what has been kept back. Thus, during sleep, the ego is already now together with what man will develop and unfold only in the future. For it is at present only barely indicated and very little developed in man's bodily organism. Thus, when the ego becomes conscious of the situation in which it dwells during sleep, when it really becomes conscious of this situation, it may say to itself, quote, During sleep I am in the holiest situation that I can be in as a human being. And as I emerge from sleep, when I wake up, I am going from the world of my holiest situation to what is today only a feeble indication of it. Close quote. Yes, it is important that through spiritual science such things can really begin to live in our feelings, in our inner thoughts. Our lives will then themselves be imbued with a magical breath of holiness. We will then be able to associate a definite and positive idea or concept with what is called the grace of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. We will then connect this totality of human experience which takes its course in the rhythm between sleeping and waking, with the idea, quote, you may participate in the spiritual world, you may dwell in it, close quote. When we have really taken this idea into our feeling life, quote, you may be in the spiritual world, you will receive the grace of being imbued with the spiritual world, which is inaccessible to you through your ordinary consciousness, close quote. When we have really lived with this thought, we have also learned to look up to the Spirit who is revealed to us, I might say, through every detail of life. And indeed, just as much as outer nature manifests itself to our outward eyes and ears. But the age of materialism has separated man from the consciousness of being irradiated and permeated in the totality of his existence by the grace of the Spirit. It is of immense importance that this is overcome. For in the depths of our souls we are more aware in our time of the prevailing materialism of our age than one might think. Nevertheless, the human soul is in our present age generally far too weak to bring these ideas which can lead beyond materialism to an inner awareness. One such idea is that of the holiness of sleep. For once we have understood this idea of the holiness of sleep, we ascribe all the thoughts and ideas in our waking state that do not bind us to matter, to the influence of the spirit which follows during sleep. We would then be seeing what is important for us as human beings, not only in our waking state, which connects us with matter, which would be like considering that only winter is of any importance for the earth, but we would be seeing everything as a whole. For the earth we see the whole if we consider winter together with summer, and we see the whole for man if we consider the daytime, that is, the connection with matter, together with sleep, that is, the connection with the spirit. Now a superficial observation might say, quote, So when someone is awake, he is connected with matter and can therefore know something of the spirit even when awake? Of course, man has a memory, and this memory functions not only in his consciousness, but also in his subconscious mind. If we had no memory, no amount of sleep could help us. This is very important, and I want you to keep it firmly in mind. If this were so, no amount of sleep could help us. For if we had no memory, we would be led inevitably to the firm belief that there is nothing but material existence. It is only because we preserve in our subconscious mind a memory of what we experience during sleep, even though we have no knowledge of this on the surface of our consciousness, that we think in a way that is not purely materialistic. If people do not only think materialistically, If they have spiritual ideas of any sort 
during the day, it is because they have a memory. For man is now constituted as an earthly human being in such a way that he comes in contact with the spirit only while he is asleep. The point at issue here is that if on the other hand we were to develop so strong a consciousness of what takes place within us during sleep, of the nature that under certain circumstances people in former times were able to develop, it would never occur to us to doubt the spirit, and we would, in contrast, remember what we encountered in our sleep, not only subconsciously, but also in a conscious way. If someone has had a conscious experience of what he lives through during sleep, it would be just as absurd to deny the spirit as it would be absurd for someone to deny the existence of tables and chairs while he is awake. The crucial point is that humanity should once more really come to appreciate the meeting with the spirit during sleep. This can only happen if the ideas and concepts developed during the day have sufficient force to make this possible. And this can be achieved by entering deeply into spiritual science. In spiritual science, we are working with ideas that are derived from the spiritual world. We discipline our head, that is to say the ether body in our head, to conceive of things that do not have anything to do with outward materiality and which have reality only in the world of spirit. A greater effort is needed for this than for forming mental pictures of things which have their reality in the material world. This is the real reason why people do not involve themselves with spiritual science. They come up with all sorts of reasons against it. They say that it is not logical. If they were urged to prove its illogicality, they would run into difficulties, for it cannot be proved that spiritual science is illogical. But the rejection of spiritual science, the refusal to acknowledge it, derives from something altogether different, namely that I'm not sure whether one may also be somewhat impolite in a scientific debate from sheer laziness. And although certain learned people are ever so industrious when it comes to all the ideas that relate to outward, material things, with regard to the energy that one needs to apply in order to understand things of a spiritual nature, they are idle and lazy. And it is because they do not want to call forth in themselves the necessary energy that they do not acknowledge spiritual science. For it simply requires more effort to think spiritual scientific thoughts than to formulate ordinary ideas associated with material realities. Ideas of the latter nature arise out of themselves whereas ideas that are not bound to the material world must be thought. One has to gather up one's forces and really make an effort. This reluctance to apply oneself is the reason for the rejection of spiritual science, and one has to realize this. But when the effort is made to assimilate such ideas and to think them through, one's soul enters into such a state of inner activity that it will gradually begin to develop a consciousness of what goes on between going to sleep and waking up and of the meeting with the spirit that takes place then. A certain amount of unlearning of some ideas will surely be necessary. Just think to what a small degree many spiritual leaders today have the capacity to develop such ideas. Although the following scenario is less pronounced than it used to be, those who have now become leaders were for the large part of their apprenticeship, or what one might call their student days, so deeply immersed in the life of their day that they learned to drink themselves into a stupor. Well, an idea and a whole wealth of feelings as to what goes on during sleep that such a person may develop are certainly not an appropriate way of clarifying the whole significance of sleep. One may be very learned as regards everything that is associated with matter, but it is naturally not possible for such a person to gain an insight 
into what one experiences between going to sleep and waking up. When people make the effort to think through ideas that are not connected with material substance, they develop an understanding of what I have called the first meeting, the meeting with the spirit during sleep. However, if the world is not to fall into decadence, it will be important for this understanding to shine into our lives with a sun-like radiance in the not-too-distant future. For if people do not take up these ideas, how will they be able to arrive at ideas of any kind? The only way they will be able to do this is by observing the outer world. However, ideas that are arrived at in this way, alone, leave the inner aspect of man's being, his soul, in a state of inertia. And what needs to exert itself through spiritual ideas is left inert, is unused and unfulfilled and becomes degenerate. What is the consequence of this? The result is that people become blind to their whole relationship to the world, spiritually blind. By developing ideas and concepts under the influence of outer circumstances and impressions, they become spiritually blind and spiritual blindness is the defining characteristic of the materialistic age. In science this is only damaging up to a point, but in practical life this blindness with regard to the real world is extremely harmful. You see, the further we descend into matter, the more things correct themselves in this materialistic age. If a bridge is being built, the people building it will be forced by the circumstances involved to adhere to the proper rules of construction. Otherwise, when the first vehicle crosses it, the bridge will collapse. It is more possible to apply erroneous ideas in the realm of medical care, for the reason that a person dies or is made well can never be proved. But it is by no means necessarily the case that the ideas acted upon were the right ones. However, in the world of ideas as such, and where one is active in the cultural domain, matters are far more serious. That is why things are looking really serious in what one generally calls the practical sciences, such as economics and politics. In the materialistic age, people have become used to being guided with respect to economics by ideas and impressions coming from the outer world, and as a result their ideas have become blind. Everything that is developed in the realm of economics consists for the most part of intellectually blind ideas. The inevitable consequence of this is that people who have these blind notions in their heads are carried along by events as though in leading reins. They allow events to take hold of them. And when in this state they become involved in them, the result is hardly surprising. This is the result of one of the ways in which one arrives at ideas without taking up spiritual science, namely that one's ideas are blind. The other approach to ideas is that, instead of being guided by outer circumstances, one's ideas are stimulated from within, which is to say that only what lives in one's emotions and passions is allowed to germinate in one's soul. This gives rise to ideas that are far from being blind, but are, one might say, of an intoxicating nature. And so people of the present day, who believe in materialism, are forever swinging to and fro between blind ideas and intoxicating ideas, blind ideas where they, in effect, let themselves be bossed around by what is going on, so that when they become involved they do so in the clumsiest way possible intoxicating ideas where they give themselves over solely to emotions and passions and relate to the world in such a way that they do not really understand anything but either love or hate everything, passing judgments in accordance with their love or hatred, their sympathy or antipathy. This is especially so in this materialistic age. For it is only by, on the one hand, 
making inner efforts to formulate spiritual ideas and on the other hand developing one's feelings for the wider concerns of the world that a person arrives at ideas and conceptions that shed any light on anything. If we are able to embrace what spiritual science has to say to us regarding the wider connections with the ages of Saturn, Sun and Moon and our connection with the universe which are ridiculed by people who uphold the modern materialistic conception of the world, if we can fructify our moral feelings through these wider purposes of humanity, we will reach beyond the mere emotions displayed in the form of sympathy and antipathy for everything in the world around us, and moreover, in the only way available to us. It is undoubtedly necessary for much that is living in our time to be purified through spiritual science. For man will not allow himself to be cut off so completely from the spiritual world. He does not really allow himself to be cut off, but only apparently so. I have already made you aware of how this apparent cutting off process is achieved. When, on the other hand, people swear only by matter and by the impressions of the outside world, the inner forces which are intended for the spirit remain within them, but they then direct them to a false realm and give themselves up to all manner of illusions. This is essentially why the most down-to-earth materialistic people are also most prone to indulging in illusions. Thus we see many people who go through life denying the spirit and roaring with laughter if anyone speaks to them of someone having spiritual experiences. Quote, he is seeing ghosts, close quote, they say, and they are uttering words of condemnation if they are able to say of someone that he is seeing ghosts. They certainly do not see ghosts, as they would say. But they only think that they do not see ghosts, because they are actually seeing them all the time. One can put such a person who is so firmly rooted in his crudely materialistic view of the world to the test, and one will be able to see how he indulges in the most extreme illusions as regards what the following day may bring. This giving way to illusions is merely a substitute for the realm of spirit, which he denies. He inevitably falls prey to illusions if he rejects everything of a spiritual nature, and he cannot avoid doing so. As has been said, it is not so easy to demonstrate the existence of illusions in the various areas of life, but they are all over the place, absolutely everywhere. And the thing is that people like illusions. One can, for example, very often come across someone saying, quote, Shall I invest my money in this or that enterprise? This one is a brewery. I don't want my money being used for that, so I won't invest it here, close quote. He takes his money to the bank. Without his knowledge, the bank invests the money in the brewery. It makes no difference whatsoever in the objective fact, but he is under the illusion that his money is not being used for such debased purposes. It might be thought that what I am saying is somewhat far-fetched. However, this is not so. It is a very common phenomenon. People today do not take the trouble to study life properly and penetrate its surface. It is, however, important to do this, for it is quite crucial that one should come to know what position one is in. This is not easy nowadays, because life has become complicated. Nevertheless, what I have been pointing out is true. For, you see, under certain circumstances, an absurd situation may easily arise. I shall illustrate this by means of an example. There was once an arsonist, I am giving you an actual instance, who ran out of a house that he had just set on fire. He had organized everything so that he was able to get away in time. He was caught and was held responsible. And then he said that he had done a really good job, for it wasn't his fault that the house went up in flames, but that of the workman who had just left the house, leaving a lighted candle glowing in the twilight. If the candle had burnt down during the night, the house would have gone up in flames in the middle of the night. 
He had therefore set the house on fire before it became totally dark. The house would have caught fire in any case, and he had only done what he did because if there was still some daylight when the house went up in flames, it would still be possible to put the fire out quickly. This would have been more complicated at night, and the whole house would have burnt down, whereas with some daylight the fire could be quickly extinguished. Then he was asked why he had not extinguished the candle. His reply was, quote, I am a teacher of humanity. If I had blown the candle out, the workmen who were the ones to blame would have carried on being careless. But now they can see what happens if they forget to extinguish the light. Close quote. We may laugh at such an example, but we fail to see that we are continually doing the same thing. People are constantly doing similar things to what this man did when, instead of blowing out the candle, he set fire to the house. It is simply that we do not notice how a situation relates to the spiritual world, either because we are dulled by our feelings and passions or because we are enticed by intoxicating ideas. If we become inwardly accustomed to the elasticity and flexibility that are necessary for the nurturing of spiritual ideas, we shall also develop our thinking in such a way that it can really penetrate into our lives and adapt itself to them. If we fail to do this, our thinking will never be able to deal with life and will not even come in contact with it except in a superficial way. That is why, to turn to the deeper issue, the materialistic age really leads people away from all connection with the spiritual world. Just as one undermines one's bodily well-being if one does not sleep in the right way, so does one undermine one's soul life if one is not awake in the right way. And one is failing to be awake in the right way if one gives oneself up to outer impressions, if one lives without being conscious of one's connection with the spiritual world. Just as someone who for one reason or another tosses and turns in his sleep undermines his physical health, so does a person who in his waking hours gives himself up solely to his outward impressions of the world and to physical matter alone undermine his spiritual health. This will prevent him from rightly experiencing that first meeting with the spiritual world of which I have spoken. However, through this he ceases to be able to relate to the spiritual world in the right way during physical existence. And as a result, the connection with that world in which we are dwelling, when we are not incarnated in a physical body, that world which we enter when we pass through the portal of death, is severed. People need to understand once again that we are not here simply in order to involve ourselves in the physical universe during our physical existence and that in the course of our whole existence we have a connection with the totality of the world. Those who have passed through the portal of death want to work with us on the physical world. This collaboration is only apparently of a physical nature for everything physical is but an outward expression of the spirit. The materialistic age has estranged human beings from the world of the dead. Spiritual science needs to enable them to befriend this world once more. There will have to come a time when we no longer make it impossible for the dead to carry out their work for the spiritualization of the physical world by estranging ourselves from them. After all, the dead cannot take hold of things and affairs in the physical world with their hands and become directly involved in the physical work. That would be unthinkable. They are able to work in a spiritual way. For this, however, they need the tools that are available to them here. They need the spiritual substance that lives here in the physical world. We are not merely human beings. We are also at the same time instruments for the spirits who have passed through the portal of death. For as long as we are incarnated in a physical body, we use pens or hammers or axes. Once we are no longer incarnated in a physical body, our tools are human souls themselves. 
That this is so arises from the particular nature of a dead person's perception, which I should like to touch upon once more. I have already mentioned it earlier. Suppose you have before you, shall we say, a small vessel containing salt. As you look at it, you see the salt as white grains, as a white powder. But if you put the salt on your tongue and taste it, taste the distinctive quality of salt, it begins to be possible for the spirit to perceive it. Any spirit is able to perceive your tasting of the salt. Every spirit and also every human soul that has passed through the portal of death can perceive everything that takes place within man through the outer world. Just as nature reaches toward us when we taste and smell and see and hear, so does the world of the dead reach down to what we hear, see, taste, and so on. The dead accompany us in our experiences of the physical world, for these are not only part of our world, but also part of theirs. It belongs to their world when we imbue what we receive from the outside world with spiritual ideas. Unless we do this, what we merely experience as the effect of a material substance is as though incomprehensible to a dead person and is veiled in obscurity. A dead person experiences a soul that is estranged from the spirit as a dark soul. For this reason, the dead had become estranged from our earthly life during this materialistic age, and the situation must come to an end. There needs to be an intimate community of life between the so-called dead and the so-called living. However, this can happen only if people foster within their souls forces of a vibrant spiritual nature. That is, if they develop ideas, concepts, and imaginations which emanate from the spiritual domain. If a person makes the effort to reach the spiritual domain in his thoughts, he will gradually also reach the spirit in the realities of life. That is to say, a bridge is built between the physical and spiritual worlds. This alone can enable the transition to be made from the age of materialism to an age when human beings will confront reality neither in a blind nor an intoxicated way, but with vision and composure. These qualities will arise, on the one hand, through their capacity to see, as it were, with spiritual eyes, and on the other, through their ability to develop from their feelings, regarding the wider concerns of the world, a true balance between sympathy and antipathy, also with respect to what their immediate surroundings are demanding of them. The end of Lecture 5 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, steinerbooks.org in America and rudolfsteinerpress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English, and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of the 17 lectures in the complete volume numbered 175 of Rudolf Steiner's collected works, his lectures on building stones, for an understanding of the mystery of Golgotha, human life in a cosmic context, translated by Simon Blacksland DeLang. This is Lecture 6. Given in Berlin on the 13th of March, 1917. We shall begin by devoting a little more time to what we have been saying about the three meetings referred to in earlier lectures. We have said that the alternating states in which man lives in the brief period of 24 hours, when he lives alternately in a sleeping or a waking state, are not what they outwardly appear to be from a physical point of view, but that in the course of these alternating states a person has a meeting with the spiritual world. In this connection we indicated that the ego and the astral body, which are separated from the physical and ether bodies during sleep, in that they are, as it were, breathed out into the spiritual world when one goes to sleep and breathed in again 
when one wakes up, have their meeting during sleep with that world which we associate with the hierarchy of the angels, a world to which our own human soul will belong when the spirit self has developed and where the being who is referred to in a religious context as the Holy Spirit holds sway as the highest ruling principle. We have spoken in quite some detail about this meeting in the spiritual world, which accordingly takes place for every human being every time he goes to sleep. Now we must clearly understand that as the human race has developed, there have been changes in the course of earthly evolution with regard to these processes. What actually happens when a person is asleep? I would say that from the standpoint of man's inner being, I explained this in the previous lecture. From the standpoint of his relationship to the universe, man in a certain sense imitates that rhythm of the world order, which applies to any particular place on the earth's surface, through the fact that one half of the 24-hour period is day and the other half is night. Of course, it is always day somewhere on the earth, but a human being inhabits only one place on its surface, and with respect to this one place, what has been outlined above applies. Wherever he lives, he imitates the rhythm between day and night in his own rhythm of sleeping and waking. The fact that this connection is loosened in modern life, so that man is not compelled simply to be awake during the day and to sleep at night, is associated with his freeing himself from the objective rhythms of the world in the course of evolution. And he therefore only has within him the one rhythm instead of the two rhythms, his own rhythm of sleeping and waking, and that of day and night, running in regular parallel paths. These rhythms work in a certain sense at one time for the universe, for the macrocosm, and at another time for man, for the microcosm. They are no longer in unison. In this way, man is, in a certain sense, a being who is independent of the macrocosm. Now in olden times, in those former times, when, as we know, human beings possessed a certain atavistic clairvoyance, they fitted in more closely, as regards this rhythm, with the great rhythms of the cosmic order. In former times, people's sleeping patterns were such that they were awake during the day and asleep at night, and so the whole context of a person's experience was different in those times from how it is now. Man had, in a certain sense, to be wrenched free from this parallel path with the macrocosm, in order through this process of separation to develop an active inner independent life. It cannot be said that the main point associated with this was that in olden times people slept in such a way that they actually hardly saw the stars at all. They did indeed observe them, despite what scientific research claims about star worship, which is something quite different. The essential point was that people had a completely different relationship to the whole cosmic order, in that while the sun was on the other side of the earth and was therefore not exercising its influence directly on the part of the earth where they were living, their egos and astral bodies, which were outside their physical and ether bodies, were given over in reverence to the stars. So they did not merely perceive the physical stars, they perceived the spiritual counterpart of the physical stars. They did not actually see the physical stars with their outward eyes, but they saw what belongs spiritually to the physical stars. So, we should not understand what is related of the old star worship as signifying that these people in olden times looked up at the stars and then translated what they saw into symbols, formulating all sorts of lovely images and symbols. It is very easy to say, in the sense of modern science, that in these ancient times people had very fertile imaginations. They imagined gods amidst Saturn, Sun and Moon. Through their fantasy they translated animal forms into the signs of the zodiac. 
one really has to give credit to the active imaginations of the modern scientific experts who fabricated such ideas. What is, however, true is that in that state of consciousness of the egos and astral bodies of these people in olden times, things really did appear in the way that has been described, so that they really saw and perceived such phenomena. This meant, however, that people had a direct perception of the spirit that pervades the universe. They lived with this spirit with which the universe is ensouled. We are really only properly adapted to the earth through our physical and etheric bodies. As for our ego and astral body, they are suited to the spirit that ensouls the universe in the manner just described. We may say that our ego and astral body belong to this realm of the universe. But man needs to develop himself in such a way that he can discover the innermost nature of his ego and astral body from his experiences within them. For this purpose, the outer experience that existed in former times had to disappear for a while. It had to become obscured. The consciousness of communication with the stars had to recede. It had to be dimmed so that a man's inner being might be strengthened in such a way that at some future time he might learn to develop the inner strength to be able to find the spirit as a spirit. Just as people in former times were connected in the course of every night with the spirit of the starry world, so were they similarly connected with that same spirit in the course of every year. But in the course of the year they eventually came in contact with the higher spirit of the starry world, with what actually takes place in that world. During the night the forms of the stars in their peacefulness exercised their influence upon them. In the course of the year they were affected by the change associated with the passage of the sun during the year and thereby also with the destiny of the earth in its yearly cycle as it passes through the seasons and especially through summer and winter. You see, although there are still certain traditions with regard to the experience that people had in olden times when they were asleep at night, there are relatively few traditions, or to be more precise, very few of which the origin is known, remaining of those still more distant times when man's life encompassed the mysteries of the course of the year. Nevertheless, the reverberations of these experiences of the yearly cycle still persist, although they are little understood. Among the myths of the different peoples, you will constantly find those which testify that there was everywhere a knowledge of a battle of winter with summer, of summer with winter. Here, again, present-day scholars view this as symbolizing the creative imagination of people in olden times, which in our progress and sophistication we have gone so far beyond. These were, however, real experiences that people went through, experiences which played a deep and significant part in the whole cultural environment of these ancient times. There were mysteries in which considerable emphasis was placed on acquiring knowledge of the secrets of the year's course. We need to have some idea of the significance of such mysteries. They were different in really ancient times from how they were in the historical periods of ancient Greece or, excuse me, ancient Egypt or ancient Greece or even in the earliest period of Roman history. We will, therefore, consider those mysteries which faded into oblivion with the ancient cultures of Egypt, Greece and Rome. In these mysteries there was still an awareness of the relationship of the earth with the universe as a whole. Suitable individuals were therefore chosen and subjected to a quite particular psychic treatment in accordance with a process that would no longer be allowed today. And at a particular time over the course of several days during winter they were sent to certain specially prepared locations in order that they might fulfill a receptive function for what the universe, the extraterrestrial cosmos, is able to communicate to the earth at such times, 
when the earth can offer an adequate receptive function of this nature. In these ancient times, the decisive period for this was not precisely our modern Christmas, but was fairly close to it. But the exact time is not so important. Let us assume the time to be from the 24th and 25th of December through into the early days of January. This time is one when, because of the special position of the sun with regard to the earth, the universe conveys something to the earth that it does not at other times. It is the time when the universe speaks more intimately with the earth than at other times. This is because the sun does not display the power that it has in summer at this time, for this power has, in a certain sense, withdrawn. Now, the leaders of the old mysteries used this time in conjunction with certain individuals who were trained for this purpose in specially prepared locations to make it possible for deep secrets from the cosmos which came down to the earth in the course of this intimate dialogue of the cosmos with the earth to be received by them. This can be compared today with something far more trivial, but it nevertheless bears comparison with it. You know that so-called wireless telegraphy depends on electric waves being set in motion, which are further transmitted without wires, and that in certain places instruments are installed called coherers, which by virtue of their particular structure offer the possibility of receiving the electric waves at the station and setting the coherers in motion. It all depends on the arrangement, or rather the particular formation of the filings, the metal filings in the coherer, which are shaken back into place when the wave has passed through it. Now, if we suppose that the mysteries of the universe, the extraterrestrial cosmos, pass through the earth at this particular time that I have indicated, a reception device will be needed, for the electric waves would merely pass by the receiving station if one did not have the particular instrument with a coherer. One would, as it were, need a coherer for what comes forth from the cosmos. The ancient Greeks used their Pythia, their priestesses, for this purpose. They were trained to do this, and through being exposed to what came down from the cosmos, they were able to communicate these mysteries of the universe. These mysteries, then, came to be interpreted by those who had, perhaps, not been able to fulfill the function of actually receiving them for some time. Nevertheless, the mysteries of the universe were still imparted. All this was, of course, carried out under the sign of the holiest mysteries, a sign of which our present age, which has lost all trace of anything sacred, has no conception. In our time, the main priority would, of course, be to interview the priests of the mysteries. Now, what was actually demanded of these priests of the mysteries? It was, in a certain sense, necessary for them to know that if they incorporated the fructifying wisdom for earthly life that was streaming down from the cosmos to their cognitive faculties and especially their social understanding, they would, through the greater degree of cleverness that they had imbibed, be capable of establishing social regulations for the immediate future of making the legal and other arrangements for the coming year. There were formerly times on earth when people would not have instituted social regulations or legal structures without first having sought guidance in this way from those whose task it was to receive the mysteries of the macrocosm. Later ages have preser preserved feeble and dubious echoes of this great wisdom in superstitious fancies. When, on New Year's Eve, people pour melted lead into water with the object of finding out about what the coming year has in store, this is the superstitious residue of that great holy task of which I have been speaking. 
Its aim was essentially so to fructify the spirit, the spirit of human beings, that what can only spring from the cosmos might become a reality on the earth. For there was a wish that man should live on the earth in such a way that his life is not merely the result of what one can experience on the earth, but a result of what one can learn from the wider world. In the same way it was known that during the summer the earth cannot receive any intimate tidings from the cosmos. The summer mysteries, which had a totally different purpose, that does not concern us at present, were based upon this knowledge. Now, as I have said, ever fewer traditions have been preserved of those things that are associated with the mysteries of the cycle of the year than of everything related to the rhythm of day and night, of sleeping and waking. However, in those ancient times, when man still had a high degree of atavistic clairvoyance, which enabled him to experience in the course of the year the intimacies that flowed between the cosmic regions and the earth, human beings knew that what they experienced there had its origin in the meeting which they had, a meeting which does of course take place in every age, but at that time it was perceived through atavistic clairvoyance, not with that spiritual world that he can experience every time he goes to sleep, but a meeting with the spiritual world in which those spiritual beings live who belong to the hierarchy that we know as the archangels. This is that same world where man will dwell in his innermost essence when his life spirit has developed during the age of Venus. And it is also where in ancient times Christ, the Son, was thought of as being the guiding and ruling principle. This meeting which man has with the spiritual world in the course of the year at any point on the earth's surface, at the time when for this part of the earth it is the winter season of Christmas, can therefore also be called the meeting with the sun. Thus in the course of a year a person indeed experiences a rhythm which reflects that of the seasonal round itself and in which he has a union with the world of the sun. S-O-N. We know, of course, that through the mystery of Golgotha, that being whom we call the Christ, united himself with the course of the earth. At the time when this union took place, a direct perception of the spiritual world was, as I have just explained, obscured. We see the objective fact that the mystery of Golgotha is directly connected with the change taking place in human evolution on the earth. But we can also say that there have been times in human evolution when, through becoming aware of the earth's intimate dialogue with the macrocosm, as experienced in the old atavistic clairvoyance, human beings have entered into a relationship with Christ. This is the source of what has, with a certain justification, been put forward by a number of intelligent, learned people in recent times and students of religion that a primal revelation has been given to the earth. So, what I have been describing did indeed come about. There was a primal revelation. And all the separate religions scattered over the earth are the decadent fragments of that primal revelation. What, however, is the position of those who have accepted the mystery of Golgotha? Their position is that they can express their innermost faith in the spiritual origin of the universe by saying that what, in ancient times, still had to be perceived by means of a dialogue of the earth with the cosmos has now descended and has appeared in the course of the mystery of Golgotha in a human being, in the human being Jesus of Nazareth. Recognition of that being who was formerly perceptible to human beings in the course of the year through atavistic clairvoyance, again in the Christ who dwelt in Jesus of Nazareth, is something that must be increasingly emphasized as necessary for the spiritual evolution of mankind. For in this way one would be bringing the two elements of Christianity together, which really do need to be united, 
if on the one hand Christianity and on the other hand humanity are each to develop further in the right way. The fact that the legends of Christ Jesus have, through old Christian traditions, been annually included in the yearly cycle as the festivals celebrated at Christmas, Easter, and Whitsun is connected with this, as is the further fact that, as I said in a previous lecture, the Christmas festival is celebrated on a fixed date, whereas Easter is a festival whose date is determined by the movements of heavenly bodies. The celebration of the festival of Christmas in accordance with earthly relationships in the very depths of winter is associated with the meeting with Christ, with the Son, that does indeed take place then. However, Christ's nature as a being who belongs to the macrocosm descended from the macrocosm and is one with it is expressed through the fact that the timing of Easter that festival which is intended to declare that Christ belongs to the whole world, just as Christmas indicates that Christ descended to the earth, depends on when the spring equinox takes place and the positions of sun and moon. Thus it was right that what itself belongs to the seasonal round through the rhythmical presence of the human soul within it should be inserted into the yearly cycle. And because this is something with so deep a reflection in man's inner being, it is also justified that these festivals that relate to the mystery of Golgotha should continue to be celebrated in harmony with the rhythm of the wider cosmos and not be subject to the kind of alteration that has taken place in the hours of sleeping and waking in modern cities. So, here we have to do with a situation where man is not as yet so free that he may raise himself out of the objective flow of the cosmos. Every year he can be aware that even though he cannot engage directly with the cosmos through atavistic clairvoyance, something lives within him that belongs to the universal whole and comes to expression in the cycle of the year. Now among the things which certain religious faiths have most strongly censured about spiritual science is that, through spiritual science, the Christ impulse must once again be linked to the whole cosmos. As I have often emphasized, spiritual science does not take anything away from what religious traditions have contributed to the mystery of Christ Jesus, but it adds the relationship extending from the earth to the whole cosmos which surrounds this mystery. It seeks Christ not only on the earth, It seeks him in the whole universe. Indeed, it is difficult to understand why some religious groups again and again single out especially this connection of the Christ impulse with cosmic events for censure. For it would only be understandable if spiritual science were to take something away from the rightful traditions of Christianity. If it adds something, this should surely not be a reason for criticism. However, This is how things stand. And the reason is that there is a strong wish not to add anything to certain traditions. There is, however, a very serious background to this, something which is of considerable importance, especially for our time. I have often drawn your attention, in my first mystery play, among other places, to the fact that we are approaching the time when we are able to speak about a spiritual second coming of Christ. I do not need to expand more fully on this today, as it is familiar, a familiar subject for all our friends. However, this Christ event will not merely be an event that satisfies people's transcendental curiosity, but it will above all be an event which will place a demand on their minds for a new understanding of the Christ impulse. Certain basic sayings of Christianity which should live throughout the world as holy impulses, at any rate amongst those who want to receive the Christ impulse, are not understood with sufficient depth. I should like to remind you of the significant and incisive words, quote, My kingdom is not of this world, close quote. These words will take on a new meaning 
when Christ appears in a realm that is indeed not of this world, which is to say not of the world of the senses. For it will have to become an essential characteristic of the Christian conception of the world that it is able to relate to all other human views and attitudes with understanding, with the exception of a coarse and crude materialism. If one can see clearly that all the religions on the earth are the remnants of ancient visionary perception, it will simply be a question of taking them with the seriousness that they deserve. What can be perceived in them, and because mankind, subsequently, ceased to be in a position to see in a visionary way, what one finds in the various religious faiths and denominations is only of a fragmentary nature, can be recognized through Christianity. Thus, through Christianity, one can gain a deep understanding of every form of religious faith on the earth, not only of the great religions, but of every religious creed or confession. Admittedly, this is easily said. But although it is easy to say such things, it is difficult for people to see it in this way. And yet it needs to become a general conviction of people over the entire earth. For the way that Christianity has manifested itself on the earth hitherto is as a religion among other religions, one faith among other faiths. That is not the reason for its existence. Christianity was brought into being in order to spread understanding over the entire earth. Christ did not die, nor was he born for a limited circle of people, but for all human beings. There is in a certain sense a contradiction between the requirement that Christianity should be for all human beings and the fact that it has become a faith in its own right. But it is not intended to be a separate creed and it can only become one if it is not understood in its full depth. Its cosmic aspect is an essential part of the full depth of its meaning. One struggles today for words to express certain truths because they are so far removed from people that there are not the words with which to express them. It is often the case that one can only express them by way of a comparison. You will recall that I have often said that Christ can be called the Sun Spirit. From what I have been saying today about the yearly course of the Sun, one can already see that there is a certain justification for calling him the Sun Spirit, S-U-N. But it is not possible to have any conception of a Sun Spirit unless one keeps the cosmic relationship of Christ in mind, unless one conceives of the mystery of Golgotha as a true Christ mystery that has significance for the whole cosmos and is an event that took place for the whole cosmos. Human beings quarrel about many things on the earth. There is much that they disagree about. They disagree about their religious faiths. They think that they are at variance with one another because of their nationalities and for many other reasons. These disagreements lead to times such as the one that we are living in now, for example. People also disagree about the mystery of Golgotha. For no Chinaman or Indian will simply accept what a European missionary says about the mystery of Golgotha. Anyone who considers things as they are will not find this surprising. But there is one thing that people have not hitherto disagreed about. It seems scarcely credible, but it is a trivial matter and one simply has to accept it. If one considers the way that people oppose one another on the earth, one cannot help wondering if there is anything that they have not disagreed about. But there are still some things of this nature, and one example is the opinion that people have about the sun. The Japanese, the Chinese, and even the Americans and the English do not believe that one sun rises and sets for them and another one for the Germans. People still believe that there is only one sun. And indeed, they still think in common terms about everything lying outside the earth. They do not have arguments about such things. They do not wage wars on their account. This can be taken as a sort of comparison. 
As has been said, these things can be expressed only through comparisons. When people begin to understand the connection of Christ with these phenomena that they do not quarrel about, they will not argue about Christ. And they will then behold him in the kingdom which is not of this world and is his kingdom. But there will be no unity about those matters regarding which there needs to be common ground throughout the entire earth until people have come to recognize the cosmic significance of Christ. For we shall be able to speak to the Jews, the Japanese, the Chinese, and the Indians in the way that we speak to Europeans of a Christian persuasion. This opens up an enormously significant perspective, both for the further development of Christianity on the earth and for the further evolution of humanity on the earth. For ways must be found of engendering inner qualities and attitudes which all people are able to understand in a similar way. This will, however, be a demand of the time in which the second coming, the spiritual second coming of Christ, will take place. And from this time onward, there will need to be a deeper understanding of the words, quote, My kingdom is not of this world, close quote. A deeper understanding of the fact that there is not only an earthly part of man's being, but a super-earthly part, which lives in the annual course of the sun. We must come to feel that in the individual human life, the soul aspect governs the bodily aspect, so that in everything that goes on out there in the ascending and descending stars, in the bright sunlight and fading twilight, a spiritual quality is living. And that just as we are part of the air through our lungs, we are part of the spiritual life of the universe through our souls. Not the abstract spirituality of a wishy-washy pantheism, but a concrete spirituality such as lives in individual beings. Thus we shall find that in inner connection with what lives in the cycle of the year, as do the breaths in a human being, there is something of a spiritual nature which belongs to the human soul, and which is indeed the human soul, and that the Christ being who passed through the mystery of Golgotha belongs to the cycle of the year in all its mysteries. We must soar upward with our imagination if we are to be able to connect what took place historically on the earth in the mystery of Golgotha with the great secrets of the world, with the mysteries of the macrocosm, but then something of immense importance will emerge from this understanding, namely a knowledge of what people need in a social sense. There is a lot of social science in our time and many social ideals of all sorts. There is, of course, no objection to that, but all these ideas need to be able to achieve something, and this will have to happen through what will arise within man once he is able to bring a renewed spiritual impulse to the cycle of the year. For only by vividly experiencing each year the image of the mystery of Golgotha alongside the course of the year can one be inspired with what lives as a potential for social knowledge and social feeling. Let me read that sentence again. For only by vividly experiencing each year the image of the mystery of Golgotha alongside the course of the year can one be inspired with what lives as a potential for social knowledge and social feeling. What I am saying now will certainly appear highly convoluted to most people today, but it is true nonetheless. When the course of the year is experienced by humanity as a whole in such a way that it is felt to be inwardly connected with the mystery of Golgotha, This inner sensitivity to the cycle of the year and to the mystery of Golgotha will make it possible for a true social feeling to be disseminated throughout the earth. This will be the true solution or at least the further development of what is today so foolishly, in view of what is being considered here, referred to as the social question. Through spiritual science, however, people will have to acquire a knowledge of man's connection with the universe. This will surely make it possible for them to see more in this universe than what modern materialism sees in it. 
It is precisely those things to which the least value is attributed that are the most important. Modern materialistic biology, indeed materialistic science in general, compares man with animals. It does, to be sure, find a slight difference. Of course it is correct in its own terms, but what it totally disregards is man's relationship to the various directions of space. The spine of animals, and here the exceptions prove the rule, is directed out into the cosmic expanses in parallel with the earth's surface. The human spine is directed toward the earth. But this, for this reason, man's relationship to above and below is quite different from that of an animal. And it is this that defines him in his whole being. In the case of an animal, the spine reaches out into the infinite distances of the macrocosm. With man, it is the upper part of the head, the brain, that does so. And the human being himself becomes a part of the whole macrocosm. This has immense implications for it determines the way that the relationship between the spiritual and bodily aspects of man's being is manifested. It means that his spiritual and bodily aspects are also related to one another in terms of above and below. I shall have more to say on this subject, but I wanted today just to mention it briefly. This above and below relates to what we may refer to as the departure of the ego and astral body during sleep. For man with his ego and astral body is united through his physical and etheric bodies with the earth while he is awake. During the night he is, through his ego and astral body, part of what lies above. Now we may ask, how does it work with the other pairs of opposites in the macrocosm? There is also the contrast which can for man be defined in terms of forward and backward, in the sense of in front and behind. Again, with regard to this dimension of space, man is related in a different way to the whole macrocosm than, for example, animals or plants. This relationship is such that this front and back orientation corresponds to the path of the sun. Moreover, this orientation corresponds to the rhythm in which man takes part in living and dying. Just as in sleeping and waking man in a certain sense, expresses the living relationship of above and below, so does he manifest the relationship between in front and behind in his living and dying. This dimension of space is oriented in accordance with the course of the sun, so that, quote, in front, close quote, signifies for man toward the east and behind toward the west. East and west form the second dimension of space, that dimension of which we are actually speaking when we say that the human soul leaves the human body, not in sleep, but in death. For the soul leaves the human body in an easterly direction. This is only still to be found in those traditions where one speaks of dying in terms of his, quote, entry to the eternal east, close quote. Such old traditional sayings will be regarded by learned people as merely symbolic, and they are perhaps even now. For example, one may say something trivial, such as this, quote, The sun rises in the east. That is a beautiful sight. So, in speaking of the east, people were also referring to eternity. Close quote. And yet, this corresponds to a reality, and one more closely related to the yearly path of the sun than to the course of the day. The third difference is that between the inner and the outer, above and below, east and west, inner and outer, we live an inner life and we live an outer life. The day after tomorrow I shall be giving a public lecture about this theme of the inner and outer life entitled, quote, The Human Soul and the Human Body, close quote. We live an inner and outer life. For us as human beings, this theme of inner and outer is just as much a contrast as above and below, or east and west. Whereas in the course of the year, one has more to do with what I might describe as a representative picture of the whole course of life, one might say that when we speak of an inner and outer life in connection 
with the life and death of man, we are referring to the whole course of his life, especially in so far as it has a descending and ascending development. As you know, approximately until a certain year, man experiences an ascending development. His growth then ceases, and then after a while it regresses once more. Now it is a feature of man's life that at the beginning of his life his whole bodily organism is most connected in a natural elemental way with the spiritual world. I might say that man is constituted in a completely opposite way from when he has attained the climax of his ascending development in the middle of his life. During the first period of his life a person grows, thrives and develops his forces. Then he begins to embark upon a descending phase of development. This is associated with the fact that his physical forces are no longer, in themselves, growth forces, but that forces of decline or decay are also intermingled with the forces of growth. A person's inner being at that time has a similar relationship to the universe as has his bodily organism at the beginning of life, at his birth a total reversal takes place. That is why it is at this time, in the middle of life, that a person experiences in what is today a state of unconsciousness, a meeting with the Father Principle, with that spiritual being whom we associate with the hierarchy of the Archai, with that spiritual world in which man will dwell when he has fully developed his spirit man. We may now ask, Does this have any kind of connection with the universe as a whole? Is there anything in the life of the universe that is connected with the meeting with the Father in the middle of life in a similar way that the meeting with the Spirit is connected with the rhythm of day and night and the meeting with the Son is connected with the rhythm of the year? This question can indeed be asked. Now we need to be aware that just as is the case with the meeting with the Spirit, people are likewise out of rhythm as regards this meeting with the Father. The rhythm does not completely correspond. For people are not born at the same time but at different times. Because of this, their lives cannot run in parallel, but they can inwardly reflect some kind of spiritual cosmic event. Do they do this? If we call to mind what appears in the little volume titled The Education of the Child from the Standpoint of Anthroposophy, and also in other writings and lecture cycles, we are aware that approximately in the first seven years of life a person forms his physical body, in the next seven years his ether body, in the next seven years his astral body, in the next seven years after that the sentient soul, and then the intellectual or mind soul between the ages of twenty-eight and thirty-five. The meeting with the Father Principle falls within this latter period. It is spread over this time, but it occurs during these years. Not that it extends over this time, but it occurs during these years. So one can say that a person is preparing for it during the ages of 28, 29, and 30. In the case of most people, the meeting takes place in the deep unconscious regions of the human soul. We might therefore suppose that there is something taking place in the universe that corresponds to this time. We should find something in the cosmos representing a cycle or a rhythm. Just as the rhythm of day and night is one of 24 hours and the yearly cycle 365 days, so we should be able to find something similar in the cosmos, except that it would have to be more extensive. It would have a relationship to the sun, or at any rate the solar system, and there would, I would say, need to be something, some kind of orbit, on a larger scale connected with the sun, something more extensive in the same measure that 28, 29, or 30 years are a longer period than either 24 hours or 365 days. Now the ancients rightly regarded Saturn as the outermost planet of our solar system. It is the most distant planet. From the standpoint of materialistic astronomy, 
it is completely justified that Uranus and Neptune should be added, but they have a different origin. They do not belong to the solar system. So we can speak of Saturn as representing the limit of the solar system. Consider this, therefore. If Saturn is the limit of the solar system, we could say that in its orbit around the sun, it moves around the outermost limit of the solar system. So if you imagine Saturn orbiting the sun, it returns to the point from which it started, with the same relationship to the sun. Now Saturn describes its course, as one can say today according to the Copernican system, in around 29 or so years, which corresponds to the time in question. Here then, in the orbit of Saturn, around the Sun, it actually happens quite differently, but the Copernican system is not sufficiently developed to understand this, we have the set of circumstances and relationships encompassing the totality of the solar system as manifested in the outermost path of Saturn around the Sun, with which man's life path is associated, which is therefore a reflection of this path of Saturn inasmuch as the course of a human life leads to the meeting with the Father. This too leads us out into the macrocosm. I believe I have in this way shown you that the innermost aspect of man's being can only be understood if one thinks of it in relation to the extraterrestrial world. This cosmic world is, as a spiritual phenomenon, organized into that which presents itself to us also in a visible form. But what we can actually see is only the outward manifestation of these spiritual realities. Man will be able to free himself from materialism only if he develops his knowledge to the point where it is raised beyond conceptions of purely earthly relationships and is again able to encompass an understanding of the world of the stars and the sun. I have already pointed out that many things that modern book learning does not even dare dream about are connected with these matters. People today imagine that they will be able to generate living beings in the laboratory from inorganic substance. Materialism makes the most of this today. One does not need to be a materialist to believe that a living being can be made out of inorganic substance under laboratory conditions as is confirmed by the belief of the alchemists, who were certainly not materialists, that they could make homunculus, bracket, mannequins, miniature human beings, close bracket. Today this is interpreted in a materialistic way. But the time will come when one will have the perception, which is to say inwardly feel, on approaching a person at work in the laboratory, for it will come about that living things are brought forth from non-living things under laboratory conditions, that one is compelled to say to the person who is doing this, quote, Welcome to the star of the hour, close quote, because this will not simply be possible at any time at random, but it will depend on the positions of the stars. Whether life arises from the lifeless depends on forces that are not of the earth, but which derive from the cosmos. There is much that is associated with these mysteries. Now it is possible, and we shall speak about these things in the near future, to say a lot about these matters, regarding which St. Martin, the so-called unknown philosopher, says in various passages of his book titled On Truth and Errors, that he thanks God that they are veiled in secrecy. They cannot remain veiled in deep mystery, because human beings need them for their further development. But it is necessary that people once again develop a serious attitude to all these things and acquire that feeling for holiness without which one will not use this knowledge for the world in the right way. We shall speak further about these matters next time. The end of Lecture 6 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England. 
who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of the Complete Collected Works Volume 175, entitled Building Stones for an Understanding of the Mystery of Golgotha, Human Life in a Cosmic Context, 17 Lectures, translated by Simon Blacksland DeLange. This is Lecture 7, given in Berlin on the 20th of March, 1917. Today I should like to introduce a sort of historical survey into the process in which we are engaged, not so much in order to venture into history for its own sake, but rather because there is much in the cultural life that surrounds us at present that can be brought to a clearer focus through a survey of this nature. It was in 1775 when a very remarkable book appeared in Lyon, a book which very soon, at at any rate by 1782, became accessible to certain circles of German cultural life and had a far greater influence than is normally supposed. Its influence was, however, of such an extent that it more or less had to be suppressed by the main impulse underlying cultural development in the 19th century. This book is of the highest interest for those wanting to inform themselves about what happened from earliest times until our own times. I am referring to the book title, uh, Readers Aside, again forgive my attempt at French here, end of Readers Aside, title is Des Erreurs et et de la Verité by Saint Martin. Anyone trying to read this book today, whether in its original language or in the German edition by Matthias Claudius, who has also written a beautiful preface to the translation, will find it extremely difficult to understand. Even Matthias Claudius himself admits this, and this was at the end of the 18th century. He says in what is, as I have said, his beautifully written preface, quote, Most people will not understand this book, I do not understand it properly either. But it made such a deep impression on me that I think it should become more widely known. Close quote. No one will be able to make anything of this book, who, without having the slightest knowledge of these subjects themselves, approaches it from the standpoint of those physical, chemical, and similar world conceptions that are taught in schools today, or which one imbibes through one's general education. Nor will the book appeal to someone who derives his knowledge of the present times, a phrase which is to be preferred to, in quotes, political views, from ordinary newspapers or from the modern cultural attitudes influenced by them and reflected in various topical magazines. There are several reasons why I am speaking to you about this book today after the two public lectures that I gave last Thursday and last Saturday. In these two lectures I spoke about the nature of man and the various members of his being, and about the connection between the human soul and the human body, in the way that one will eventually come to speak about this relationship when the scientific knowledge that is currently available, but which cannot be appreciated for what it is, can be perceived in the right way. Someone who is in a position to know about these matters from a spiritual scientific standpoint will have the clear conviction that people will no longer speak about the relationship of the soul activities of thinking, feeling and will to the human organism in the way they do today. It is therefore my opinion that with these two lectures a beginning has been made with respect to what is bound to come even though it may perhaps be postponed for a long time in the wider world, through the considerable resistance which not science itself but scientists themselves exhibit. Even though it may take some time, it will nevertheless eventually come about that the relationship between the human soul and the human body will be perceived as has been outlined in these two lectures. In these lectures I spoke about these things in the way that I believe is necessary in 1917. What I mean is the way one needs to speak once one has taken into account 
all the scientific research and other relevant human experiences. It would not have been possible to speak about all these things in the 18th century, for example. In the 18th century, one would have spoken about them completely differently. People are not sufficiently aware what an enormous significance it had that, as I have frequently indicated, roughly at the end of the first third of the 19th century, during the 1830s and 1840s, there was, from a spiritual point of view, a crisis of immense magnitude in the development of European humanity. I have often characterized this by saying that at this time the tide of materialism reached its highest point. I have also often drawn attention to the frivolous way that people talk about our time as a period of transition. Of course, every age is a period of transition, and this expression, quote, our time is a period of transition, close quote, is entirely reasonable, because that is what every age is. But the point at issue is not that it is being said that a particular age is a period of transition, but rather to establish what kind of a transition it is. There will always be particular turning points which represent deeply radical times of transition in human evolution, and one such fundamental transition in human evolution occurred at the time indicated, even though little attention is paid to it today. There is therefore a need to understand that we must speak today about the riddles that directly concern human beings with totally different words and completely different expressions and approach the subject in question from wholly different points of view than was the case in the 18th century. There was perhaps no one in the 18th century who spoke with such an intuitive awareness and attentiveness about the scientific ideas of his time with respect to questions of a similar nature to the ones that we are speaking about now as St. Martin. In all that he said, however, St. Martin was not yet, as we are now, at the dawn of a new age, but in the twilight of the old age. And he speaks with a twilight mood. So, unless one keeps the point of view that I am about to express clearly in view, it might appear to be almost a matter of indifference whether one concerns oneself with St. Martin at all, whether or not one studies this distinctive form of the ideas aroused in him by Jacob Burma. It might indeed seem to be a matter of indifference, were there not a very different and deeply significant viewpoint to be considered, to which I shall refer in the course of today's lecture. To mention a specific case, in the course of pointing out the errors to which people are prone through their philosophy of life and through what their path to the truth might be, parenthesis, for his book is, after all, called Des Erreurs et de la Verite, close parenthesis, St. Martin speaks in such a way that he uses certain concepts and ideas that were current in particular circles right into the 18th century in the most pertinent way possible. The way that he expresses himself makes it clear that he is very used to working with these ideas. So we find that as St. Martin launches into a consideration of man's relationship to the whole cosmos and to ethical life, he draws upon three principal ideas or concepts which play such a big part in the thinking of Jacob Burma and Paracelsus and through which people sought at the time to understand nature and also man, mercury, sulfur, and salt. Through these three elements of mercury, sulfur, and salt, they tried to discover the key for understanding both outer nature and man. A person today who would want to speak in accordance with the way that a modern scientist speaks, and this is necessary if one is not to go back to the past, cannot think of the three words, mercury, sulfur, and salt, in terms of the ideas with which people in the 18th century associated them. 
when people spoke about mercury, sulfur, and salt, they conceived of a threefoldness which someone today, if he is speaking out of a scientific insight, could only rightly represent by dividing man in the way that I proposed into the digestive system, the breathing system, and the nerve system, out of which the whole human being is composed. For everything belongs to, in one way or another to one of these systems. And if one supposes that any particular part does not fit into this picture, as one might in the case of the bones, this would only be apparent. People in the 18th century understood that the whole of man's being can be understood if one has the overall conception of mercury, sulfur, and salt. Now, of course, when an ordinary person, or a chemist, speaks about salt, he is referring to the white grains that he has on the table, or to the salts that the chemist prepares in his laboratory. When he speaks about sulfur, the ordinary person thinks of matches and the chemist of all the experiments that he has carried out in his retort for the transmutation of sulfur. As to mercury, one thinks of ordinary quicksilver, and so on. In the 18th century, people did not think in this way. Today it is very difficult even to imagine what was living in their souls when they spoke of mercury, sulfur, and salt. St. Martin put the question in his own way at that time. How do I divide man if I regard his bodily organism as a reflection of his soul? His reply was on these lines. I first need to consider man with respect to the instruments, the organs of his thinking. Parenthesis, he puts it somewhat differently, but we must interpret it a little so that the explanation does not take too long. Close parenthesis. I first need to consider man with respect to the organs of his head. What is the main characteristic involved here? What do we need to consider? What is the active agent in the head, or as we would say today, in the nervous system? His answer is salt. And by salt he means not the white grains, and also not what chemists understand by salt, but the totality of those forces at work in the human head when a person has an idea. Everything associated with the outward effect of salt he regards merely as a manifestation, an outward revelation of the same forces that are active in the human head. He then asks, which element works primarily in the human chest region? In accordance with the way that I distinguished the members of man's being in my lecture last Thursday, we would put it a little differently. What is at work in the region of man's breathing? St. Martin replies, sulfur. So that according to him, everything associated with the functions of the chest is governed by those active elements which have their origin in sulfur, or in that which is of the nature of sulfur. And, then he asks, what is at work in the rest of man's being? We would refer to this as the metabolic system. His answer is mercury. And so he has an overview of the whole of man's being. On the one hand, one sees that from the way that he formulates everything, he stands in the evening twilight of this whole way of thinking. But on the other hand, it is apparent that from his position in the fading twilight, he was still able to grasp a whole wealth of truths which were still understood at that time but are now buried, obscured from view, truths which he is able to express by making use of the three concepts of mercury, sulfur, and salt. Thus this book, titled De Des Erreurs et de la Verité, consists of a very fine treatise, which for a modern physicist is complete nonsense, on thunderstorms, on thunder and lightning, in the course of which he shows that one can, on the one hand, use mercury, sulfur, and salt in order to explain man's bodily nature, and that, on the other hand, one can use them to explain such atmospheric phenomena. At one time they are working together within man. At another time they are working out in the world. 
In man they give rise to the thoughts or will impulses that light up within him. Out in the world, the same elements engender phenomena such as thunder and lightning. As has been said, what St. Martin explains is something that anyone imbued with the way of thinking characteristic of the 18th century could understand perfectly well. For a modern physicist it is total nonsense. But there is, I would say, something of a snag quite specifically as regards thunder and lightning in modern physics. For what it offers by way of an explanation for them is somewhat facile. It teaches that the lightning and then the thunder in its wake is brought about when the electric charges between two clouds, one of which is positively and the other negatively charged, are balanced out. A schoolboy who has his wits about him and has previously noticed that when the teacher carries out electrical experiments, he carefully wipes away any dampness so that the instruments are dry, because nothing works with electricity whenever there is any dampness, may say, quote, yes, but surely the clouds are so damp that the electricity cannot function in them as you say it does, close quote. The teacher would then say, quote, you're a silly boy, you don't understand, close quote. It would be difficult for him to answer in any other way today. St. Martin tries to explain how mercury and sulfur are connected in a particular way through the salt in the air. And then he goes on to show how, in a similar way, saltpeter and sulfur are united through charcoal in gunpowder, and, therefore, how explosions can arise through a particular transmutation of the elements of mercury and sulfur by means of the presence of salt. This explanation arising out of the way that the concepts of mercury, sulfur, and salt were understood at that time, is remarkably ingenious. I cannot enter it into it more deeply now, but we shall consider the whole subject more from an historical point of view. St. Martin shows particularly well how the distinctive relationship of lightning to salt, or what he calls salt, is proved through certain properties of air after thunderstorms. In short, St. Martin battled in his own way against the materialism that was already looming through, having behind him the foundations of a traditional wisdom, which found in him a highly significant expositor. By this means he aspired toward an explanation of the world as a whole, and after having given the interpretations that make use of the elements of which we have been speaking, he proceeded to an explanation of earthly evolution. In this respect, he is not so foolish as those born after him, who believe in a primordial mist in their belief that one can arrive at the beginning of the world with physical concepts. Rather, does he have recourse to imaginations in his wish to explain the origin of the earth? In the book we find a wonderful richness of imaginative ideas when he addresses this theme. Ideas which, like his physical concepts, can only be understood out of the age in which he lived. We would not be able to make use of such ideas any longer, but they indicate that from a certain point onward he endeavored to grasp things with an imaginative perception. Then, having explored this area, he moves on to developing an understanding of, of the historical life of man. He tries to establish that historical life can only be understood if one sees that, from time to time, spiritual impulses have been entering into the physical world from the spiritual world. He then tries to apply this general idea to man's deeper nature by showing that what is described in the biblical legend of the fall from paradise derives, according to his imaginative perception, from definite facts, and that man has arrived at his present condition from one in the primordial past. He endeavors to understand the historical phenomena of his time and of historical time in general, from the fall of spiritual life into matter. I am not necessarily defending this, 
but am merely describing it. Of course, I am not wanting to replace spiritual science or anthroposophy with St. Martin's teachings. I merely wish to relate this in order to show how far advanced St. Martin was at that time. As we read Des Erreurs et de la Verite, chapter by chapter, we keep coming across something quite remarkable. We find that St. Martin speaks out of a rich abundance of knowledge, and that what he actually communicates represents, I would say, only the outermost layers of the knowledge that lives in his soul. He indicates this in several passages of his book. This is the gist of what he says. Quote, if I were to explore this issue at a deeper level, I would have to divulge truths that I may not pronounce. Close quote. At one point he even says, quote, if I were to say all that needs to be said on this subject, I would have to unveil certain truths that for the most that for most people are better left enshrouded in the deepest darkness of night. Close quote. A true spiritual scientist can discern a great deal from these remarks, and he also knows why these observations appear at particular points of certain chapters. One cannot speak unconditionally about certain things. It will only be possible to speak about certain things when the impulses that have been given through spiritual science have become moral impulses, when human beings have attained a certain high-mindedness through spiritual science, so that one is able to speak about certain questions in a different way than is possible when remarkable scientific figures such as Freud and his syndicate are at work. In the last third of his book, St. Martin moves on to discussing certain political topics It is scarcely possible in our present time to do more than merely indicate how to relate the way that St. Martin thought at that time to the way that humanity, as it were, in quotes, thinks now, for that is a forbidden subject. I can merely say that the whole attitude that St. Martin adopts in this last third of his book is really quite remarkable. If we read this chapter, we must do so today in such a way that we are clearly aware that it appeared, together with the rest of the book, in 1775, and that the French Revolution followed only after this chapter had been written. This chapter must be thought of in connection with the French Revolution, and a great deal needs to be read between the lines. But St. Martin proceeds as an occultist someone who lacks the organs of perception to recognize the profound impulses living in this chapter of the book will probably be very appreciative of the introduction that St. Martin supplies for this chapter. For what he says is this, quote, No one should think that I am trying to inveigle myself into anyone's presence. Anyone who has anything to do with the ruling powers of the earth or is connected in some way with the government should be very far from thinking that I am trying to approach them. I am a friend of all and everyone. But after excusing himself in this way, he says certain things that make Rousseau's statements seem like child's play. However, I cannot say more about this. In short, we are dealing here with a person of great significance, who was the leader of a school, and without whom Herder, Goethe, Schiller, and German Romanticism in general, can hardly be imagined, just as he is barely conceivable without Jakob Burma. Nevertheless, if one reads him today and allows oneself to be influenced by what he says, the fact is that, as I have just said, there would not be the slightest point in speaking to some sort of public audience in the way that St. Martin wrote as I did last Thursday and Saturday, and will do so again next Thursday, when I was trying to delineate a picture of the world, which on the one hand is absolutely correct from a spiritual scientific point of view, and on the other is equally correct from the standpoint of the most meticulous scientific discoveries of the present. The way that St. Martin formulated his ideas is no longer suited to the way that people need to think today 
and apply their thoughts. Just as someone traveling from one linguistic region to another needs to use not the language of the first region, but that of the second, it would be absurd today to try to explain everything in the way that St. Martin did. And it would be particularly absurd because there is between us and them that mighty dividing wall in spiritual evolution which dates from 1842, thus at the end of the first third of the 19th century. From this you can see that it is possible for a certain way of thinking to fade into oblivion in the spiritual evolution of mankind. But if one studies St. Martin, one does not really have the feeling that his thoughts have lost their relevance. This is certainly not the case, and one has, on the contrary, the feeling that there is such an enormous amount of undiscovered treasures of wisdom in his work that a great deal could still be extracted from it. Nevertheless, there is, on the other hand, a need in the spiritual evolution of mankind for this way of thinking to come to an end and another to begin. This is indeed a reality. For in the former period the outer world was still in a rudimentary stage of its present development, and its more extreme materialistic phase was only just beginning. We can, therefore, only really understand what actually happened then if we survey longer periods of time, when what spiritual science seeks to arouse within us today can be discerned over a wider span of time. Or, of course, what St. Martin expressed at the end of the 18th century, when present developments were still in an incipient form, looked quite different from the way that it does today. At that time, in general, something was coming to an end. Not only was this the case in the sense that the ideas still inspiring Jacob Burma, Paracelsus, St. Martin, and others in the later phase of the evening twilight of this whole way of thinking could no longer be implemented. But something highly significant was also taking place in the way people felt. Whereas in St. Martin we see in the context of this phenomenon of the evening twilight a human mind focused more upon nature, the same phenomenon manifests itself in a somewhat different way if we cast our eye on the almost parallel decline of theosophy, on the fading glow of the theosophical view of the world. It is true that St. Martin in general, excuse me, it is true that St. Martin is also generally referred to as a theosophist, but I have in mind when I characterize St. Martin a theosophy that is focused more upon natural science, and a theosophy that was more widely prevalent as one of a more religious nature. In this very particular form, it reached a culmination in Swabia, one cannot really refer to South Germany, where at the time of this period of general decline, when it also reached a quite particular maturity, two individuals in particular stood out among the various other figures, namely Bengel and Ettinger, they were surrounded by a large number of others. I shall mention only those with whom I am more familiar. Friedrich, Daniel Schubart, the mathematician Hahn, then Steinhofer, the schoolmaster Hartmann, who had great influence on Jung Stilling, and was also personally acquainted with Goethe, then Jacob, Johann Jakob Moser, a large number of remarkable individuals in relatively modest positions who did not form a coherent group, but who all lived at the time when Ettinger's star also shone. Ettinger's life almost spanned the entire 18th century. He was born in 1702 and died as a prelate in Murhart, a highly remarkable personality in whom was concentrated, in a certain sense, the essence of what lived in this whole circle. This theosophy of the 18th century found an echo in Richard Walter, who, in addition to teaching at other universities, taught mainly in Heidelberg and wrote a very fine preface to a book which Karl August Auberlin published on, titled The Theosophy of Friedrich Christoph Ettinger. In this preface, Richard Walter, who, who represents an echo of all the traditions of this circle, 
on the one hand out of his theosophical convictions, recalls the theosophy of those great theosophists whose names I have listed, and on the other hand, speaks in such a way that one can clearly see how he feels in looking back at the twilight period with regard to those mysteries of life with which he was concerned as a theosophist. Thus, in this preface, which was written in 1847, Richard Walter writes about Ettinger. I should like to quote some of it here, and I want to do so in order that you can see that Richard Walter, who was then in Heidelberg, was someone who, in his review of Ettinger's work, saw him as a person who, in his own way, endeavored above all to study the scriptures, both the Old and the New Testaments, out of a theosophical understanding of the world. Richard Walter looked back at this particular way of reading the scriptures and compared it with the way that he, and he died only in the 1860s and was therefore very much of a latecomer, had learned them, which was how it generally happened at the time. He compared this latter way of reading the scriptures with the methods of Bengel, Ettinger, Steinhofer, the mathematician and astronomer Hahn, and others. In this regard, Richard Walter says something quite remarkable, quote, Among the men belonging to this group, which included Bengel and his Apocalyptica, Ettinger occupied a foremost position. Dissatisfied with the academic theology of his time, he thirsted for a richer and fuller, but at the same time also a purer understanding of Christian truth. Orthodox theology did not satisfy him. He thought it shallow. He wanted more than this, not because it asked too much of his faith, but because his profound mind needed more than it had to give. He did not have a problem with its supernatural aspect, the supernatural quality of the theology of his time, but with the fact that it did not take this aspect seriously enough. He inwardly rebelled very strongly against the spiritualism current at the time, which reduced the reality of the world, realities of the world, of Christian belief, to pale abstractions, to mere intellectual images. Hence his fiery zeal against all idealism. Close quote. Such a sentence might seem strange, but one needs to understand what it means. By idealism, a German understands a system that lives purely in ideas, whereas Ettinger, and with him also Rota, had a truly spiritual aspiration. They were people who really wanted to move history forward, unlike what Ranke and people like him and all the others with their colorless ideas referred to as so-called historical ideas. Parenthesis, as if it were possible for ideas, and indeed no mere word is adequate, if one is wanting to speak in a real way, to wander through history and carry human affairs forward. Close parenthesis. These people wanted to replace dead abstractions with a more vibrant quality. Quote, this is the reason for Ettinger's fiery zeal against all idealism, his realism which did, as a matter of fact, contrary to his intentions, tend toward materialism, his energetic urge toward massive concepts. Close quote. These are ideas which really take hold of spiritual realities, ideas which do not refer to an ideal archetype underlying everything, but are really, in quotes, massive or substantial thoughts and ideas that reach out toward spiritual beings themselves. Alta continues, quote, Moreover, his way of relating to nature and to the natural sciences was closely connected with this fundamental scientific attitude, the contemptuous disdain with which the idealist treats the natural world was foreign to him. He sensed a very real existence behind its coarse material veneer, and was deeply convinced that without nature there could be no true because no real existence, whether of a divine or created origin. Close quote. There was something surprising about this, as it gave a new strength to the historical verification of the view of which we have been speaking, that in this thirst for a real understanding of nature, 
not only in Ettinger but also in the earlier and the contemporary Protestant theosophists, and especially in Jakob Böhme, the original scientific tendency of the age of the Reformation was bursting through once more. Quote, the kind of realism for which Ettinger yearned came to birth in its innermost essence in Christianity, close quote, says Richard Walter, continue, quote, if transplanted into a different spiritual stream, it will inevitably develop weaknesses, especially as regards certain aspects of its very specific doctrine. It is also capable of sustaining a Christian world of miracles, which has a completely different kind of richness from the idealism in which we have been educated from a young age, which is always governed by the fear of thinking in too real a way about divine things and of taking the word of God too literally. Indeed, this Christian realism demands such a world of miracles as is manifested in the teaching about the last things. It will not be confounded in its eschatological hopes by a sympathetic shaking of the heads of those who deem themselves to be alone capable of understanding. For it has no conception of how a thoughtful understanding of created things and their history is possible without a clear idea about the ultimate result of world evolution, which as the goal and purpose of creation can alone shed light on its true significance. Finally, it does not shrink from the thought of a real, immediate and therefore truly living spirit world and an equally real contact with that world on the part of man even in his present state. The reader will confirm how precisely all this accords with what Ettinger says. Close quote. Here you have a reference to a time when there was a quest not for ideas of nature, but for a living spiritual world. And indeed Ettinger tried to bring together in his life all the treasures of human knowledge that were accessible to him in order to attain a living relationship with the spiritual world. What stood behind this man? He was not like a person of the present day. People in the present day have, above all, the task of showing how modern natural science must allow itself to be corrected by spiritual science in order that a true knowledge might come into being. Ettinger strove for something different. He aimed to demonstrate the necessity of finding a relationship with the living world of the spirit if one is to arrive at an understanding of the Bible, the Scriptures, and especially the New Testament. Richard Walter speaks about this in a very beautiful way. Quote, in order to understand this, one needs to take into account his, close quote, that is, Ettinger's, uh, continue quote, position, or rather his inner inclination toward the Holy Scriptures, his living awareness that a right that is a complete and therefore also utterly accurate understanding of the Bible, is still lacking. That the interpretations of the Bible given by the churches do not do this justice. I can make what I want to say about Ettinger, or uh, uh, close quote, Steiner again. Oh no. This is a continued quote. I can make what I want to say about Ettinger as clear as possible if I relate my own experience of working with the Holy Scriptures for over 30 years, close quote, writes Richard Walter, continue quote, especially with the New Testament and above all with the words of the Redeemer and the epistles of Paul. The impression that I receive from the Scriptures, the more I study them, if I approach them with the help of our commentaries, is that I have an ever more lively sense of their exuberant fecundity, not merely as regards the inexhaustible ocean of feeling that surges through them, the pathe sacre scriptura, as Bengal calls it, but no less in view of the thoughts expressed through their words. I stand before them with a key which the Church has placed in my hand as the fruit of the trials of many centuries. I cannot exactly say that it does not fit, but still less can I say that it is the right one. It just about opens the door, but only if I use force to release the lock. Our traditional exegesis, I am not referring to modern interpretations, 
enables me to understand the scriptures, but it is not enough to enable me to arrive at a complete and accurate understanding of them. It is certainly able to evoke the general content of the thoughts, but it fails to imbue the distinctive form in which these thoughts appear with life. After a traditional interpretation has been made, it always seems to me that a blossom is left hovering above the text. This is left behind as an unexplained residue from the words of the text, which, however conscientiously they may have carried out their task, presents the Bible commentators and those who refer to them and what they say in a very unfavorable light. Indeed, it is made to appear as if our Lord and the Apostles wished to say only this and precisely that, in accordance with what the commentators allowed them to say, and it was made unnecessarily difficult for those who heard and read what they said to understand them, because they expressed themselves so clumsily and awkwardly, or, to be perfectly honest, in such a curious way. Our exegetic literature in its vast unfathomable compass represents in this respect a serious complaint about them, in that they spoke with so little clarity and objectivity, and yet with ornate language about such incomparably important things and to such an incomparably important end. But who does not feel that this complaint is unwarranted? A careful reader of the Bible receives the totally unambiguous impression that the way it is worded is absolutely right, that there, is, that there are no meaningless flourishes which our exegesis has to cut away like wild vines from the composition of the scriptures before it is able to enter into their actual content, and that the long-established custom of these scholars of removing the dust from the words of scripture on the grounds that they are so old and inadequate before interpreting them, leads to the incomparable luster through which they have shone forth for centuries in the imperishable spring-like radiance of eternal youth being wiped away from them. The masters of biblical interpretation can smile as much as they want, but the fact remains that between the lines of the Bible text something is written which, despite all their skill, they are unable to read. And yet it is above all this that people need to be able to read in order to understand the thoroughly distinctive form in which the, among us, generally acknowledged thoughts of divinely revealed truth come before us only in the Holy Scriptures, in characteristic contrast to all of the descriptions of such truths. Our interpreters merely point out the figures standing in the foreground of the panorama of the Scriptures but they ignore the background with its beautifully formed mountain ranges in the far distance and its radiant dark blue sky with wisps of clouds. And yet from it there falls on these scholars that unique magical light in which they receive an illumination which is for us the most enigmatic part about them. The distinctive fundamental thoughts and perceptions that lie as the unspoken premise of the way in which the scriptures express what they have to say are lacking. And no less of an absence is the real soul of the scriptures, the inner connection of the individual elements of the thoughts expressed in the Bible, which is the bond organically linking all the separate thoughts of the scriptures together. No wonder, then, that there are hundreds of passages in our Bibles which therefore continually elude interpretation and cannot be properly understood, in such a way that the details of the text are fully recognized as making sense in all their minute features. No wonder that in so many instances we have a whole wealth of different interpretations, which have since time immemorial been in dispute with one another, without there being any outcome to the battle. No wonder, for they will probably all be wrong, because all of them are imprecise or approximate and only reflect the meaning in general terms. We approach the text of the Bible with the alphabet of our basic concepts of God in the world, taking it for granted and in all good faith that the alphabet of the biblical commentators, which stands as a silent premise at the background of everything that they think and write as individuals and shines through everything, will be the same as ours. 
but that is unfortunately an illusion from which experience should have cured us a long time ago. Our key doesn't work. The right key has been lost. And until we find it again, our Bible studies will not bear fruit. The framework of basic biblical concepts, which is not outwardly expressed in the scriptures, but is merely present as an underlying premise, is lacking. It is not present among our scholars. And for as long as we undertake our research without it, the Bible must remain a half closed book. We must approach it with different basic concepts from the familiar ones that we are used to regarding as the only possible options. And whatever these may be and wherever they may be sought, one thing at any rate is absolutely clear from the whole sound of the melody of the scriptures in its natural fullness, that they must be more realistic and more, in quotes, massive or substantial. I have here merely reported my own experience I am far from wanting to force it on anyone for whom it is alien, but believe with full confidence that Ettinger would understand me and would assure me that it was also the same in his case. But there are also some of our contemporaries who in this respect, despite the objections that are raised against me, will stand alongside me. Among many I could name, I refer to one in particular, the celebrated Dr. Beck in Tübingen. Close quote. Steiner again. Ettinger tried to arrive at an understanding of the Bible by endeavoring to find inner inspiration in the ideas that still retained some vitality in the evening twilight in which both he and St. Martin lived, and to enter into a living connection with the spiritual world, for only then did he hope that the true language of the Bible might be revealed to him. His premise was firmly of this nature that with purely abstract intellectual ideas one will fail to understand the most important things in the Bible, especially the New Testament, and that one will only come near to the true meaning of the New Testament if one is able to understand that this New Testament has come out of a direct perception of the spiritual world itself, that no commentaries or exegeses are necessary but that above all one needs to be able to read the New Testament. To this end he sought a philosophia sacra. This was not to be a philosophy according to the model of what came after, but one in which was inscribed what a person may really experience if he lives in communion with the spiritual world. Just as we, who want to shed a scientific light on spiritual scientific research, are not able to speak in the way that St. Martin did, so are we equally unable to speak like Ettinger, or still less like Bengel, if we speak today about the Gospels. Nevertheless, the addition of the New Testament brought out by Bengel will continue to be of use, but his Apocalyptica, of which he thought so much, is not of the slightest interest to anyone now. For Ettinger himself, the Apocalypse was fairly remote, For Bengel, who was the older man, it was very immediate. In his studies on this theme, he attached a particular importance to calculations. He regarded one number as being of particular importance. And the mere fact that he considered this number to be particularly important is enough in itself for a modern thinking person, and of course I say modern thinking person in inverted commas, to regard Bengel as a muddlehead, a fanciful visionary, and a fool. For according to his calculations, the year 1836 was to be especially important in the evolution of humanity. He made very extensive calculations. Of course, he lived in the first part of the 18th century, so he was separated from this year by a century. He worked this out by considering the historical phenomena in his own way. But if one looks deeper at the relevant phenomena, without the, in quotes, cleverness of the modern mind, one realizes that the good Bengel erred in his calculations by only six years. This error arose from an incorrect estimate of the founding of Rome, and this can easily be verified. He had meant to arrive with his calculations at the year 1842, the year that I have given for the materialistic crisis. Bengel, the teacher of Ettinger, was referring to that deep rift. 
but because he went too far in his search for really massive or substantial concepts, he thought on too large a scale and imagined the outward course of history in such a way that something special was going to take place which would be like a doomsday, an end of everything. But it was only a day of doom for the ancient wisdom. Thus we see the decline of a theosophical age at a not so very distant date from our own time. And yet if someone is writing an account of history or philosophy, he will, if he mentions these people at all, at most devote a few lines to them, which will as a rule say very little at all. Nevertheless, these people wielded a very considerable influence. And if someone today asks what is the meaning of the second part of Goethe's Faust, and answers in the way that many commentators have done, we cannot but be dis- surprised that, quote, he who cleaves to shallow things can keep his hopes alive on empty terms and dig with greed for precious plunderings and find his happiness unearthing worms, Close quote. In this second part of Faust, there is an enormous amount of occult wisdom and a reflection of occult facts expressed in a truly poetic form. All this would be inconceivable if it had not been preceded by that world that I have been trying to characterize to you by means of two main examples. People today really have no idea of how much was still known about the spiritual world a relatively short time ago, and how much has become obscured in recent decades. In any event, it is very important that we are aware that we are only just beginning to read the Gospels again because we are only just learning how to do so through what spiritual science is able to impart to us today. There is something very remarkable about Ettinger. There is in his writings a sentence which is quoted again and again, but is never understood. A sentence which would alone enable anyone with a requisite insight to say that he is one of the greatest figures in cultural history. This is the sentence in German, Die Materie, ist das Ende der Wege Gottes. Parenthesis, a literal, literal rendering of which would be matter is the end of the ways of God. Close parenthesis. Such a definition of matter, which so closely corresponds with what the spiritual scientist is able to know, could only be given by a very highly developed soul who is able to understand how the divinely spiritual creative powers work and concentrate their energies in order to bring a material structure into being, such as man, for example, which in its form expresses the ultimate manifestation of an enormous concentration of forces. If you read what is said in the conversation between Capasius and Benedictus at the beginning of the second mystery play, about the relationship of the macrocosm to man, which causes Capasius to fall ill, you will be able to form an idea of how through modern spiritual science one can express in our words those things that Ettinger was able to characterize by means of this phrase, which we can only understand once we have rediscovered its meaning. Matter is the end of the ways of God. But it is also the same in in his case. We are unable to speak in his words, no more than in those of St. Martin. Anyone who utters them must have a special fondness for preserving what can no longer be understood. However, not only have ideas undergone a considerable transformation, the same can also be said of feelings. Just think of a typical person who exemplifies our modern age someone who embodies its essential features and attitudes. And imagine what he would make of St. Martin's book Des Erreurs et de la Verité if he were to open it and chance upon the sentence quote, man is protected from knowing the principle of his outward physical bodily nature. For if he were to know the principle of his physical bodily nature, he would be too ashamed to be able to look at a naked human being. Close quote. In an age when people long for nudity on the stage, as the typical examples of modern humanity are the first to do, 
It is not possible to make anything of such a sentence. Just think, along comes a great philosopher called St. Martin who understands the world, and he explains that a higher sense of shame makes us blush when we see a human form. And yet for St. Martin, this is totally understandable. You see, I initially wanted to indicate today that something has become obscured which has immense significance. But my particular wish was to draw attention to the fact that people used to speak in a language that we are no longer able to speak. We have to speak differently now. Thinking capacities that formerly existed have been lost in order that we may speak in this language today. But we find both in Ettinger and in St. Martin that things have not been thought through to the end and they can be taken further. One can continue to discuss them, but not with a modern human being. I should like to go further and say, one does not need to speak about them further if one raises questions today about the riddles of the world, because we need to develop our understanding, not with ideas from the past, but with ideas belonging to the present. This is why so much emphasis is placed here on linking everything arrived at through spiritual scientific research with the concepts of the present. It is a remarkable phenomenon that, however much importance one attaches to not returning to these ideas, their potential has not yet been fulfilled. It is apparent from the ideas themselves that there is much more to be thought about along these lines. People have no conception of how these ideas actually form part of a wider consciousness, because they are governed by the strange notion that the way of thinking that prevails today has always been as it is now. The typical person of whom I spoke earlier thinks as follows, I call these little white particles, this white powder in the salt cellar, salt. Now this typical person knows that salt has different names in different languages, but that people have always understood them as referring to what he sees today. This is simply assumed, but it is not true. Even the most uneducated peasant in the 17th or 18th centuries, and for quite some while afterward, had a far broader conception of what he meant when he said the word salt. His picture was one of which that of St. Martin was a more concentrated version. Instead of the present materialistic conception, he was aware of something connected with spiritual life when he spoke of salt. Words were not as materialized as they are today. They were not merely concerned with a separate material essence. We read in the Gospels that Christ says to the disciples, quote, You are the salt of the earth. Close quote. Yes, When this is expressed in the modern words, you are the salt of the earth, it does not have the same meaning as it did when Christ spoke these words. Because one inevitably experiences the word salt through the whole inner relationship that a person has today with respect to the word salt. And however broad his conception may be, this will not be of any help. If a person today is to have the same experience that would have arisen at that time from the value attached to the word salt, it would be necessary to shift one's understanding of the meaning in such a way that what is there is not salt, but something else. One has to do something similar with respect to a great many old documents, particularly with the Holy Scriptures. And many errors have been committed in this regard, especially in connection with them. It is therefore not difficult to understand why Ettinger tried to make a large number of historical studies in order to arrive at the true value of the words and to gain an appropriate feeling for them. Of course, anyone with a mind like Ettinger's would be considered mad carrying out alchemical experiments and studying Kabbalistic books simply in order to find out how the words of a sentence were really to be understood for all his efforts were devoted to the words of the sentences of the Holy Scriptures. I have spoken of these things today, on the one hand, in order to show that now at the dawn of a new age, 
it is necessary to speak in a different way about them from how this was done in the twilight of a former age. But I should like, on the other hand, to return to the strange fact that according to the prevailing view of our time, out of which spiritual science also has to develop, it would appear to be a matter of indifference whether one studies the manner of thought of the time of Bengel, Ettinger, St. Martin, and others. For if one is speaking to educated people today, one has to speak about the digestive system, the respiratory system, and the nervous system. One cannot speak about mercury, sulfur, and salt in connection with the body. These concepts, which were still understood by those who worked with them in the time of Paracelsus, Jakob Burma, St. Martin, and Ettinger, are no longer understood today. Nevertheless, it is by no means without value to concern oneself with these matters, and there would still be some point in doing so even if one does not have the opportunity to speak to cultured people out of a background of these ideas. I am willing to admit that it would not be very clever to introduce notions such as mercury, sulfur, and salt into modern thinking. Not only would I regard this as unintelligent, it would also not be right. Anyone who feels the pulse of his time will not make the mistake of wishing to restore these old ideas in the way that certain so-called occult societies do, which attach great importance to clinging onto old vignettes. All the same, it is of the greatest significance to acquire a faculty in this language which is no longer spoken today and whose last word has by no means been uttered in the works of St. Martin and Ettinger, or in earlier times those of Paracelsus and Jacob Burma. Why is this? Yes, why? People of the present day do not speak in this way. They might abandon this language. And at the most one might focus one's mind on the historical phenomenon of how such a, an historical epoch was unable to find fulfillment how it came about that there was something that could have been carried further, but which came to a standstill despite its having this potential for further development. How can this be? What is at the bottom of this? It could well be that people will be completely unable to understand one another if despite learning everything that has to be learned, they have not taken these ideas into account. There is something here of immense significance. The living no longer speak about these ideas. They neither have to speak about them nor need to do so. And yet the language of these ideas is all the more important for the dead, for those who have passed through the portal of death. If the need arises to make oneself understood by the dead or by other particular spirits of the spiritual world, one learns to recognize that in a certain respect it is necessary to become familiar with that unfulfilled language which at that former time died out as regards the physical earthly life of the physical plane. And it is precisely among those who have passed through the portal of death that what lives in these ideas will gradually become a vibrant force, for it will be for them the familiar language that they are seeking. And the more efforts are made to live into these ideas as they were thought, felt, and imagined at that time, the more will one succeed in making oneself understood by the spirits who have passed through the portal of death. A process of mutual understanding is then able to develop, and then the extraordinary and remarkable mystery is disclosed that thought forms of a certain kind have been living on the earth but have been developed only to a certain point and are no longer being developed further on the earth. But they are being taken further among those who enter into the life between death and a new birth. No one should think that anything can be done solely with what one can learn today about the formation of sulfur, quicksilver, mercury is not quicksilver, of sulfur, quicksilver and salt, if one only has these concepts, one finds that they are useless for acquiring a relationship with the dead through their language. 
But if one relates to these ideas in the way that Paracelsus and Jakob Burma did, and also as St. Martin, Bengel, and Ettinger were able to do, in what I might describe as their tendency toward superabundance, one notices that by this means a bridge is built between this world and the other world. Of course, people may laugh about Bengel's calculations. After all, they have no conceivable value for outward physical life. But for those who are between death and a new birth, these calculations make a great deal of sense. For rifts in development such as Bengel tried to calculate, and he was only six years out, are of far-reaching significance. You see, therefore, that the world here on the physical plane and the world of the spirit are not connected in such a way that the link between them can be forged through abstract formulas, but they are connected in an utterly concrete way. The meaning that is becoming lost here in the physical world rises up into the spiritual world and lives on with those who have died, provided that on the part of the living it is succeeded by a new phase. We shall continue with this next time. That is the end of Lecture 7 and the end of the first part of the book, which is essentially called Human Life in a Cosmic Context, which is part of this collected work. The remaining lectures are, in fact, the main ten lectures of Building Stones for an Understanding of the Mystery of Golgotha. End of Lecture 7. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at rudolfsteiner.podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, steinerbooks.org in America and rudolfsteinerpress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of, for the first time, of the complete Collected Works volume, 175, uh, by Rudolf Steiner, titled Building Stones for an Understanding of the Mystery of Golgotha, Human Life in a Cosmic Context. The first seven lectures were uh, around the concept of human life in a cosmic context, and now the last ten are the center of the book, Building Stones for an Understanding of the Mystery of Golgotha, which begins with Lecture 8, translated by Simon Blaxland de Lang, given in Berlin on the 27th of March, 1917. At this time I need to draw your attention again and again to one particular aspect of what our whole spiritual scientific research must focus upon at the present time. This has to do with the fact that behind the various concepts, ideas and mental pictures that people form for themselves, and within which they live, there is not only what is generally referred to as logic, but also the world of reality, which must be sought by means of ideas that are deeply imbued with reality. In the course of these studies, which will be directed toward a particular aim that I shall characterize shortly, it may from time to time be necessary to indicate that it may easily happen that an idea or conception of some kind that has arisen in the course of life can be true in a certain way, but does not reach down to reality. It will only gradually become clear what is meant by ideas that are imbued with reality, but it will become possible to acquire a picture of this through some simple comparisons. Today I shall therefore introduce what I have in mind by means of a comparison or analogy. What I want to say now has apparently, but only apparently, no connection with our ensuing studies, but it is purely of an introductory nature. From the 16th century onward until 1839, all Roman cardinals had to make an important vow. During the years of his pontificate, Pope Sextus, excuse me, Pope Sixtus V, who held office between 1585 and 1590, deposited a sum of five million scudi in the Castel San Angelo as a fund to be used only in time of need. 
Because it was considered so important that such a bounty should be available for such a purpose, cardinals always had to swear that they would carefully protect it. In the year 1839, under the pontificate of Pope Gregory XVI, Cardinal Acton raised an objection to this vow. He wanted the cardinals no longer to have to swear that they would preserve this treasure. If one were to hear nothing else about the story, one might form all sorts of excellent hypotheses as to why this remarkable Cardinal Acton did not want the cardinals to make the vow that was still required of them at this time, that they would guard the treasure that was of such potential importance to the Holy See. Moreover, everything that one would have to say could well be thoroughly logical. But all the very fine things that one might have ended up saying would be superseded by what Acton knew because of certain circumstances and the cardinals did not know. He knew that since 1797 this fund had no longer been there, that it had been used for other purposes. So the cardinals had been required to swear that they would protect a treasure that was no longer there and Acton did not want to demean himself by having to make a vow about something that no longer existed. So you see, all the ingenious discussions and hypotheses that someone would advance who did not know that the entire treasure had already been used up, all these hypotheses would collapse. If one meditates on an example such as this, and it may sometimes seem unnecessary to meditate about things that are so patently obvious. But one needs to do so in order to compare something of a matter-of-fact nature with many other situations in life. One may come to see the difference between ideas that are rooted in reality and those that are not. I need to make you aware of the unreality of ideas prevailing in our present time, for the simple reason that, as you will see later, and perhaps only on the next occasion that we meet, this is directly connected with the theme that I must speak about once more in the course of these lectures from the standpoint of spiritual science. My endeavor in this respect is to relate our previous studies to the consideration of a particular aspect of the Christ mystery. What I said last time, will be able to serve as a framework for that aspect of the Christ mystery that we are now wanting to consider. Even though much of what I should like to present to you today may appear unrelated to our essential theme, it will nevertheless provide a valuable foundation. As you are aware, I tentatively began to indicate a particular way of approaching the Christ mystery in a book of mine which appeared quite some time ago, titled Christianity as Mystical Fact. This book, which was incidentally one of the last books to be confiscated in its new edition by the old regime in Russia a few weeks ago, is, I would say, a first attempt to understand Christianity itself from a spiritual point of view, a dimension which over the centuries has more or less disappeared in the development of Christianity in the West. I must first emphasize one thing in particular upon which all the arguments in the book stand or fall. A particular view of the Gospels is presented in title Christianity as Mystical Fact. I do not want to say any more about this here as you can read about it in the book. However, if there is any justification for this view, it is necessary to assume that the Gospels did not arise as late as Christian theologians often suppose today, but that their origin must be placed somewhat earlier. You are aware that, according to this view, the elements of the Gospel teaching are to be found in the ancient texts of the mysteries, and that the mystery of Golgotha is a fulfillment of what is contained in these texts. If one advocates such a spiritual conception of Christianity at the present time, one finds oneself at odds with a great deal of theological and historical research, and contemporary theologians in particular will tend to regard such a conception as historically 
without foundation. It is thought to be fairly clear that in the first century, or at any rate in the first two-thirds of the first century, the Gospels did not play any particular part. There are even Christian theologians who doubt whether there is any evidence that in the first century of the Christian era, people of consequence thought of, or more to the point believed in, the person of Christ Jesus. Now it will become increasingly apparent that if the seemingly so careful research of the present day would but expand its horizons and become not merely precise but also much broader in its scope, many of its reservations will fall away. One can, of course, draw all sorts of conclusions today from questions arising from, for example, certain contradictions between Christian and Jewish records. But these conclusions fail to acknowledge that the apocryphal Gospels, that is to say those records not officially recognized as Christian, are very little known and are virtually ignored, especially by Christian theologians. A large part of this lack of recognition derives from the fact that Christianity, and specifically the mystery of Golgotha, has not been understood in a sufficiently spiritual way, and that no relationship has been formed with the Pauline distinction between the soul and the spiritual aspects of man's being. Just consider our very simple division of man into body, soul, and spirit. The fact is that Paul, who was familiar with the atavistic nature of the truths of the ancient mysteries, envisaged with his distinction between the psychic and the spiritual aspects of man something very similar to what we mean when we speak of the soul and the spirit as two parts of human nature. But it is precisely this distinction between psyche and pneuma or between soul and spirit, that has, more or less, completely disappeared in the West. However, it is not possible to understand the real nature of the mystery of Golgotha without some concept of man's spiritual nature as distinct from his soul. I should like, first of all, to refer to something that I have already mentioned in previous years, something that can show you that there is much in the received historical record that is actually incorrect, especially as regards recent research into the life of Jesus. As I have said, the conventional view is that the Gospels came into being relatively late. This can be challenged on purely historical grounds. It can, for example, be countered by the fact that in the year A.D. 70, the Rabbi Gamaliel II was involved in a legal case. He was the son of Rabbi Simeon who was the son of that Gamaliel of whom Paul was a pupil. And the aforesaid Gamaliel II had a sister with whom he was involved in a lawsuit over inheritance. They were led before the judge, who was a Roman, and perhaps also a Jew, although that is difficult to confirm, sympathetic to Christianity. Gamaliel pleaded that he was the sole heir because according to Mosaic law, daughters cannot inherit. The judge raised the objection, quote, Since you Jews have lost your country, the law, Torah, of Moses is no longer valid. What matters now is the gospel, and according to the gospel, a sister can also inherit, Close quote. There was at first no straightforward solution. So what happened? Gamaliel II, who was not only keen to acquire his inheritance, but also cunning, requested an adjournment of the case, which was granted. In the course of the adjournment he stood before the judge whom he had bribed, who now gave a different verdict and said that he had made a mistake at the original hearing. The gospel was indeed applicable to such cases, but in the gospel it states that Mosaic law, the Torah of Moses, is not annulled by the gospel. As confirmation of this, he quoted the verse in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 17, that relates to this in the version that we have today, of course, with the minor differences between the Greek language and the language in which the Gospel was written when the judge's verdict 
was given in AD 70. In his ruling, the judge simply referred to St. Matthew's Gospel, while the Talmud, where this story is related, accepts this statement from St. Matthew's Gospel without question. Through a broadening of the scope of research, even of a purely historical nature, much could therefore be adduced to show that one does not stand on solid ground if one refuses to assign an early date to the origin of the Gospels. Historical research will one day fully confirm the research emanating from completely different spiritual sources, which forms the foundation of my book, Christianity is Mystical Fact. Now everything that has a relationship to the mystery of Golgotha has within it very deep mysteries which can be penetrated if spiritual scientific faculties of perception are developed to an increasing degree. There is much to indicate that these questions are not as simple as people very often imagine them to be today. Thus, for example, little attention is paid to the relationship of Judaism to the way that Christ Jesus was perceived in the first century of our era. There are theologians who study certain Jewish writings in order to find evidence for their various theories. However, one can easily demonstrate that these Jewish writings, on which so much reliance is placed, did not exist in the first century A.D. One thing does, nevertheless, seem to be very clear historically, namely that in the first century, and especially in the second third of that century, there was a relatively good relationship between Judaism and Christianity, if one can use this word in the context of the period concerned, and that it frequently happened that when certain enlightened Jews of that time entered into discussions with followers of Christ Jesus, it was not so very difficult to reach an agreement. One needs only to recall such instances as the following, when the famous Rabbi Eliezer became acquainted around the middle of the first century with a certain Jacob, as he calls him, who acknowledged himself to be a pupil of Jesus and who healed in his name. The famous Rabbi Eliezer conversed with this Jacob and said in the course of the conversation that there was absolutely nothing against the true spirit of Judaism in what had he had said, or quite especially, in that he healed the sick in the name of Jesus. One can then see that this more or less easy harmony that existed in this earlier period disappeared toward the end of the first century, that, in other words, even enlightened Jews became fierce opponents, implacable enemies of everything of a Christian nature. It also happened that when the Jewish texts that are considered to be important today were composed in the second century A.D., an altogether different mood with respect to Christianity entered into their composition than was the case within Judaism in the first century. One can witness the development of a hatred for Christianity growing from decade to decade, especially within Judaism. This went hand in hand with the transformation of Judaism itself. Although modern Jewish scholars do, of course, know the Old Testament in their own way, they do not know what was still living within Judaism in other respects at the time of the mystery of Golgotha. And they are also largely unaware of the major issues with which a truly historical investigation of this period is concerned. It is necessary to realize that the Old Testament was read completely differently in the first century A.D. from the way that the most learned Jewish rabbis can read it today. Especially since the 19th century, the capacity to interpret ancient texts has more or less disappeared. Certain things which even in the 18th century still existed as a secret tradition in the form of truths derived from old atavistic clairvoyance could no longer be imagined by people in the 19th century, and the only conception that people have of them today is that those who speak about them, even if they belong to an earlier time, must be a bit crazy. 
In the previous lecture, I drew your attention to an important book called Des Heureuses et de la Verité by St. Martin. This book is undoubtedly a late example of its kind, inasmuch as it contains insights deriving from ancient traditions which have now become veiled in obscurity, while, nevertheless, faithfully reflecting these traditions. I have recently quoted extracts from this book, which people today would understand only with the greatest difficulty. But if we allow ourselves to be guided by St. Martin's views, we shall see that he was expressing thoughts which a modern person would either regard as pure fantasy, and virtually everything of this nature is regarded as such today, or considered to be utterly absurd. St. Martin indicates that the human race as it is now has fallen into its present condition from primeval heights. Many people today who have not become wedded to the materialistic conception of the world are willing to tolerate the idea that the present human race can be traced back to former times when, with a part of its being, as it were, it was at a higher level. Despite the materialistic character of Darwinism, which assumes that man has evolved purely from animals, there are other people who are of the opinion that man descended from a lofty origin of some kind, where he was inspired by ancient traditions of a divine nature. But when one goes beyond such an abstract picture and approaches the sort of concrete assertions that St. Martin makes, and which he can only make because these assertions are associated with ancient traditions from the primeval epoch of clairvoyance, it is beyond the wit of modern man to make anything of such things. How is a person of today who knows his chemistry, his geology, his biology, physiology, and so on with absolute thoroughness, and who has also assimilated that strange artifact that goes by the name of philosophy nowadays, how is such a person to respond when St. Martin says that the human race became as it is now only after the fall, and that it was originally very different? In those former times, a man had a certain kind of impenetrable armor, which he has now lost. It originally formed part of his organism and had enabled him to withstand the struggles that he had to endure in these ancient times. It was also armed with a lance of bronze, which could inflict wounds in the way that fire does. And with this lance he was able to be equal to the battle against beings of a different nature to human beings which faced him at that time. And in the place where he originally dwelt he had seven trees at his disposal. Each of these trees had sixteen roots and four hundred and ninety branches. He then left this place and fell from these lofty origins. I doubt that one would be thought of as being in one's right mind if one were to do what St. Simon undoubtedly did, namely to insist that his views were no less real and the beautiful constructions that geologists form about primeval times. If one were to come up with abstract allegories or symbols, this would make it all a bit more acceptable. But St. Martin was not speaking symbolically. He was speaking of realities that had really existed. It was, of course, necessary for St. Martin to choose imaginative pictures for certain things that existed when the earth, in its primal state, was more spiritual than in later times. However, such imaginative pictures represent realities. They should not be interpreted symbolically, but must be accepted in the imaginative form in which they are presented. I wanted to mention this, not in order to enter deeply into this theme, but merely to show you how fundamentally different the language of the 18th century, the language in which a book such as Des Erreurs et de la Verite is written, was from the language that is now regarded as the only one that passes muster today. The kind of writing that one still finds in St. Martin has completely died out. But as the Old Testament, for example, can only be read in its full depth if one is either still or is again 
possessed of certain knowledge associated with imaginative perceptions, you can understand that by the time of the 19th century in particular, it had become impossible to read the Old Testament with any real understanding. But the further back one goes, the more does one find that at the time when the mystery of Golgotha took place, the world of Judaism encompassed not only the exoteric documents of the Old Testament, but also an esoteric teaching, a true mystery wisdom. And it was an important aspect of this mystery wisdom that it gave one the possibility of reading the Old Testament in the right way. It is simply not possible to read the Testament in the right way unless one views what it says against a background of spiritual realities. At the time of the mystery of Golgotha, the strongest aversion to the particular qualities of Jewish occult teachings derived from Rome. Indeed, one might say that there has possibly never in the whole of earthly evolution been a greater contrast contrast than that between the spirit of Rome and the mystery wisdom guarded by the initiates in Palestine. One should, of course, not simply view this mystery wisdom in the way that it lived at that time in Palestine, for one would not find Christianity in it, but only a kind of prophetic anticipation of it. On the other hand, however, one can only comprehend what was fermenting within Christianity if one views it against the historical background of the mystery teaching living in Palestine. This mystery teaching was full of hidden knowledge about the spiritual being of man. It was full of indications for a path of human cognition extending into the spiritual world. Ramifications of what lived in this occult teaching were also to be found in the Greek mysteries. There was, however, little trace of it in the Roman mysteries. Rome had no place for the dynamic thrust that underlay the Palestinian mysteries, for it had developed a particular kind of human community, a particular form of social life, which could exist only if one disregarded the spiritual dimension of man's being. The essential quality of Roman history was that a human community was to be established which would more or less exclude man as a spiritual being. A society was to be brought into being where it would be meaningless to speak of man as a threefold being with a body, soul, and spirit. The further back one goes into history, the more one realizes that the way that the mystery of Golgotha was understood in ancient times was based on this division of the totality of man's being into body, soul, and spirit just as Paul still spoke consistently of psyche and pneuma, of the soul and the spirit. But this was highly offensive to all the sensibilities that were natural to Romans. And this was the reason for much that happened subsequently. As you are aware, that body of wisdom which can no longer be applied today but at the time in question sought to rescue the threefold picture of man and the cosmos, was Gnosticism. In later centuries, it was more or less completely eliminated and repressed, with the result that it totally disappeared. I am certainly not suggesting that it ought to have survived. I wish merely to state the historical fact that Gnosticism still had a spiritual conception of the mystery of Golgotha and was repressed. Events now developed in a very strange way, for what happened was that Christianity increasingly became part of the Roman world. But this process of increasing amalgamation was not matched by any understanding on the part of the Roman world for the relationship of Christianity to the spiritual aspect of man's being. It gave more and more offense that some Gnostic Christians continued to speak of body, soul, and spirit. In those circles where Christianity had become the official religion, there were increasing efforts to suppress the spirit, the very idea of the spirit. People felt that one should not make any reference to the spirit, 
for it was thought that this could lead to all the old ideas of a division of man into body, soul, and spirit reviving once more. Historical development continued along these lines. If we make an exact study of the early Christian centuries, we find that much that is generally explained in a different way is seen in its true light if one becomes aware that It was increasingly the aim of the growing Roman character of Christianity to cause the idea of the Spirit to disappear altogether. Innumerable questions of conscience and epistemology can be seen for what they are only if one becomes truly aware of this need of European-led Christianity to get rid of the Spirit. This development eventually led to a formula or dogma being laid down at the Eighth Ecumenical Council of 869 in Constantinople, which, while not being so explicit in its wording, was later interpreted as meaning that it is contrary to Christianity to speak of body, soul, and spirit, and that the only true Christian thing to say is that man consists of a body and a soul. The Eighth Ecumenical Council initially stated that man had an intellectual soul and a spiritual soul. This formula was phrased in such a way as to avoid having to speak of the spirit as a distinct entity. Nevertheless, it amounted to an ousting of all knowledge of the spirit. There is much connected with this of which people are unaware. Our modern philosophers embark on their studies in such a way that they investigate the body on the one hand and the soul on the other. If you were to ask these people, for example, Wundt or others like him, what is the basis for making this distinction, they would of course affirm that it rests on purely factual foundations, on the actual observation that it makes no sense to speak of body, soul and spirit, but only of a body that is related to the outside world and a soul that is related to one's inner world. Someone such as Wundt would say that this is perfectly obvious. It has no, he has no idea that all this is the consequence of what the Eighth Ecumenical Council had decreed. Even today, modern philosophers do not speak about the Spirit, but they follow the dogma of the Eighth Ecumenical Council. Precisely why, even though not explicitly, modern philosophers deny the Spirit They have no more idea than the Roman cardinals knew what they were actually swearing when they made the vow to protect a fund that no longer existed. People generally tend to pay very little attention to the truly seminal aspects of history, the real forces underlying it. Thus anyone who rejects the view of unprejudiced or objective science, as it is called, that man consists only of a body and a soul, may well be regarded as an ignoramus, simply because those who perpetuate this in quotes objective science are unaware that their assumptions are based on the decrees of the Eighth Ecumenical Council in 869. And so it is with many other things. It is fair to say that this Eighth Council is an important window through which one can gain insight into a good part of the evolution of Western thought. You are aware that a deep rift runs through the cultural development of the West with respect to the schism between those different forms of religious worship which which, which live on today in, respectively, the Russian Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church, or have evolved from them, From a purely doctrinal point of view, and there are, of course, many more far-reaching impulses lying behind the actual dogmas themselves, the difference between them revolves, as you know, around the famous filioque clause. According to the later council, the Russian Church recognizes only the first seven councils, the Roman Catholic Church recognizes the wording that states that the Holy Spirit proceeds, quote, from the Father and the Son, close quote not only from the Father, but also from the Son. This was declared heretical by Constantinople, that is, the Eastern Church. For the Russian Church, as has been said, 
Many deeper impulses lie behind these doctrinal issues, but it is enough for today merely to state that this is so. Recognizes that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. The great confusion with respect to this dogma could only arise because there was a general confusion about the notion of the Spirit, in that the very idea of the Spirit was gradually becoming completely lost. This is undoubtedly connected with the fact that as the fifth post-Atlantean cultural period approached, man had for a while to be denied all perception of the spirit. Compared with this underlying truth, what actually took place is, I would say, merely a surface reflection. But it is necessary to penetrate beyond this reflection if one wants to arrive at a valid point of view that is rooted in reality. Now the period of evolution which played an important part in the establishment of this dogma that there is no spirit, that man consists only of a body and a soul, has not come to an end. The Christian theologians of the Middle Ages, who still lived in the midst of ongoing traditions, for it was only orthodox church doctrine that maintained that man consists of a body and a soul, whereas alchemists and those other people who still had confidence in the old traditions knew perfectly well that man has a body, a soul, and a spirit, knew how difficult it was to hold orthodox opinions, on the one hand, while on the other to have to acknowledge that behind the heretical teachings of body, soul, and spirit, which surrounded them everywhere, a kernel of truth lay hidden. We see everywhere Christian theologians making frantic but vain attempts to avoid what they referred to as the trichotomy, the division of man into three parts. Anyone who does not make himself aware of the difficulties that theologians had in avoiding the trichotomy can have no real understanding of medieval Christian theology. Indeed, this evolutionary period has not finished by a long way for it corresponds to a very important impulse in the cultural development of the West. Because so much will take place in the 20th century that one will need to be aware of if one wants to understand our present age, I shall need to speak further about this century. Originally, if what has come about in relatively recent times may be referred to in this way, man was divided into body, soul, and spirit. Evolution had advanced to the point that by the ninth century the spirit could be abolished. But matters did not rest there. People do not follow these processes properly today because they fail to consider important matters such as the complete transformation of thinking by St. Martin, to mention one example. Things proceed further. And not only is the spirit being abolished, but there is a growing tendency toward abolishing the soul. Hitherto only certain preliminary steps have been taken in this direction. The time is now ripe for the abolition of the soul as well. But people fail to recognize these important tendencies that are living among us now. We are already witnessing powerful evolutionary impulses that are preparing for the abolition of the soul. It is not a matter of organizing councils, as in the ninth century, for things to take a different course today. I must repeat that I am not criticizing these phenomena, but am merely making you aware of certain facts. There is evidence for the preliminary stages in abolishing the soul in all manner of different areas. Thus, in the nineteenth century, there emerged dialectical materialism which has become the view of history that underlies modern German social democracy. If you regard Engels and Marx as the major prophets, in quotes, it might perhaps be regarded as inappropriate to use such a traditional word, but it may suffice for our present purposes, of dialectical materialism. They are also the direct descendants, in historical terms, of the Church Fathers of the Eighth Ecumenical Council. There is an unbroken line of development between the two. 
what the church fathers set in motion by abolishing the spirit has been carried forward by Marx and Engels in their already well-advanced plans to abolish the soul. After all, according to this view, soul or inner impulses will no longer be of any significance. For the soul-driving forces of history are material impulses, the struggle for material possessions. Moreover, the soul is conceived of as being merely a superstructure added to the solid foundation of a purely material process. But it is really important to recognize the true Catholic nature of Marx and Engels. For it is essential that one views these aspirations of the 19th century as the next step in the development of what occurred in connection with the abolition of the spirit. The development of the modern scientific outlook is another factor contributing to the abolition of the soul. The scientific view of the world, I am referring not to experimental science itself, but to the theories which attribute reality only to physical phenomena, and regard everything of a soul nature merely as an illusion, as something that has no existence independent of our corporeal nature, is a direct continuation of those developments that we have perceived in the important impulses enshrined in the Eighth Ecumenical Council. However, a large part of humanity will probably not take this seriously until the abolition of the soul will acquire legal force from certain focal points of earthly evolution. It will not be long before laws are drafted in a number of countries which will lead to anyone speaking in all seriousness about a soul being declared as not in his right mind, while the only people who are regarded as sane will be those who recognize the, in quotes, truth, that thinking, feeling, and will arise from certain bodily functions, out of pure necessity. Various steps have already been taken in this direction, but so long as these initial steps are only of a theoretical nature, they will not have any great, deeply influential effect or significance. This will only happen when they become part of the social order, of social life in general. The first half of this century will barely be over before something happens in this realm, which for someone with a requisite insight will be a terrible spectacle, a desolation in the soul realm, akin to that which afflicted the spirit in the ninth century. It is worth saying again and again that what matters is to have insight into such things, insight into the impulses that have governed human life over the course of history for it all too easily happens that through their education, which is governed by a purely materialistic view of the world, people in the present time have a tendency toward a soporific state of being. The materialistic world view, to a certain extent, prevents a person from thinking properly, from perceiving reality in a really healthy way, lulls them to sleep, when it comes to the important aspects of historical developments. And so even those who have a real longing to follow a path of spiritual knowledge do not have the strength of will to kindle an awareness of certain impulses that are inherent in our evolution and to make a real effort to perceive things as they really are. Thus there was in Palestine a kind of occult teaching which was a preparation for the mystery of Golgotha, a teaching with respect to which the mystery of Golgotha represented a fulfillment. I have expressed this by saying that the mystery of Golgotha was the greatest mystery ever to have been enacted on the stage of world history. If this is so, one can pose the question as to why such a strong antipathy developed in the Roman world, to what emerged through the mystery of Golgotha in the form of Christianity, and why this antipathy led specifically to the abolition of the spirit. These things are far more closely related than one might think, if one merely looks at them superficially. Few people today would want to consider the idea that Marx and Engels are like church fathers, though this does not represent the full truth of the matter. One begins to understand it at a deeper level, if one considers the following. 
at the court of justice where Christ Jesus was condemned, those referred to as the Sadducees played a leading part. What was their role when the mystery of Golgotha took place? Who were the people who have rightly been called the Sadducees? They were those who wanted to make everything deriving from the mysteries vanish away, disappear into oblivion. The Sadducees had a fear, a terror, an absolute dread of any form of mystery cult. But they were also the people who had responsibility for the courts and likewise for the administration in Palestine. They were, however, wholly under the influence of the Roman state. Indeed, they were the slaves of the Roman state, as was outwardly apparent that they purchased their positions with enormous sums of money and then in turn extracted vast amounts of money from the population of Palestine. It was they who, because of the way that their aramonic materialism had sharpened their perception, were particularly aware that the Roman world would be seriously threatened if the notion that everything associated with Christ was in harmony with the essence of the mysteries came to be generally accepted. They had an instinctive sense that something was flowing from Christianity which would gradually overthrow the authority of Rome. This is also the real reason why in the course of the first century, and also in later centuries, those terrible wars of extermination, which really were quite terrible, were waged with the underlying idea that once the Jews were slaughtered, all those who knew something of the reality and traditions of the mysteries would also be eradicated. Everything related to the mysteries, specifically in Palestine, was to be wiped out root and branch. This process of eradication also strongly entailed creating a barrier, a wall, that made it virtually impossible to perceive the spiritual aspect of man's being or to find a path to it. It would have been dangerous for those who later sought to abolish the spirit on behalf of Rome, of Roman Christendom, if many of those from the ancient mystery schools of Palestine, who still knew something about the paths to the Spirit, those who could still have borne witness to the fact that man consists of body, soul, and spirit, had still survived. For the impulse of the Roman world was that an outward social order had to be established where the Spirit had no place. A stream of development was to be introduced that would exclude all spiritual impulses. This would not have happened if too many people had known something about the interpretation of the mystery of Golgotha that lived in the mysteries. It was instinctively felt that what was to evolve out of the Roman state could have nothing of a spiritual nature. The Church and the Roman state entered into a marriage, and from this union jurisprudence in particular was born. In all this, the Spirit was not allowed to utter a word. This was important. However, it is equally important that it is seen that we are now living at a time when the Spirit must again be invoked. It must be summoned so that it may participate in human affairs. You can imagine how difficult this will be since things have fallen to so deep a level. I believe that it will be a long time before it is recognized that the materialistic interpretation of history is a true continuation of the Eighth Ecumenical Council. I also believe that it will be a long time before people understand what lies in the few letters that distinguish the Eastern aspect of European Christianity from the Western aspect. It is di sufficient today to speak about these matters in a superficial way and to pass only superficial judgments. Much will have to live on the level of feelings, and feelings can be a reliable guide if one thing is borne in mind. The feeling to which I refer and with which I shall conclude for today is as follows. If one studies the history of Europe since the emergence of Christianity and is not satisfied with that fable convenu which is the travesty of history that is taught today and is the hidden cause of so much mischief, 
if one has a sense for the real study of history and has the courage to reject with sufficient strength that awful parody of history that passes for history today, one will, specifically in connection with the development of Christianity, arrive at a feeling which can be a leitmotif, a guiding principle in one's endeavor to understand the present. One finds that nothing has met with so many obstacles, so much incomprehension and misrepresentation as the development of Christianity. And nothing has been so difficult as the fact that Christianity has spread. A further feeling that arises from this is that if one is speaking of miracles, there is no greater miracle than that Christianity has survived, that it exists. But it does not merely exist. For we live today at a time when Christianity will have to prevail, not only against the abolition of the spirit, but also against the abolition of the soul. And yet it will indeed prevail. Christianity will develop its greatest power precisely at the time of the greatest opposition. And through the resistance that must be developed against the abolition of the soul, the strength will also be found to recognize the Spirit once more. When out of the Spirit, please forgive the inappropriate use of the word in this context, that rules our present age, laws will be promulgated whereby those people who regard the soul as a reality will be declared as not being in their right mind. Of course, The laws will not specifically state that someone who recognizes the existence of the soul will be declared as not being in his right mind, but laws of this nature will nevertheless be enacted under the brutal impact of the scientific worldview. When, that is, this modern metamorphosis of the Eighth Ecumenical Council manifests itself, the time will have come to restore the spirit to its rightful place. We shall then have to recognize that vague ideas are of no use unless one is aware of the deeper sources, the deep-seated feelings underlying these nebulous concepts. For behind such concepts is often hidden what modern man is most unwilling to acknowledge, but to which has nevertheless succumbed. It is because he does not want to admit this and does not recognize it openly that it is manifested in his thinking as a punishment. Nevertheless, as St. Martin says in the more important passages in his book, quote, these things cannot be spoken of, close quote. It is true that there are certain things that it will not be possible to speak about for a long time, but many things would have to be inscribed on stone tablets if people are to be made aware of what is actually going on. And in a not too distant future, Such a clear inscription will make manifest the hidden tendencies whence the materialistic interpretation of Darwinism has arisen, the perverse, sense-bound tendencies out of which the materialistically oriented theory of Darwinism has sprung. However, I do not want to depress your spirits with something that could well disturb your sleep. So I shall continue in this vein, but I shall not continue in this vein, but simply allow you to ponder these questions. The next time we meet, I shall try to present a framework for the building stones that I wanted to lay down as a foundation for a special study of the mystery of Golgotha. The end of Lecture 8. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading for the first time of the entire Collected Works, Volume 175 by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Building Stones for an Understanding of the Mystery of Golgotha and another small cycle in that called Human Life in a Cosmic Context. We are on the titular section here, Building Stones, second lecture in the series of ten, which is numbered in the book, sorry for the confusion, Lecture 9, given in Berlin on the 3rd of April, 1917, translated by Simon Blackslin de Lange. 
On this occasion, the mystery of Golgotha will be the focus of our studies, which have been prepared by what I have presented in the previous lecture. Let us recall the most important points that relate to this theme. Last time I mentioned that an essential part of any true and inwardly satisfying knowledge of the world is the insight that both the various aspects of the cosmos and the various elements of man's being need to be studied in the light of the three principles of body, soul, and spirit. This is something that must urgently be recognized at present, especially in our anthroposophical domain. I should therefore like to point out that this threefold conception forms the central theme of my book titled Theosophy, from its first edition onward. You will all have read Theosophy and will know that the structure of the whole book is based on this idea as is enshrined especially in these words, quote, The spirit is eternal. The body is subject to birth and death in accordance with the laws of the physical world. The soul life, which is subject to destiny, mediates the connection between these two during earthly life. Close quote. When I wrote these words, I considered it to be necessary to refer to this threefold principle as clearly as possible. For only by emphasizing this idea as one of special and even central importance is one in a position to understand or to endeavor to understand the cosmos as a whole and in particular the central event of our earthly evolution, the mystery of Golgotha. In the previous lecture I explained to you the extent of the forces of resistance when the effort is made in our time to study both the world and man in such a way that the threefold principle of body, soul, and spirit is not merely of secondary importance, but is the central theme. I indicated the opposition to this in the central development of the West and showed that the idea of the spirit was lost in the course of this development. I mentioned that through the eighth ecumenical council at Constantinople, the spirit, together with the very idea of the spirit, was eliminated from Western thought, and that this exclusion of the idea of the spirit has not merely influenced the development of religious ideas and feelings, but has had a profound effect on all the thinking of modern times. So that among the officially recognized schools of philosophy today, there are none that are able to distinguish between soul and spirit with any discernment. And even amongst those who would consider that they think in a completely different way, one encounters everywhere the rigid assumption, the sole source of which is the Eighth Ecumenical Council, that man consists of a body and a soul. Anyone who has any real knowledge of the intellectual life of the West not only in the way that is reflected in the more superficial realms of philosophy, but as it has implanted itself in the thoughts and feelings of everyone, even those who would not even think of devoting any time to philosophical ideas, is struck by the all-pervasive effects of the elimination of the idea of the spirit. And when in recent times a tendency developed, to draw upon certain elements of Eastern wisdom, what was adopted was presented in such a light that it would be most unlikely to occur to anyone that the world and humanity had a threefold foundation of body, soul, and spirit. For in the division of man's being, derived purely from astral observation into a dense body, an etheric body, an astral body, Sthula Sharira, Linga Sharira, Prana, as it was called, then called, Kama, Kama Manas, and the other divisions, which are an arbitrary collection of seven principles, there is no sign of what should be regarded as of the greatest importance, namely, that our conception of the world should be founded on the threefold idea of body, soul, and spirit. One can therefore justly say that this idea of man's threefold nature has been suppressed. It is true that much is said about the spirit today, but 
it is nothing but mere words. The problem is that people in our time are no longer able to distinguish distinguish between mere words and realities. It is for this reason that serious attention is given to explanations and analyses which are really nothing but kaleidoscopic combinations of words, as, for example, the philosophy of Eucken. The essential nature of the mystery of Golgotha cannot be understood if one is determined to reject the threefold idea of body, soul, and spirit. As I explained in the previous lecture, the rejection of the spirit was enshrined as a dogma with the Eighth Ecumenical Council, but it had long been undergoing preparation. That this came about is fundamentally connected with a necessary development in the intellectual life of the West. The simplest way to gain some idea of how one may approach the mystery of Golgotha from the standpoint of the threefold principle of body, soul, and spirit is to form a picture of how Aristotle, who stood at the summit of Greek thought, envisaged the soul. For Aristotle was at the same time the leading philosopher of the whole of the Middle Ages, and modern thought continues to be sustained by medieval concepts however little people may want to admit this. Moreover, we can see that what was, chal- what was developing over the course of human history manifested itself in Aristotle a few centuries before the mystery of Golgotha, and that efforts were subsequently made by the leading intellectual figures of the Middle Ages to understand the mystery of Golgotha with the help of Aristotle's ideas. There is something of such great significance in these sequences of events that one really needs to take the trouble to investigate them in an unprejudiced way. What is Aristotle's conception of the human soul? I should like to express, in a few very simple words, Aristotle's view of the human soul and, hence, what the Greeks had to say about it through the mind of this enlightened figure. Aristotle and we have here the views of the most influential European living a few centuries before the mystery of Golgotha, thought in the following way about the soul. When a human being comes into the world, when someone enters into incarnation through birth, or rather through conception, he owes his physical existence initially to his father and mother. But, says Aristotle, Only his bodily existence can come from his father and mother. The whole person could never arise as a result of the union of father and mother. Thus, according to Aristotle, the whole human being cannot originate from this union, for this individual has a soul. One part of this soul, for we need to be well aware that Aristotle distinguishes two parts of the soul, is completely bound up with the body expresses itself through the body and receives its impressions of the outside world through the sensory activity of the body. This part of the soul arises as a necessary byproduct through the person's material inheritance, which derives from the father and mother. This is not the case with the spiritual part of the soul, which participates through thinking in the general spiritual life of the world, in the, in quotes, nous, N-O-U-S, in the thinking of the world. This part of the soul is regarded by Aristotle as non-material, and it could never come into being from what is inherited from the father and mother, but it can only arise from the participation of God, or rather, in quotes, the divine, to use the Aristotelian expression, in human procreation by father and mother. This is how man, the whole human being, comes into the world. It is very important that one recognizes that Aristotle says explicitly that the whole human being originates through the collaboration of God with the father and mother. Man receives his spiritual, or as Aristotle calls it, his reasoning or intellectual soul from God. This intellectual part of the soul, which comes into being through God, through divine collaboration, 
with each incarnation of an individual physical human being is in a process of development between birth and death. When a person crosses the threshold of death, the bodily portion of his being is given over to the earth, and with the body also that part of the soul that is bound to the organs of the body, whereas the spiritual part of the soul continues in existence. This spiritual part of the soul, says Aristotle, lives on in such a way that it is transported into a different world from the one with which it was connected through the bodily organs and continues to live an immortal existence. This immortal existence, according to Aristotle, is such that if the person concerned performed good deeds while he was in his body during his lifetime, he is able to look back on these good deeds that he has contributed to the cosmic order, but cannot change anything in this cosmic order in which he is placed. Indeed, we understand Aristotle rightly only if we interpret his ideas as meaning that the soul after death has to look for all eternity back at whatever good or evil deeds it may have performed. In the 19th century in particular, the greatest possible efforts were made from various sides to understand what Aristotle meant by this idea for it is often difficult to understand him because of the way that he expressed himself. It can be said that Franz Brentano, who died recently, has in his controversy with Edward Zeller endeavored throughout his life to gather together all the various elements which can enable one to gain a clear idea of what Aristotle thought about the relationship of the spiritual part of the human soul to the whole human being. And it must be emphasized that the way that Aristotle thought about this matter was passed on to the philosophy that was taught throughout the Middle Ages into modern times and is still taught in certain ecclesiastical circles. Franz Brentano, who studied these ideas with a genuine intensity inasmuch as they derive from Aristotle, came to the following conclusion. He made it clear that Aristotle was a figure whose inherent intellectual discipline enabled him to transcend materialism and therefore was in no danger of succumbing to the belief that the spiritual part of the soul evolves out of what a person receives through his father and mother. There were, thought Brentano, only two possible ways for Aristotle to envisage the spiritual part of the soul. One possibility was this that the spiritual part of the soul arises through a direct creation by God in collaboration with what comes from the father and mother, so that it comes into being through the influence of God upon the human embryo, and that this spiritual part of the soul does not perish at death but embarks upon a path of everlasting life when the human individual passes through the portal of death. What other possibility would have been open to Aristotle, says Brentano, if he had not developed this idea? Brentano regards it as perfectly justified that Aristotle accepted it. There was only one other possibility, as a third one does not exist, according to Brentano. This second possibility is to accept the pre-existence of the soul, Thus, not merely its post-existence, but also its pre-existence, its existence in the spiritual world before birth or before conception. But Brentano very, very clearly recognizes that as soon as one even begins to admit that the soul exists before conception in some way or other, there is no alternative but to accept that it does not only experience a single incarnation, but reappears again and again in successive earthly lives. There is no other possibility. And since, indicates Brentano, Aristotle in his later years rejected palingenesis, that is, reincarnation, he had no option but to accept creationism. The notion that the human soul is created completely anew every time that a human embryo is created. 
which is not at variance with post-existence, but denies pre-existence. Franz Brentano had originally been a priest, and was, I would say, one of the last of those who represented the positive side of Aristotelian scholastic philosophy. It therefore appears to him eminently reasonable that Aristotle rejected the doctrine of repeated earthly lives and recognized only creationism and the post-existence of the soul. This view, in all its various aspects, forms the basis of all Christian philosophy, insofar as this philosophy rejects the idea of repeated earthly lives. It is a strange phenomenon, both utterly tragic but also deeply endearing, that such an eminently capable thinker as Franz Brentano, Brentano, who had resigned from the ministry, makes endless efforts to clarify his ideas about creationism and yet is completely unable to bridge the gulf that separated him from the doctrine of repeated earthly lives. Why is this? The reason is that despite the depth of his convictions and the energy and sharpness of his mind, the very idea of the spirit was closed to him, and he was never able to formulate an idea of the spirit as distinct from an idea of the soul. It is impossible to arrive at an idea of the spirit without acknowledging the idea of repeated earthly lives. The notion of repeated earthly lives can be lost only if one loses the idea of the spirit altogether. By the time of Aristotle, the idea of the spirit had begun to be increasingly vague. From certain key passages in Aristotle's writings, one can observe how he always becomes obscure when he is speaking about the pre-existence of the soul. In such instances, his clarity always forsakes, forsakes him. All this is connected with something immensely significant and profound, namely, with the actual course of human evolution. For during the centuries, before the mystery of Golgotha, mankind had entered a stage of evolution when something of the nature of mist enshrouded the soul when there was any mention of the spirit. This phenomenon was not so marked then as it is now when there is any reference to the spirit, but the whole process of the corruption of thinking with respect to the spirit was already starting to manifest itself at that time. And this, my dear friends, is connected with the fact that the evolution that mankind had undergone, had led over the course of time to the soul becoming different from what it had been in the earliest period of human evolution on earth. In these primeval times, there was a direct experience of the spirit because of the atavistic clairvoyance that existed then. It was not possible to doubt the reality of the spirit. Indeed, it was no more possible to do so than to doubt the existence of the sense-perceptible world. It was merely a question of the degree of spiritual perception that people were able to attain. But in these former times, no one had the slightest doubt about any of this. And this conviction, which was founded on an immediate awareness of the Spirit, came to expression everywhere, in the mysteries, wherever they were cultivated, it is striking that one of the earliest of the Greek philosophers, Heraclitus, speaks of the mysteries in such a way that one can see that he is aware that in earlier times they were of immense significance to mankind, but that they had already declined from their former greatness. Thus enlightened Greeks were even in these very early times already speaking of the decline of the mysteries. There were various different aspects to these mysteries. However, only the central idea of the mysteries is of particular interest to us today. We shall dwell for a moment on this central idea of the mysteries as they were practiced until the time of the mystery of Golgotha and as late as the reign of Emperor Julian the Apostate. In recent times, certain aspects of the cultivation of these mysteries 
have been cited as having an anti-Christian quality. It has been pointed out that what is known as the, quote, Easter legend, close quote, as the mystery of Golgotha, hence the central legend of the suffering, death, and resurrection of Christ, was known everywhere in the mysteries. From this, the conclusion has been drawn that the Christian Easter mystery was merely a transference of ancient pagan mystery practices and customs to the figure of Jesus. Thus many people seemed to think that although they did not doubt the truth of the idea, there was such a common identity between the two that they needed to say, quote, what the Christians say about the God called Christ, that he suffered, was crucified, and was resurrected, that his resurrection brings with it a hope and a longing for salvation, extended to all human beings. Indeed, everything that Christians have made of ideas such as this is to be found in the mysteries, in all the different cults of the mysteries. Pagan customs have been brought together and fused into the Easter legend and transferred to the individual figure of Jesus of Nazareth. Close quote. In more recent times, this tendency has been taken even further, curiously, in official Christian circles, in that, for example, in the case of certain Protestant groups in Bremen, the historical existence of Jesus of Nazareth becomes a matter of indifference. People start saying that the various mystery legends and cults were brought together through a purely social process and had been centralized, and that in the early Christian community the legend of Christ had been created out of these old pagan legends. In the course of a discussion that took place here in Berlin some years ago, during the tragic history of recent years all previous events have almost acquired mythical status and seemed to be a distant memory, but the discussion was indeed only a few years ago, one could see that the official representatives of Christianity were declaring that there could be no question of attaching you know, any real importance to an historical Jesus, but only to an, quote, idea of Jesus, close quote, which arose as an idea in the early Christian community through all manner of social impulses. As one studies the pagan mystery cults, it is very tempting to compare them with what emerged in the form of the Christian Easter mystery. This can be illustrated by a faithful description of the Phrygian Easter festivals. Other festivals could also be cited in addition to the Phrygian festivals, for there were a large number of such festivals. Firmicus, for example, gives an account of the Phrygian Easter festival in a letter to the sons of Constantine. The image of Attis, hence of a certain god, we do not need to investigate any further which god this was, was bound to the trunk of a tree and solemnly carried round in a procession in the course of a midnight ritual. And the sufferings of the god were then celebrated. During this time a lamb was placed beside the tree. At, at dawn the resurrection of the god was proclaimed. And whereas, on the previous day, when the god was bound to the tree and had therefore seemingly been consigned to death, there was a ritualistic outpouring of the most terrible lamentations. These cries were, on the following day, suddenly transformed into exuberant joy when the resurrection of the god was celebrated. Firmicus relates that the image of the god Attis was buried elsewhere, at night, when the sorrow had reached its climax, a light was suddenly kindled, the tomb was opened, the god had risen. And the priest spoke the words, quote, Take comfort, devout people, for the god has been saved, and you may be sure that you too will be saved. Close quote. No one could deny that these ritualistic festivals that were celebrated everywhere for centuries and centuries before the mystery of Golgotha took place, have a great similarity with what was enacted as the Christian mystery of Easter. Because it was so appealing to think in this way, some people even believed that these widespread images and conceptions of the God who suffered, died, and resurrected had, in a certain sense, been formed into a unity through Christian influence 
and transferred to Jesus of Nazareth. Now, it is important to understand the real source of all these pagan, pre-Christian rites. They can be traced far, far back to those times when the mysteries were developed from very deep ancient insights about the being of man and his relationship with the world as revealed to atavistic clairvoyance. At the time when the Phrygian festivals were celebrated, people only knew roughly as much about the real meaning of these rites as is known today in certain free Masonic temples about the ceremonies that take place there. Nevertheless, this can all be traced back to an originally grand vista of knowledge of the world and man, which is very difficult to comprehend today. For you need to consider that man does not merely live in his surroundings by virtue of his physical body and depend on his surroundings with respect to this body, but that his soul and spirit are also part of this environment. He derives his ideas and mental pictures from this outward environment. They become familiar to him, and he makes them his own, and for various reasons he cannot free himself from them. Therefore, even with the best will in the world, it can be difficult to understand certain things, which, for these and other reasons, have been lost to the spiritual evolution of mankind. Modern natural science, I do not need to reiterate at every opportunity that I admire it, for I do indeed, despite my reservations, is concerned only with things at their most superficial level and leads to no more than the most minimal understanding of their true nature. It is true that science has made considerable progress in certain areas, but this notion of, quote, considerable progress, close quote, only means that one has understood something or other. To be sure, one cannot but have admiration for a science that has developed wireless telegraphy, together with much that plays a considerable role in modern life. But one may legitimately ask, how would it be if we had not arrived at this situation? If we were to pursue this question, we would firmly come up against something that it is forbidden to speak about today. Modern science regards the wisdom of which the last corrupted vestiges survived in the mystery rituals to which I have referred as pure nonsense, as sheer foolishness. This may be so. But as Paul said, what human beings regard as foolishness may often be wisdom in the eyes of God. True insight into the nature of humanity in the world yields among many other things, and today I want to emphasize those aspects that are of importance for an understanding of the mystery of Golgotha, a particular view of the human organism that does of course seem completely crazy to modern scientists. For the human organism has very significant differences from the organism of animals. I have already mentioned several differences and today I specifically want to refer to one that relates particularly to the mystery of Golgotha. The human organism, as I have said, differs in significant ways from that of animals. For the animal organism, if one really studies it through spiritual scientific means, has within it the seeds of death. To put it another way, if you make a serious study of the animal organism in the light of spiritual science, you can see from the way that it is constituted that it has to pass through death in its particular manner, that it disintegrates and is given over to the elements of the earth. The death of an animal has nothing mysterious about it. It is no less understandable than that one can clearly perceive from studying an animal organism that the animal needs to eat and drink. That an animal has to die is apparent from the nature of its organism. This is not the case with the human organism. Of course, we are touching upon an area that must inevitably be totally incomprehensible to modern science. If you study the human organism with all the means of spiritual science, there is nothing, absolutely nothing in the human organism itself which explains the necessity for death. 
We have to accept death simply as something that man experiences, but we cannot explain why it is that people die. Man was not originally born in order to die. Not even his outward organism was made for death. That death occurs in a person through an inner process cannot be explained from the being of man itself. It cannot be explained from the way that man's being itself is constituted. I know very well that this will be regarded today as perfectly crazy by all those who want to rise to scientific heights. Indeed, it is in general very difficult to discuss such matters for they are actually connected with certain very deep mysteries. Even today, anyone wanting to form a relationship to such questions encounters something that can only really be expressed in the way that St. Martin, of whom I spoke here recently, writes in his book Des Erreurs et de la Verité. Thus, in an important passage, where he is speaking about the consequences of human evolution that ensued from the event that took place in the spiritual world before man incarnated for the first time on the physical plane, he wrote the following words about this event in the super-earthly domain, which anyone who is intimately familiar with such matters will understand. Quote, However much I may want to do as I am asked, the obligations that I have undertaken do not allow me to give any explanation whatsoever about this subject. And moreover, I for my part would rather blush for man's transgressions than to speak of them. Close quote. In this context, St. Martin is being asked to speak about an offense committed by man before his first incarnation on earth. This he cannot do. Today it is possible, for certain reasons, to say much that St. Martin was, yet, was not yet able to say not because people have become better since his time, but for many other reasons. But if one wished to discuss a truth, such as that man was not born in order to die, in connection with everything else of relevance to this question, this would necessarily raise certain issues that modern ears are not as yet able to hear. Man is not born to die, and yet he dies. These words express something that is indeed as absurdly as far as that is indeed an absurdity as far as modern scientists are concerned. But for someone who wants to arrive at a real understanding of the world, this is one of life's deepest mysteries. Man is not born in order to die. Nevertheless, he dies. This awareness that man is not born to die and yet dies flows as a hidden impulse through those ancient mysteries to which I have referred as the Attis mysteries. A possible way of understanding this enigma, that man is not born in order to die and yet dies, was sought in these mysteries, and they were expected to give an answer to this riddle. But why were these mysteries celebrated? They were celebrated in order that people might be able to hear something every year anew, something that they wanted to hear, wanted to feel, wanted to experience in their souls. What they wanted to be reminded of was that the time had not yet come when they had seriously to face the inexplicable problem of their death. So what did someone with such beliefs expect from the priests? of the Attis Mysteries. He had the instinctive certainty that the time would one day dawn on the earth when the enigma of death would have to be confronted in all seriousness. But this time had not had yet to come. And as the priest celebrated the sufferings and resurrection of the God, this act of celebration brought the comforting message that the time had not yet come when he had to grapple seriously with the mystery of death. It was common knowledge to these ancient times that the event described in what we may call a, in quotes, symbolic way in the Bible, at the beginning of the Old Testament, referred to a reality. The people of these ancient times knew this instinctively. It was only through modern materialism 
that this instinctive feeling that the description of the temptation by Lucifer refers to an actual event was lost. There can be no doubt that the intellectual crudities displayed in the materialistic interpretation of Darwinism are, to a very considerable degree, at variance with what should be regarded as the actual truth of this matter. For these crude, perverted ideas would have us believe that in former times there were animals of a certain kind which gradually evolved into the human beings of today. The story of the temptation in paradise does of course have no place in the materialistic interpretation of Darwinism. For only a very degenerate form of intellect could conceive of the idea that a primeval ape of whatever gender could have been seduced by Lucifer. Thus there was an instinctive certainty that behind the story that is told at the beginning of the Old Testament, a previous actual event or fact was concealed. And how was this fact experienced? It was felt that the nature of man's original physical organism was such that he was not mortal, but that through this fact something was added to his original organism which corrupted it, and thereby also implanted within it an impulse of mortality. Man became mortal as the result of a moral process, through what is generally, and we will return to this later, called original sin. Man did not become mortal in the way that the other beings of nature became mortal. He did not become mortal through natural or material processes, but rather through a moral process. His mortality originated from the soul. The animal soul, as the soul of a species, is immortal. It is embodied in the separate individual animal which by virtue of its organs is immortal. The soul of a species departs from the dead animal as it had been embodied in it. But the organism of an animal as an individual organism is inherently constituted for death. This does not apply to the human organism to the same extent. The species soul or human group soul that lies at the foundation of the human organism has the inherent capacity to come to expression in the individual human being and endow him with immortality as an independent human organism. Man could only become mortal through a moral act originating in the soul. In a certain sense, man has to be endowed with a soul before he can become mortal. For as long as these ideas are regarded as abstract concepts, it is impossible to understand what is going on. Only if one makes the effort to grasp these phenomena as they actually are is it possible to comprehend them. Now in ancient times, and also shortly before the mystery of Golgotha, when these mysteries were being celebrated, people were very clearly aware that man's soul causes him to die. The human soul is in a constant process of development over the ages. Of what does this development consist? It is a process whereby the soul increasingly corrupts the organism and plays an ever more prominent part in the corruption which is the effect of its destructive influence upon the organism. People looked back to ancient times and said to themselves, a moral event has taken place which has led to the soul becoming such that when it comes to dwell in the body through birth, it corrupts it, with the result that it does not live between birth and death as it would do if this corruption had not occurred. This situation has become worse and worse over the centuries and millennia. The soul has been increasingly corrupting the body. This is what they said. Because of this, it is more and more difficult for the soul to find its way back to the spirit. As human evolution proceeds, it corrupts the body more and more. And because of this, the body is impregnated ever more deeply with the seeds of death. And a time must come when human souls will, once they have spent so much of their existence between birth and death, 
no longer be able to find their way back to the spiritual world. In ancient times this moment was awaited with fear and dread. The worry was that with succeeding generations, the generation would eventually arise that had souls that had corrupted their bodies to such a degree and had impregnated them so intensively with death that it would no longer be possible to find the path back to the divine world. This generation will indeed come, they said to themselves, and they wanted to be reassured whether such a moment was nearer or further away. This was the purpose of the Attis rites and similar customs. The aim was to find out whether there was still enough of a divine nature in human souls, that the time had not yet come when they had eradicated all trace of their divine heritage and could no longer find their way back to the gods. It was therefore of immense significance when the priest said, quote, Take comfort, devout people, for the God has been saved, and you may be sure that you too will be safe. Close quote. With these words, the priest wanted to say, quote, See, the God still has influence on the world. Human souls have not come to the point of completely breaking off their connection from the God, whose resurrection is ever renewed. Close quote. This is what the priest wanted to tell them. It was a message of comfort that the priest sought to impart. Quote, the God is still within you, Close quote, he said. When we speak of these matters, we are unearthing feelings and emotions from former periods of human evolution of such infinite depth that people in our time, whose interests have become completely externalized, no longer have the slightest idea what those who were living then had to contend with. Although they may have known nothing of what is called culture nowadays and may also have been completely illiterate, they nevertheless had such feelings. And in the mystery schools, where the last traditions deriving from ancient clairvoyant wisdom were preserved, the pupils who were being initiated were told that if evolution were to continue in the way it has been progressing, Under the influence of that moral event at the beginning of earthly evolution, one would need to be prepared for the time when human souls would turn from God to the world that they themselves create, when they bring death to the human organism through their ever-intensifying corruption of the physical body. Souls would unite with the earth and through the earth with what is called the underworld, and as a result they would be lost. But since these schools still preserved the wisdom of the spirit, there was the awareness that man consists of body, soul, and spirit. What I have been telling you now relates to the soul, not to the spirit, for the spirit is eternal and has its own laws. From their spiritual insight, people were enabled to say that souls will disappear into the underworld, but the human spirit will appear again in ever-repeated earthly lives. A future scenario of earthly evolution is approaching when human spirits would incarnate again, but they would look back upon all these soul qualities that had formerly existed here on earth. Souls would be lost, and there would, be no, lo- and there would no longer be any souls. Spirits would reincarnate, which would cause the human body to be activated after the fashion of an automaton. Without the way that they activate the human being, the human body, being felt and experienced by the soul. What, on the other hand, were the feelings of those who were drawn to the Christian Easter mystery? Their feeling was that if nothing were to happen on the earth other than what had already done so, human beings would in future reincarnate without souls. They therefore awaited something else, something that could not arise from within earthly evolution, but was to enter earthly life from without, namely the mystery of Golgotha. Their expectation was that a being would enter earthly evolution who would rescue the soul, rescue it from death. There was no need to save the spirit from death, but it was essential that this happened for the soul. 
this being who now forged a connection with earthly evolution from without, through the body of Jesus of Nazareth, was experienced as the Christ, who had appeared for the salvation of souls. Thus Christ is that being with whom man can unite his soul, so that through its union with Christ it loses its power to corrupt the body, and all that had been lost can gradually be restored once more. That is why the mystery of Golgotha is in the middle of earthly evolution. From the beginning of earthly evolution until the mystery of Golgotha, more and more is lost as a corrupting influence increasingly takes hold of the soul with the object of making people automata of the spirit. While from the mystery of Golgotha until the end of earthly existence is the time when what had been lost before the mystery of Golgotha is again gradually brought together. Thus, when the earth has reached the end of its evolution, human spirits will incarnate for the last time in bodies which will once again be immortal. This is how the Easter mystery was experienced. For this to happen, it was, however, necessary for the power that had caused the moral corruption of the soul to be overcome. This was achieved through what is recognized by Christianity as the event of Golgotha, There were some important words heard by the original Christians who were familiar with these matters. They were expecting an event deriving from wider spheres that would bring the possibility that the corrupting influence on the soul would be brought to an end. The words of Christ on the cross, quote, It is finished, close quote, rang out to them as a sign that now the time had come when the corrupting power of the soul had lost its force. 